Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calpine has a new video. Thanks for joining us. Today's trending topic covers, are you confused about super? Well, here are four funds to consider. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Superannuation is a company pension program which benefits employees after retirement. And under this type of long-term investment, an employer contributes a fixed amount regularly. Australian super funds reported robust returns in the financial year 2020 to 21. And despite the challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic, which caused significant volatility in the stock market, according to the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia, these funds averaged annual returns of nearly 20%, which is a solid performance ever since compulsory superannuation was introduced nearly 30 years back. So here are the four superannuation funds that can be considered by Australians. Child Care Super. Child Care Super is a super fund designed for women. It's My Super product has three life stages, building, growing and consolidating. So your investments are adjusted according to your age. Guild Super. Guild Super provides superannuation products including Super Super Insurance Cover and services specifically designed to support women. Australian Super. Australian Super is an industry superannuation fund which is run only to profit members. It is owned by the Australian Council of Trade Unions and the Australian Industry Group, which is a peak employer's body. For every 50,000 Australian dollars you have in the superannuation product, you will be charged a fee of 0.6%. Five-year annualised net return on 50,000 Australian dollar balance stands at over 10%. Host Plus. Host Plus Superannuation Fund derives its revenue from investment activities as a superannuation fund targeted towards workers in the hospitality, tourism, recreation and sports industries. The company has its operations across Australia and for every 50,000 Australian dollars you have in the superannuation product, you will be charged a fee of 1.26%. The fund's five-year annualised net return on 50,000 Australian dollar balances stands at nearly 10%. Well, hope you enjoyed this video with the fourth superannuation funds worth considering. If you do like the information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, please head to the website. It's kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV.
Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Nicole Sadotti, the founder of Cl Studio Clever. And Studio Clever is a boutique studio specialising in custom website design in Sydney. They focus on user experience design and website optimization strategy to make it easier to run businesses, market the services and win more clients. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates and successful business owners to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Ms. Nicole, Nicole Sadotti, founder of Studio Clever. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Hi Sage, thanks for having me. Well Nicole, it's so great to have you on the show because SEO optimization is so important running an e-commerce especially and there's so many tricks of the trade so it'll be great to have your expert opinion. So how can a strategic design make it easier to run an online business and grow the company at the same time? Well I think most businesses today know that a website is so much more than a glorified business card. Um, when created strategically, your website should be attracting more leads, it should be converting those leads into sales, and it has an enormous potential to reduce the admin burden on the team, whether it's a small team or a big corporate. The ability to reduce admin through using automation technologies on the website is a massive benefit. And thank you for putting that so succinctly for us. Um, you started Studio Clever, formerly named Pop.media, in 2012, is that correct? That is, yes. And since then you've almost worked with a range now. of... I'm, I'm sorry? Sorry, I have to say almost 10 years now, yeah. Absolutely, yes. And you've, ranged with a wor uh, sorry, you've worked with a range of companies from tiny startups to associations, scaling businesses like Ola Cabs, Australia and New Zealand, all the way up to corporates such as Optiva, Allianz and News Corp as well. So Nicole, in this journey, what are the key things that you've learned and implemented while strategizing custom websites for your current clientele? So the key thing really is that everything needs a solid foundation. Um, it's all about what the client wants, what the business is trying to achieve. So I think that's one area where a lot of websites that you might see on the internet are missing the mark. Uh, they, they aren't achieving anything for anybody and when you sort of turn up on there it's not even as a user it's not letting you get where you want to go. So if we're looking at everything with a really solid foundation about what the business is trying to achieve, what they're trying to communicate to their clients and customers, then you're in a really good position to move forward. And one of the best benefits really of a really strategic online presence is the ability to react to market change. So a good example is during COVID, any business that was already well set up online was able to completely mitigate the risk of having to make that pivot. Great, so understanding your business thoroughly is the first step towards designing a successful website. Okay, and that takes a lot more work than it sounds actually to actually really dot those I's and cross those T's. However, new challenges arise um, as the market changes and businesses need to pivot and rebrand, as you just mentioned, with the COVID scenario. So how in those um, cases where the market changes and businesses have to adapt quickly, how does a business continue to deliver optimum results in your opinion? So the key is, of course, understanding the business is, is crucial. But more than that, it's about really understanding the numbers. So every business knows that from a financial standpoint, they need to know their numbers. But that really comes all the way back to the design and marketing of the business website. And if your design and marketing metrics can be plugged in to the business metrics in other areas and your actual financial goals and results, then you're in a really good position to move forward, to pivot without too much stress, um, essentially quantify everything and you're in a really good position to grow and react to change. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. I mean, it sounds like it's, it's easy to achieve if you know what you're doing. 
But I guess it must be frustrating for those small businesses out there who are trying to do it themselves and they've got all the keywords right and they're using the high volume keywords and yet they can't get on that first page in a Google search. In your expert opinion, how can companies of different scales grow their businesses confidently and organically in this ever-changing world? I think startups and small businesses actually have an incredible advantage in this area because the, of the large corporates I've worked with in bigger enterprise organisations, they have so much existing infrastructure that it can be really, really hard to make digital change. But if you're starting from a blank page, you can set up all of your systems to help you out. And beyond just the keywords, the benefit of your website is being able to start that conversation with your potential clients and customers really early in the piece so they can get to know you online and you can be really building your authority as the expert in your area. And then they come in and they'll buy from you because they know you, they like you, they trust you. Okay, so you are saying that knowing who your audience is is really important as well and you've got to attract their attention, capture their interest and then hopefully make them want you, make them desire you. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. I wonder what sort of tactics that businesses would um, deploy or employ to make that happen. Um, do you have any insights to share on that? I do. So one of the main tactics I always advise businesses to get on with is, is blogging. And it actually it can be terrifying to a lot of businesses to start writing. But writing a blog post has an enormous advantage where you can be having a conversation with your client about your expertise. You can be talking about how you can solve their problem. You can be starting to educate about what their problem actually is. And a lot of clients out there, so so for small businesses, their clients mightn't even know the full extent of the problem that can be solved yet. So your website and every single article that you write is an excellent opportunity to fully explore what the problem is and let the audience know why it is that they need you to solve it. And that can help massively with your keywords as well, of course. Great. Okay, so you just need to instill that confidence in your audience that you are authentic in your mission to, to help provide solutions. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we're reaching the end of the discussion um, right now. So lastly, what new revolutions can you forecast for your industry and digital workflows in the years to come? Well, I think automation is already massive, but businesses are getting better and better at understanding how they can leverage automation technology and how they can use it to their advantage. Um, I see a lot of businesses who are maybe using little bits of automation here and there, but the key areas where everyone should be really having a go is things like online appointment bookings, um, productizing services so that things can be automatically paid for online. And all of that comes together, as well as email nurturing, of course, setting up welcome email series and all of those sorts of things can really help to give you a well-rounded, automated process that guides your customer, supports your customer without you even needing to be involved. So it, it's a huge load off your, your admin workload, as well as looking after a customer better. Um, another thing that I think is, is definitely huge and will continue to grow is artificial intelligence. Um, AI obviously won't overtake entire workflows anytime soon, but it can be used for smaller tasks. So one area a lot of my clients are using it for at the moment is actually copywriting. There are some really great copywriting tools out there. Now, what I'd say is you still obviously, you need to be a good writer to use these well because Google penalizes um, spammy content or content that's not really authoritative. So if you're writing quality content, then you're going to win. But one way to make writing that content faster is by really utilizing AI and it can just speed up your process massively. So there'll be small tasks throughout a workflow that can be benefited from the use of AI and every workflow should be using automation at every single point that it possibly can to streamline, systematize and make life easier. That's great. Thank you so much. So if a company was to come to you and they've been using an online um, provider of SEO um, tools and they say, here's what I've been doing, 
how can you help me? I can't make sense of it. Are you able to take over from there? Is it an easy transition over to your services? Well, the first thing I ever do with any client is go through what they're doing now and have a look at what, what they want to achieve. So everything starts with those foundations. So we need to look at where they want to go how they can be helped. And I actually, I have a, a day service, that a clever day where I help a lot of clients just sort through a lot of the systems, whether it's the website, whether it's SEO, all sorts of things, and we'll get to the bottom of everything and clean it up. Sounds magic, because some of it seems straight, straightforward, like the keywords, for example, but then there's also other things with backlinks and meta tags that seem like you need a little bit more insight into um, web development to really work that part out. Do you know of any yeah, good and tools understanding online? understanding audiences, I think, and, um, right. and where people are in the flow of their, their journey, the customer journey. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It just seems the more you know, the more you know you don't know. It's just a rabbit hole and it keeps opening up. It's so interesting. Well, thank you for sharing your insights today. I really do appreciate your time, Nicole. Was there any final words you'd like to share before we close off the discussion? Uh, I think just good luck to everybody out there having a go online. Building an online business is very rewarding and you have a lot of potential for growth, so go get it. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. It's been appreciated. Thank you, Sage. And if you've just joined us, we had a very informative discussion with Ms. Nicole Sadotti, who is the founder of Studio Clever. And you can watch the full recording via YouTube at Calkine Media. Please keep watching for more expert talks, live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised at InvestWise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. NFT creators like Beeple are taking the world of NFTs by storm. The digital landscape is already swarming with NFTs, whether they be e-trading cards, original tweets or crypto gaming characters. But now, they're set to emerge from the digital realm and find a place in real life art galleries. And in this video, I'll break it all down for you. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Calkine. CryptoPunks and Bored Apes are said to be put on display in a Christie's or Sotheby's near you. As reported by Decrypt, different art galleries are displaying the NFTs in a unique manner, trying to grab maximum attention. The love affair between art galleries and NFTs, though, is actually not new. Art auction house Christie's earlier sold a Mike Winkleman, better known as Beeple Collage, for a whopping 69.3 million US dollars. Christie's also teamed up with the Andy Warhol Foundation to mint five non-fungible tokens from restored and preserved files of the artist's 1985 collection, Andy Warhol, Machine Made, which were recovered from floppy disks back in 2014. Now that sold for a combined total of 3.3 million US dollars. Sotheby's, on the other hand, conducted a week-long auction of Natively Digital, a curated NFT sale. Now this collection, which begun its sale on June 3, 2021, netted an astonishing $17.1 million and featured nearly 70% of new buyers. 
The new buyer stat in particular bodes well for the future of NFTs, indicating a broadening interest base. It's not just buyers though. NFTs have been gaining eyeballs from artists, both old and new, celebrities as well as corporate giants. Visa, Nike, the NBA have all made a sizable investment into the space. Celebrities like Lionel Messi, Tom Brady and the latest entrant former NBA superstar Shaquille O'Neal are not shying away from trying their hands in the world of NFTs, whether as an investor, as a muse or otherwise. So ultimately, whether it be endorsements, inspirations or features in physical art galleries, the trend in NFTs is growing acceptance. As to what constitutes art is an unending debate. Many are still coming to grips with some of the pieces at Tasmania's Museum of Modern Art, but they'll have a whole new digital world to embrace now too as NFTs look set to stay and their acceptance by art galleries and exhibition houses is a testament to that fact. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please like, share, subscribe to the channel, drop us a comment about what other crypto related info you'd like us to break down, and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Kalkine has a new video. Sage here for Kalkine Media. Today's trending topic is, is Mask Network the next big crypto? Let's find out. Mask Network is a primary blockchain project that gives to its users while interacting online. It's a protocol that allows the users to send encrypted messages over social media platforms, thereby protecting their privacy. And launched in 2019, it's the first of a kind coin that acts as a bridge between the online world and the decentralized networks. Mask Token has been in demand for a month or so now, largely due to the DeFi and NFT boom. In fact, the cryptocurrency registered gains of about 154.34% in just the last few days. The token not only gives the investors exposure to the popular trends and gain profits from it, Mask Network is governed by its token MASK Mask, ranked 248 on coin market cap. So what are the benefits of Mask Network? The Mask holders are also members of the Mask DAO and they possess the ownership of the Mask ecosystem. It gives the user the right to vote on the development of the ecosystem. Mask Network actively engages on various DeFi projects through the Web3 protocols. With the security as the primary objective, Mask Network gives the freedom to the users to interact with others, as well as send or receive cryptocurrencies using the dApps. Besides this, the Mask Network is also able to offer the peer-to-peer -peer payments and a decentralized storage functionality. Because of the dApps feature, it seamlessly allows the users to switch from one application to another without creating a decentralized applet ecosystem. Is Mask Crypto a good long-term investment? With the crypto world abuzz, with the DeFi and NFT boom, time couldn't get more perfect for investment in Mask's network. With the Mask Network also offering storage facilities, its expanding ecosystem will boost the demand for the token. One can purchase or trade the token on Coinbase's platform. 
If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calkine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, head to the website, it's calkinemedia.com. Stay here for Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hey, and thanks for joining us on oh, Shield here for Calcane Media. Here are our top stocks with digital asset exposure to keep an eye on. First up is Advanced Micro Devices. Although the company doesn't deal with cryptocurrencies directly, it manufactures graphics processing units used in data centers and AI applications, as well as crypto assets and high-end video game graphics. Graphics processing units are critical hardware for creating or managing crypto assets. Next is American Express. The New York-based financial institution has a presence in some 130 countries, it provides credit card services to buy crypto products and cryptocurrencies. People can purchase crypto products using credit cards and experts say it's the initial phase of mainstreaming cryptos. Facebook. The social media giant plans to create an open source cryptocurrency called DM, formerly named Libra, which will be available in a digital wallet. It's currently working on a wallet called Novi as well and has a market cap of $886 billion. Next is Square. The San Francisco, California based fintech company provides payment processing systems for merchants and for Cash App, a person-to-person -person payment platform. Square has a digital asset exposure through its Cash App, which allows users to buy and sell Bitcoins seamlessly, and a team of Bitcoin developers that work on its crypto projects. Riot Blockchain This Bitcoin mining company has produced 406 Bitcoins last September. Riot builds, supports and operates blockchain tech and has a market cap of $2.7 billion. The price to earnings ratio is 66.31, and for the June quarter of 2020, revenue was at 34 million and net income at 19 million. Next on our list is Heart8 Mining. This digital asset mining company focuses on Ethereum and Bitcoin mining. It's mined 264 Bitcoins in September, with an average production rate of 9.11 Bitcoins per day. Following that is Coinbase Global. The cryptocurrency exchange recently announced its bid to enter into the non-fungible token market space. The company was listed on the Nasdaq in April of 2021 and its revenue was at $2.2 billion and net income at $1.6 million for the June quarter. The stock has grown by around 16% since April. And last on our list is of course Tesla. The company started accepting payments in digital currencies in February of 2021 and purchased Bitcoin worth $1.5 billion. However, it's currently suspended the crypto transactions for buying its cars. But it's hinted that it'll be going back to its pro-crypto stance. We'll just have to wait and see. And that concludes our list. Thanks for tuning in and now that you're up to speed, why not check out some of our other videos as well. Holly Shields, signing off. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. 
Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space. From updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. How can you create a happy home? Hi, I'm Andy Liu from Calkine Media and you are watching my health show, Calkine Wellness. Wellness is associated with quality of life. It is the state of being in good health where you look, function, feel, perform and stay well. Very often we negate the impact of a happy home on wellness, yet the home is a place where you discover your inner self, it's the place where you rejuvenate yourself. Thus it's vital to have a happy home, right? So in today's show we'll talk about how you can create that happy home. Let's first understand what is a happy home. A happy home is a place where you feel safe and secure where you relax and most importantly it's the place where you can just be yourself. It's your comfort zone, your cozy shell. So why is a happy home significant for wellness? A happy home contributes to overall emotional well-being. It's like a memory machine that helps us keep alive the valuable moments that has given our lives meaning, well-being and happiness. You would have even noticed that you don't look forward to going back home after work or you don't feel like staying at home for long hours or you just don't feel content at your own house. Perhaps that's what's happening for you now. No worries, it happens to almost everybody and fortunately there are ways to create a happy home for yourself. So without any further delay, let's understand how we can create this happy environment in our happy home. Firstly, natural light is the happiness booster. We all know that darkness resembles gloominess and light resembles hope. And without question, natural light is the best light. So we should concentrate on maximising the ways of natural light and letting that into our home so that there's always hope and positivity reflected and bringing brightness into your space. Let's look at house plants or as we like to address them, the natural cheerleaders in our home. We need to make our homes feel alive and plants are alive and bring life and nothing is better than these house plants to give our personal spaces some extra organic life. Indoor plants can be put in the bedroom or in your living room. Similarly, outdoor plants on the balcony or windowsills add life and prospects of natural growth within a home. Moving on, there should always be that one personal corner, the coziest corner. Your home is your space, but there is one corner that is exclusively yours. Making that corner feel cozy and welcoming helps one to feel more homely, safe and secure in your own space. A space for sentimental items. You'll need a house that emits warm and happy emotions, creating spaces for family, pictures that take you back to a nice place or your childhood would help you relate to your home and feel contentment and comfort or love. Last but not the least, it's about the people in it. This is the perhaps the most important feature of a happy home. A happy home isn't just about the decor or the things that you put inside it, but it's also about the people inside it and living with you. Make sure that you have a healthy relationship with your co-housemates. To maintain positivity in a house, building a good relationship with the people that you live with is actually crucial. Making time for quality time around, perhaps meal times, is the best way to try and connect in a healthy manner with those that you live with. So these were a few secrets to a happy home and perhaps there are so many more that you can think of and that I've inspired you with. So most importantly, you need to make time for space on your own and feel comfortable with yourself in it because your comfort and contentment are the most important things for your wellness. 
Now if you like this information and want more, please like, share and comment on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to press the bell icon to get the latest notifications. For regular updates and information, do log on to our website for all videos in general, that's calkinemedia.com. You're watching Andy Lou with Wellness and Calkine Media. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Very good morning to you. Welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Kalkine TV Sydney Studios. Now the Australian share market is set to rebound today. That was after diving lower in the afternoon session on Friday as all sectors closed the day in the red. According to the latest SBI futures, the ASX 200 is expected to open the day 68 points or 0.9% higher. At the end of Friday, the closing bell, the S&P SX 200, was 1.4% or 107 points lower at 7,324. Over the week, it lost 1.3% or 92 points. The worst performing sector on Friday was Real Estate Investment Trust, down 2.6%. Communication Services was down 2% as the second worst. And the sector with the fewest losses was healthcare, down 0.1%. The best performing stock on Friday was GUD Holdings. Their shares closed 6.9% higher. The worst performing stock in the S&P SX200 was Unibail Rodamco Westfield. Their shares closed 6.2% lower. And in local business news from this morning, Westpac have reported a cash profit of $5.35 billion dollars for financial year 2021. It also announced a $3.5 billion off-market buyback. The company grew their Australian mortgage portfolio by 3%, or $14.7 billion over the year, a significantly better performance than in 2020. Owner-occupied lending increased 9%, consistent with increased liquidity in the market. Total customer deposits were up 4%, or $24.9 billion. Moving on, an Osnet has entered into a scheme implementation deed with Brookfield Highlights. Now, Brookfield is to acquire all the shares in Osnet for cash consideration by means of a scheme of arrangement. Brookfield's leading a consortium, which includes co-investors, Sun Super Superannuation Fund, Alberta Investment Management Corporation, the Investment Management Corporation of Ontario, and Healthcare of Ontario Pension Plan. The scheme values Osnet at an equity value of $10.2 billion and an enterprise value of $17.8 billion. And Seven West Media has entered into an agreement to acquire the Prime Media Group with a bid price of $131.9 million. The bid represents a 57% premium to Prime Media's close on Friday. Seven West Chief Executive James Warburton says the acquisition means Seven West Media will become Australia's leading commercial premium broadcast video and news network with the potential to reach more than 90% of Australia's population each month. And Lendlease today announced the completion of the sale of its services business to ServiceStream, receiving the full sale price of $310 million. Well, now it's time for a very short break, but stay tuned for more news set to affect the trading day. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? 
Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. And welcome back to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones, live from Sydney for Kalkine TV. Now let's look over to America. On Friday, the Dow Jones rose 0.25%. The S&P 500 gained 0.19% and the Nasdaq added 0.33%. On the other hand, the MSCI World Equities Index dipped 0.25% to 745.08. European stocks closed 0.07% higher. That was after rebounding from losses early in the day session. And with commodities, U.S. crude prices rose. That was on expectations that the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, Russia and their allies, would maintain production cuts. Brent crude rose six cents to settle at $84.38. and U.S. cents. As Texas Intermediate crude rose 76 cents or 0.9 percent to $83.57. A surging U.S. dollar weighed on the price of gold, with spot gold dropping 0.9 percent to 1,782 U.S. dollars and 39 cents an ounce. U.S. gold futures fell 1.3 percent to 1,783 U.S. dollars an ounce. And lastly, let's look at some up-and-coming IPOs for today, set to list at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time is men's underwear retailer called Step One Clothing. They're followed at 12.30 today by financial services provider Judo Capital Holdings. Well, that's all for our Morning Outlook report here on Calkine TV. Have a great day trading and stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Thank you. Did you? Men's underwear. Why doesn't that surprise me? Boarding pass, please. No, please don't. <laughs> Nobody needs to see you in the Hi, underwear. I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space. From updates on restrictions, to travel guides, to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Welcome to the Executive Corner, Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, but today's guest is Ms. Philippa Bird, founder of What's On Sydney. And this site provides Sydney ciders with all the latest events in Sydney and New South Wales to find out what's on for today or the weekend. 
bringing you live on the show today. We have Miss Philippa Bird, founder of What's On Sydney. Welcome to the show, Philippa. Thank you. Good morning. Great to have you on, Philippa. Now that things are opening up and the tourism sector's hopefully going to be a buzz soon, What's On Sydney is a long-running website, and this was founded by yourself in 2003. And haven't things changed since then? Could you please share with us the inspiration behind your brand? It sure has changed over the years, dramatically. Um, well, I was new to Sydney in 2003, and I was very frustrated because I couldn't find out what was going on. And I'd often find out about events after they'd happened, which was really annoying. So I was searching around the internet um, quite a lot, trying to find out what was going on. And I found out um, any sort of event sites there were, which were very, very few at the time, they didn't have a calendar functionality. So you couldn't find out what was happening on a certain day. So I decided, um, having no knowledge in programming, to make the website out of Microsoft Word, because I did know how to use that. And so I made a calendar, and then I hyperlinked every date for two months. I did this, the, the, made the website for two months, and then every day I would go and make an extra day. And so that's how, how it started. Um, just out of pure frustration, really. Um, but it wasn't easy back then, because once I'd made it, then I had to find out you know, what was going on and people, get people to list with me. And that was a bit of a struggle because back in 2003, people were only just starting building their own websites and they couldn't see the value of advertising on somebody else's. So that was a, the first hurdle I had to get over <laughs> all those years ago. And this was before the times of social media as well. Like you're saying, people were just building up their websites and they'd prefer to have all their information on their own. That's very interesting. So, yeah. well, you rose to the challenge and somehow now you've got people approaching you to buy advertising space and campaigns for their events and yeah. uh, activities. So that's fantastic. Uh, I'm also yeah. an independent theatre producer and I've advertised on your website before. So definitely you are known of out there. Um, who do you see as your main clients and what do you see as your main revenue raising strategy? Oh, uh, we've got... Uh, so many clients now, I mean, pretty compared to when we first started, obviously. Um, but they're far ranging from anything from theatre to big restaurant train chains now. Um, yeah, it's changed over the years, but um, really the way the site's been built up, I've been really lucky and um, all my relationships have been built just through email. And some of those people who started listing with me in 2003 are still with me today. So that's lovely and obviously over those years we've built up quite a rapport with each other and we know each other very well. So when COVID hit, you know, it was quite personal, some of the stories I heard. So that was um, that was lovely. Um, but as for making money, hmm, well that was the tricky part because the whole ethos of the site was to give something back to the community, um, particularly the arts community because I could see back in 2003, one of the only ways people could get um, or could advertise was through the newspapers at the time, because internet really wasn't that big. And, uh, and it was obviously very expensive. So most of the theatre companies, the independent ones, they're all not for profits. Um, and like comedians and art galleries and musicians, they all, a lot of them don't have a lot of money to advertise. So to then, to ask them for money was really tricky. So, obviously to list with us, as you would know, is free. Um, but then to make money out of that was a bit tricky when you're giving things away for free. So, <laughs> the first thing I did was then redevelop the website and had spaces so people could buy banner ads. So, that's one string. And that lasted a few years and we thought, hmm, that's going okay, but still not enough. So, then what are we going to do? So, I had the de site developed again. And that was when we brought in our membership packages. So people, like you say, social medias come on board now. So we've got our own social media channels. We send out regular newsletters. So we have um, membership packages that range. So people, depending on their budgets, can choose which suits them and sort of how many events they have in a year as well. Um, and then we also have, we can sell tickets. So that brings in a little bit of money. Um, but then in 2016, I was also scratching my head, thinking, where can we go from here? This was with business. You never want to stand still, and you always want to develop. 
So um, I realised we've sort of been sending out special promotions for Christmas and New Year. So I thought, oh, well, they're going quite well. Let's expand them now. And so we do those for all sort of special events and for the holidays, school holidays and things like that. So that's been another stream. There's sort of been trying to find ways of, of making more money but not putting too much onus on the event industry because we wanted to support them in the first place. <laughs> Right, well, great strategies. So you wanted to be there to be the sport infrastructure to get the news out there about the shows and the artists, but not to extort money out of them. Exactly. That works. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very unique strategy, but I really hope it works for you. Well, it's not going to make me a million dollars, but <laughs> it's very rewarding. Absolutely, there's definitely some good value in there. Um, some arts organisations did pivot to online events during the downturn caused by COVID-19 restrictions and some charged tickets for concerts and theatre shows online or even panel discussions. Were you able to sustain enough business to continue trading during the lockdown from these online events? And do you think the government has done enough to support small business during the most recent lockdown? Uh, the answer to the first question is no. We didn't survive at all, really. Um, it was very tricky, um, especially the first, well, the first lockdown was easier than the second. The first lockdown we knew it was going to be for quite some time, so we managed to um, look at the site and take lots of information down and just put little notices up on listings saying that they were closed. Um, but then when the second one came, it was a bit more difficult because we thought it was just going to be a snap lockdown, so we just left the site as it was and just put up a little notice on the front page saying, hmm. Sydney is shut for a couple of weeks, but then it got expanded, expanded. So then we had to have a little bit of a change because things like Vivid um, cruises and things were up there, and we thought that looked a little odd. So we had to go and to go through the site and try and take some of those events down. Um, so, and also, obviously, because we're supporting the industry, all our membership packages are generally tip, uh, annual. So we gave everybody six months free because we thought, well, it's not fair. They can't, we can't advertise their events, um, so they can have it free. There were a lot of digital events come along online. It was a little bit slow to start with, but then some, you know, people obviously who were the entrepreneurial ones, they got on board and we did advertise them. We changed our strategy slightly because usually you have to pay for um, a web link. But we thought that was not very beneficial to those people trying to make a living and keep going. Um, so we gave them the, that for free as well. So we tried to support everybody as much as we could. Obviously, being online as well, our overheads are actually really low. So we were in a bit of a position that we could support um, where we can, which is why we managed to, to do the six months for the membership and things like that. Um, as, the biz, as for the government, whether it's done enough, well, I said I wouldn't like to be a politician right now. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult situation. There's, very, there's, very, there's a right or wrong answer, really. But um, the small business as such is so vast, and there's so many different industries within, within that. I mean, you've got the arts sector, and then you've got plumbers and electricians and all those as well. But um, there's been a lot of talk about the tourist industry and hospitality, but not so much talk about the arts and supporting them. Um, and the art sector in Australia is huge. It employs more than 350,000 people and brings in a, uh, an economy of uh, 17 billion a year. So it's not small. Um, we've had the wine and dine vouchers, obviously, and that's given some support out there, but not, not enough. Um, and of course, the knock-on effect of all the arts being shut down is what people probably don't realise is that all the PR companies and promoters and um, the agents, the ticking, ticketing agents and all people like that, they will have all been affected as well. You know, if you're talking about a theatre, you've got all the stage hands, the props, the sets, all those companies, they have all would have been out of work as well just because of one sector being shut down. And uh, it wasn't something that I really thought of until a lot of my PR companies that I deal with were ringing me up and or, or just didn't hear from them afraid for six months because they didn't have anything to promote. Um, so it's it's been an interesting time um, and it's affected a lot of people. You know, a lot of the PR companies that I deal with are only small 
they've got like a, a CEO and then maybe a couple of staff. And a lot of the, I've noticed that a lot of the staff have not been around um, much. So hopefully that'll all change in 2022 and everybody can come back on board again when things exactly. kick off. Exactly. Um, well, thank you for sharing the insiders' insights there because that's an amazing amount of money the entertainment sector does bring in to Australia that you mentioned. It does. And yet there is quite minimal support for those that are making it happen. So very That's interesting. Right. I think there's a bit of a there's a bit of thinking out there because they know that a lot of actors and musicians and comedians they all work part time or full time as well. Mm -hmm. Um and they're always going, Oh yes, they do it for the love of it. But you know, they have to make money as well and a lot of those people were their full time or part time jobs would have been in hospitality. And of course, they've gone too. So they're struggling on both counts. That's very true. I mean, one positive aspect of that uh, side of things here in Australia is that if you are a big star, you don't really get hunted down by the paparazzi and fans That's true. Um, <laughs> in Australia. But that does yeah. happen elsewhere where those sort of celebrities and, and actors are paid a bit more and given a bit more face value. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's mm. true. Interesting to ponder upon. Well, now that we are reopening, what should we look out for, Philippa? Is Sydney Fringe Festival going ahead? And what about Vivid Festival of Lights? Was that due to be on soon? Uh, do you have any insider news on these Sydney faves? I do. And sadly, oh, it's all a bit doom and gloom, really. <laughs> no, they're not happening. <laughs> Vivid, uh, Vivid's not going to happen till next year. Fringe is not going to happen till next year either. So it's a bit sad. Um, but the um, Sydney Film Festival is happening in November, so that's great news. That should have happened in um, June, I think it was. Um, and there are still some, um, oh, the Come From Away is happening at the Capitol Theatre as well, so that's good, so that's come back. I was going to say is because it's very, been very difficult for the theatres and art galleries and places like that because, because people haven't been able to rehearse, they have, they've then not been able to put on their shows. And then the shows that were happening during lockdown, or should have happened during lockdown, they haven't happened either. So it's been a bit of a knock-on effect. So it's going to take a while for the for the um, theatres and the art galleries to sort of catch up with themselves, because there were all these artists doing all this work and they've not been able to have, you know, perform and things. Because Come From Away was originally going to be at the Lyric Theatre, and I expect there's something else going to be on there now. And so it had to move theatres. So that's been... A bit of a challenge, I should imagine, for some producers to get their head around all that. <laughs> Absolutely, especially from the contract side of things with yeah. backlogs and actors or producers required on other projects and yet it's because of delays they can't meet their contract agreements. It sounds very complicated. Yes. I'm glad I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I've also seen Moonlight Cinemas looking for yes. employees, um, Theatre Royale, oh, yeah. And City Recital Hall, I think, is also soon to be opening its doors. So hopefully things will be a buzz again soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, next year is looking pretty good. Um, we've got Wind in the Willows happening in January. The Sydney Festival will be up on as normal. So I'm hoping that, you yeah, know, the lockdown stop and 2022 is all full steam ahead. <sighs> Great. Well, hopefully that happens because I'm sure we're all looking forward to getting out and getting cultured again. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we need to get out and support the arts. <laughs> exactly. Here, here. And the government's predicting that COVID-19 cases and hospitalisations could increase significantly by the end of the year, although our figures seem to be decreasing, which is good news. Mm. From your knowledge, do you have any safe entertainment suggestions for those who are not vaccinated come the Freedom Day for the unvaccinated? Well, we're lucky in Sydney because there are so many outdoor events and that's what I would suggest. If you're a little bit worried about going to the, the theatre still and the capacities, I mean, there will be less audience, which is another problem, but I won't go into that now as well. Um, so, yeah, things like Wind in the Willows, the outdoor cinemas, uh, there'll be things happening in Darling Harbour as usual. So things like that, that people can, or everybody can enjoy um, and keep safe, safe and social distance. Great. So, we have, yes, get some oxygen again. Um, Philippa, we have to start winding up, but before you go, we'd love to hear what your near term goals are for What's On Sydney. Oh, yeah. Well, my 
um, goals will be just to reconnect with all my members again because um, obviously I haven't heard from some for a little while um, and that's going to take some time and sort of just build on um, those events again, um, help people out next year uh, and really just yeah, see where the year takes us. We will be doing Christmas uh, and New Year promotions as usual um, and then hopefully we kick off again with strongly with the, the Sydney Festival and things all happening in January. It's always big, massive. <laughs> January in Sydney is so much fun with the Sydney Festival. You're not wrong there. Well, thank you so yeah. much for being available for Expert Talks today. I really did enjoy your insights. No worries. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And you. And if you've just joined us, we just had a very informative discussion with Ms. Philippa Bird, the founder of What's On Sydney. Please check out the full recording on YouTube via Calkine Media and keep watching for more expert talks, live market updates, and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Drinking coffee may do wonders for you. Hi, I hope you're all well and being inspired. I'm Andy from Calkine Media and you're watching Calkine Wellness. On today's show, we will discuss how consumption of coffee in moderation may do wonders for you. And if you are among those who can't do without a cup of coffee in the morning or during long work hours, then it's time to say, Cheers. <laughs> Though coffee was earlier associated with increased health risks, many studies in the last decade have found that drinking coffee may actually benefit you. Coffee or caffeine has a variety of natural substances including the caffeine itself, antioxidants and ditopenes and all these components are mild stimulants for the central nervous system. Research over the years has proved that regular consumption of coffee has several benefits like improved attention spans, alertness and even physical performance. According to the European Food Safety Authority, a cup of coffee can increase the adrenal levels in your body and in your blood. Adrenaline is a crucial hormone which helps you prepare for physical exertion. A cup of coffee before you work out can increase the adrenaline a level by 10 to 12 percent. A study by the Center for Nutrition, Exercise and Metabolism at the England's University of Bath shows that coffee has a high amount of magnesium and potassium which regulates your blood sugar and helps the human body use insulin. It cuts down the craving for sugar and oily and fatty snacks and this can lead to breaking down your fat cells and bring down your body weight. Regular intake of coffee also reduces the probability of developing type 2 diabetes by 11% according to researchers from Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark. Now this is because the coffee can affect the hormone levels which improves one's metabolism and experts say one to six cups of coffee can help your brain stay alert for longer periods of time as compared to other regular drinks and regular intake of coffee stimulates your central nervous system and increases the production of the other hormone called serotonin also dopamine and noradrenaline in your body hence once you have coffee you can feel charged up it also reduces the risk of suicide by 50% just by pepping your mood according to researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health 
Coffee may even, get this, help you live longer. According to studies, those who drink coffee regularly have a lower risk of premature death by 25% compared to those with non-drinkers. According to a Harvard University study, high caffeine levels in your blood can lower the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease as it keeps your brain alert and fundamentally healthy. Moderate intake of coffee also lowers your chance of developing chronic liver disease like liver cirrhosis. According to the British Liver Trust, consuming coffee may actually help stave off the liver cancer and reduce the risks of alcohol-related liver diseases. Liver diseases are the third leading cause of premature death in the UK, but children and pregnant women do need to keep their caffeine intake in check. If you're pregnant, it really is best to avoid it so that you are not creating a dehydration in your unborn baby or fetus. More caffeine or unfiltered coffee can lead to a risk in the cholesterol levels and cause complications in expecting mothers. Moreover, moderation in your diet is always the key. Having too much caffeine and coffee in general can lead to dehydration and experts say that four cups of coffee a day is safe and may do wonders. I prefer to suggest consumption of caffeine in other forms like perhaps green tea or avoid nervous system stimulation completely and get your body functioning so well that you might not even need it. Now, if you like this information, please like and comment and share on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, don't forget to press on that bell icon to get the latest notifications. And for all of our regular updates, for information in general, do log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. You are watching Andy Lou and Wellness with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. Sage here for Calkine Media. Today we're covering the top cryptocurrencies with limited coin supply. Today let's find out the top cryptos with limited supply and also look at their key fundamentals. Starting with Bitcoin. According to reports, Bitcoin can have a maximum supply of 21 million coins. It is estimated that the last 3% of Bitcoin will be mined only after the year 2100. Binance Coin is next. The coin was issued in an initial coin offering in 2017. It was declared that the total supply will be 200 million Binance Coins. With eventual burns, the supply is falling. Cardano. Cardano will have a total supply of 45 billion coins. The current circulating supply is nearly over 33 billion coins. XRP. XRP coins maximum supply can be 100 billion coins. This makes it an interesting limited supply crypto token with unique blockchain features. Avalanche. The blockchain's token AVAX can have the maximum supply of 720 million coins, of which over 391 million coins were in supply at the time of writing. Algorand. 
Algorand is said to be a mining free cryptocurrency, just like other blockchains competing to make transactions cheaper. Algo can have a maximum supply of 10 billion coins. Litecoin. Litecoin can have a maximum supply of 84 million coins, which has already been achieved. The script based coin challenges Bitcoin's digital currency attribute. However, not every cryptocurrency has a limited supply. Ether, the second largest crypto by market cap, does not have any cap on maximum number of coins. This categorizes it as an unlimited supply crypto. However, limited supply is an attraction for many investors. Bitcoin's most talked about feature remains its cap on maximum number of Bitcoin, alongside the way one block reward reduces with time. Low supply cryptos with multi-billion dollar market caps have an even higher appeal. Thanks for joining us. If you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel. If you press that bell icon, you'll be notified when Calkine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, we have a website. Why don't you check it out? It's calkinemedia.com. Stay here for Calkine Media. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calkine has a new video. I'm Sage for Calkine Media, and today's trending topic is what is Lazio Fan Token and what is its price prediction? The Lazio token, which also appears to pay homage to the ancient region of Lazio in Italy on the Tyrrhenian Sea, has some interesting features and let's find out more. What is a Lazio fan token? Fan tokens have their own utility in the real world. Popular cryptocurrency Bitcoin may or may not become a universal legal tender, but fan tokens like Lazio come with a perfect usefulness. Fan tokens allow the holders to become a part of the decision making in the space they're linked to. For example, Socios.com is said to have joined forces with some elite sports ventures, including the Ultimate Fighting Championship and the Paris Saint-Germain. Socios.com launches fan tokens for these sports teams, which the holders can use to have a say in governance. How does Lazio token work? The holders of Lazio gain voting rights within the sports venture, which it is linked to. Besides, there are special rewards that can be earned, and the sports team recognizes the Lazio fan token holder as a VIP, who's given special access to view the sport in the VIP zone. Lazio also claims to provide benefits like a visit to the player area and discounts on the merchandise to holders. Lazio Fan Token Performance Lazio Fan Token debuted on Binance recently and hence not much data is available to analyse the price performance as yet. According to CoinMarketCap, Lazio's market cap is nearly 199 million US dollars, which ranks it quite low as compared to multiple other crypto tokens, including Binance's own Binance Coin. Lazio Fan Token Price Prediction Binance's official announcement regarding Lazio Token's sale on Launchpad. 21st of October 2021 drew wide interest of crypto enthusiasts. It is claimed that 10% of the total supply of Lazio token will go out in a public sale at a price of just one US dollar a piece. Considering the surge in major cryptos like Bitcoin and Ether in the recent weeks, Lazio can likely hover in the higher trajectory for the remaining months of 2021. Binance's year-to-date return is nearly 1,200%, which indicates that Lazio may take a similar upward path. Conclusively, fan tokens are the latest craze in the cryptocurrency world, just like non-fungible tokens, as they are linked to sports teams like football clubs. They have been adopted by many fans. Lazio Fan Token is a Binance-backed crypto, which makes it a formidable player. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. Subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calkine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, please head to the website. 
It's calcimedia.com. I'm Sage for Calcine Media. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Calkine has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Mingalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ngalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off-the-grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well, it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert, basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. 
They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. A crypto friendly. Hey, and thanks for joining in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. Let's take stock. First of all, Barclays. In August of 2019, the bank ended its partnership with Coinbase. However, customers can still buy cryptos with their debit and credit cards. In terms of crypto exchange, it refuses to withdraw or deposit to and from some exchanges. And in some cases, it freezes or even closes accounts. Barclays has also prohibited customers from making a debit and credit card deposits to Binance because of regulatory uncertainty with its operations in the country. Next up, the Royal Bank of Scotland. It allows customers to easily purchase crypto with their debit or credit cards and withdraw or deposit funds into exchanges. Clearbank. The bank took the initiative when Barclays and Coinbase ended their partnership. Its customers can use debit and credit cards for the purchase of crypto. However, it's not a traditional bank for retail customers, but a clearing bank for financial institutions. Nationwide. The bank has not taken any stance against cryptocurrency yet. It allows its customers to buy cryptos using their debit cards but not their credit cards. However, in 2018, Coinbase announced that it will no longer be accepting deposits from nationwide bank accounts due to its move of denying some of the basic transacting methods. NetWest. This bank allows its customers to purchase cryptocurrencies with debit and credit cards, and plus they can deposit into exchanges and withdraw funds from these platforms easily. In July this year, NetWest started temporary capping transfers to several crypto platforms, including Binance and the stated the limits of maximum amount customers can transfer to cryptocurrency platforms. By the month's end, NetWest placed complete bans on Binance after limiting transactions to several crypto platforms. TSB Bank. The bank allows the purchase of cryptocurrencies through credit and debit cards and there were no issues reported with withdrawals and deposits to cryptocurrency exchanges. However, it restricts large transactions, so users have to split transfer account or talk to the bank in these cases. The Cooperative Bank Some banks like HSBC, Lloyds Bank and Capital One have explicitly banned crypto-related transactions, while others have only implied a ban. And keep in mind that there are always the crypto-friendly app-based challenger banks, including Zace, Grounder, Cashua, Revolut, Fidor, Monzo, Starling, BCP Group, and Wirex. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. 
This has been Holly Shields with Hawkeye Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones, and you're watching Calkine TV live from Sydney Studios. And in breaking news this hour, it's great news for the travel industry and wannabe travellers. Fully vaccinated Australian citizens and permanent residents can now travel overseas without an exemption. There will also be reduced quarantine requirements for fully vaccinated travellers when they return to or enter Australia. They must show evidence that you've been vaccinated at least seven days prior to international travel into or out of Australia. You must also provide evidence of a negative COVID-19 PCR test taken within three days of your flight's scheduled departure to your airline when you check in for a flight to travel into Australia. Children under 12 years of age can travel overseas without an exemption. These rules also apply to people who hold a temporary visa and were vaccinated overseas, including international students, Australian residents and tourists. People who can show proof they cannot be vaccinated for medical reasons can also travel without an exemption. Vaccines currently approved in Australia are AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, Janssen, Silac, otherwise known as Johnson & Johnson. The TGA also recognizes the AstraZeneca COVID Shield and Zinovac Coronavac. The first quarantine-free flights into Australia have already landed this morning, with a flight from Singapore landing in Sydney at 5.30 this morning, and a Qantas flight from Los Angeles in the US following half an hour later. 
For those who are not fully vaccinated or have a vaccine not approved by the TGA, arrivals into Australia are capped at 210 each week and are taken to one of two quarantine hotels still in operation. There are 16 flights scheduled to touch down in Sydney today. Australia's borders have been closed for 590 days. That's almost two years. Well, that's all for now, but stay tuned to Calkine TV for more news that matters. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calcine has a new video. Sage here for Calcine Media, thanks for joining us because today we're bringing you a topic that may be of interest. Why is Kisha Ino crypto rising high? Launched in April 2021, the Kishu Inu is another popular meme-based token that has taken the market by storm. And known as the brother of Dogecoin and HOKK's best friend, Kishu Inu is a community-focused decentralized cryptocurrency which offers instant rewards thanks to the users. Kishu, unlike older and comparable projects, introduces holders or hodlers to the next-gen concepts such as participation rewards, NFTs, decentralized exchanges and more. Its mission is to bring popular cryptocurrency concepts to the mainstream. So what is a Kishu token? Within the first month of its launch, Kishu rewrote history as it surpassed 2 billion US dollars in market cap with over 100,000 holders. This was considered an unprecedented milestone for a project of its kind, which reinstated the world's belief in the project. And as the project is community driven, its development doesn't reserve the token for itself. Volunteers and donations mainly drive the community to keep the project running. Besides that, it also provides an interesting NFT marketplace called the Kishu Crate. Through Kishu Crate, the users can stake the tokens and receive NFT rewards and digital collectible features. Is Kishu Inu a good investment option? Kishu's ranked 2,708 on CoinMarketCap. Experts believe that Kishu can be a profitable investment option. They predict that Kishu Crypto can gain further ups, especially with the rally that other meme-based tokens are witnessing now. Now, assuming its rally continues, it could be one of the biggest tokens to watch out for, especially in 2022. And the five-year prediction sees an impressive growth and could see it going past one US dollar by 2026. So going forward, Kishu is trying to prove that it's more than just a meme-based token and one that has the potential to become a true currency. And as per market experts, one of the new cryptocurrencies in the market is banking on longevity down the line. This current rally is definitely going to make a strong case in its favor with investors. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. Subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Kalkine has a new video. Have you invested in Kishu Ino? Let us know. But for more information, regular updates, we've also got a website. <laughs> please check it out. It's kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. 
from the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Elon Musk and crypto's bittersweet relationship. Hey, and thanks for joining us. I'm Holly Hills here for Calcine Media. In 2021, Elon Musk's tweets and Tesla's dynamic decisions have significantly impacted the crypto world. At the beginning of the year, Tesla started accepting Bitcoin as a mode of payment and invested a huge sum in the crypto. Following this announcement, Bitcoin leaped. However, the game changed when Musk tweeted that Tesla would no longer be accepting the crypto anymore because of the environmental impact of its mining. And because of this, the entire crypto sector lost nearly one trillion US dollars at one time. Later on in June, Musk tweeted that Tesla would return to the crypto world if the miners assure that at least 50% of the electricity is generated through renewables. Musk tweets time and time again changed the crypto market performance drastically. And now the wind has started to change again with Tesla's new announcement. Recently, the car company hinted that it might resume supporting cryptocurrency as a mode of payment. This comes as a significant piece of news for the miners, investors and spectators of the crypto world. In a September quarterly filing with the US Securities and Exchange Commission, Tesla announced that it may in the future restart the practice of transacting in cryptocurrencies. Plus, the company may be looking forward to accepting payments via digital assets. They also showed their trust in crypto assets to be used as a mode of payment and for investment purposes in the long run. Tesla believes in the long-term potential of digital assets, both as an investment and also as a liquid alternative to cash. Although it may or may not resume its entry into the crypto world, but if it does, it would be a game changer for digital assets. Some speculation suggests that Elon Musk is manipulating the crypto prices. However, those are mere speculations again, and it's not yet to be seen just how Bitcoins and other digital assets perform in the market in the coming months. Now that you're up to speed, why not sub to our channel to stay ahead of the game? This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media. James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Kalkine has a new video. Thanks for joining us on our trending topic, five stocks you can buy amid the UK's green finance overhaul. 
I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Want to explore the green stocks to invest in amid efforts made by the Boris Johnson government to overhaul the green finance sector? Well, let's get started. AFC Energy. This company provides the crucial hydrogen fuel cell power systems for the generation of clean energy to help in the global energy transition. It has a green economy mark on the London Stock Exchange. In AFC's case, it's all about the future of green energy and the company's hydrogen fuel cell development. It's not yet clear whether battery or fuel cell technology will come to dominate the electric transport business. But there are clear advantages to both and I can see prospects for both technologies. AFC Energy has given a significant return of 216.48% in one year. Greencoat UK Wind this company primarily puts money in wind farms in the UK and generates most of its revenues from eco-friendly activities. It recently updated the market on completing the commissioning of the 45 MW Douglas West Wind Park in Scotland. The addition of the Douglas West, the first subsidy free asset in the UK's firm portfolio, increases Greencoat UK's wins net generating capacity to 1,289 MW. The project has been funded through excess cash flow reinvestment. And Greencoat UK Wind has given a return of 2.76% in one year. Series Power. This company has given a significant return of 53.13% in one year and Series Power Holdings is famous for its solid oxide fuel cell or SOFC technology. This company and its peers could be the key beneficiaries of France and Japan's plans to expand their nuclear capacity in the quest for clean energy alternatives to fossil fuels. President Macron has unveiled a 30 billion euro industrial investment plan that includes a nuclear modular reactor plus two mega factories to produce green hydrogen. Gore Street Energy Storage Fund. This UK based company has given a return of 7.94% in one year. The company mainly invests in renewable assets across the world. Gore Street Energy Storage Fund recently said its assets in Great Britain generated revenues two times above the forecast in September and added that industry is only at the start of its growth curve. The company highlighted that rising revenue was a result of increasing energy prices and the asset's ability to respond quickly to market opportunities. Active Energy Group. This company focuses on traditional and second generation biomass products to contribute towards creating a global green economy. It has given a negative return of 16.67% in one year. Last month, it discussed progress made at its coal switch project in Ashland, Maine and Lumberton, North Carolina, as part of its first half interim financial results released 28th September. Active Energy's coal switch technology produces a high calorific, high bulk density biomass pellet. If you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video. Have you invested in these stocks? Let us know how you went. Press the bell icon and you'll be notified when Calcine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, there is a website. Please check it out. It's calcinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Calcine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV.
Mild stress may be good for you. Hi and welcome to my show, Calkine Wellness. I'm Andy Liu and I hope you're doing well and being inspired thanks to Calkine Media. Today we'll be talking about something that may surprise you, which is stress and how it's not always that bad. Let's find out why and quantify that statement. But of course, keep in mind that too much of anything, including stress, is never good. When we hear the word stress, it almost always gives away to a negative emotion. But studies show that some stress now and then could be good for your health. We feel stressed when we are challenged and the challenges are bigger than the resources we have in hand to cope with. Experts therefore say stress is a process, not a diagnosis. There could be many triggers that can make us feel stressed. There are primarily external factors such as the inability to express children's misbehaviour, work-related demands, expectations and thinking habits. Let's find out about how mild levels of stress can actually be good. Now, stress is not always harmful. It can improve your brain activity. People may gain confidence after experiencing and going past a new stressful situation. They would feel no stress or significantly reduced levels of stress when they face the same situation again. A University of Berkeley study has found that brain stem cells in rats in an animal study grew into new nerve cells after they were exposed to brief stressful events under laboratory conditions. A high level of stress can of course be bad for you, let's keep that in mind. When you experience tiredness or annoyance constantly, this feeling of stress and excess release of cortisol, the stress hormone, might turn into anxiety and depression. So long term stress may put a person at mental and physical health risk, which needs to be avoided with timely help. But if you're unable to avoid stress or unsure of when to approach a doctor, there are free internet sites available these days to check your stress levels. The Harvard Business Review magazine provides one such online test. This test is modified from an original perceived stress scale developed by the US state of New Hampshire. If the score is between 5 and 13, it is low stress, but less than 4 may suggest that you may need some more stress for brain stimulation. A score of 14 to 26 is believed to be moderate, but it, if it goes beyond that range, it's deemed high and then one may need attention. The American Psychological Association, the APA, describes good stress as eustress and bad stress as distress. Eustress, spelt E-U, is positive stress, like taking care of your baby. On the other hand, distress is negative, like what you go through after a breakup. Chronic stress is another form of bad stress. It's a psychological and physiological response to prolonged internal or external stress events, says the APA. Stress becomes harmful when it affects your body and your daily life. It can become chronic or traumatic due to any psychological upheavals. It is like inflation in an economy. Too much of it can be destructive, but too little can be incapacitating. Mild inflation is good for the economy and so is moderate stress. Mild stress is good for the mind and body, says the APA. According to an APA survey in the US in 2019, 44% of adult participants in the study said they exercised and walked to manage their stress level, and 47% of respondents said that they listened to music, whilst around 37% of them said that they preferred spending time with their friends and family and loved ones. Finally, if stress starts to get out of control or turn into distress, remember to use measures to return to a eustress state by exercising, eating proper nutritious food, relaxing, sleeping well, getting people to talk to and offloading your feelings, following sorts of hobbies and of course just enjoying life. <laughs> now if you like this information, please do like, share and comment on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon to get the latest notifications. For regular updates and information in general, do log on to our website calkinemedia.com. You are watching Andy Lou and Wellness with Calkine Media.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Joining us, Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. Most ASX listed consumer oriented companies rely on a pickup in the end of year holiday season trades, and that includes the gaming stocks. So let's have a look at four ASX listed plays to get in on as the gift giving time of year rolls around. First up is Aristocrat Leisure. This company is into development, assembly, sale, distribution and servicing of games and systems. A week back, Aristocrat made a cash offer to acquire London listed leading global online gambling, software and content supplier Playtech. The company is of the view that the acquisition will be boosting its growth strategy of the medium term and deliver a sustainable shareholder value. Aristocrat expects its end product to increase by 81.1% year over year and its shares have given a return of over 54% year to date. Next up is Tabcorp. Its shares have given a return of over 25% year to date. In the past one year, shares have surged over 48%. Tabcorp has been making headlines recently after announcing its intention to demerge and create two ASX listed entities, Lotteries and Kenoco, and Wagering and Gaming Co. Group revenue came in at 7% lower than the prior quarter on account of statewide venue closures due to COVID-19. Following that is PointsBet. Its shares have given a return of over 25% year to date. And in the past one year, they've surged over 48%. A corporate bookmaker, PointsBet has operations in Australia and the US, and they've developed a cloud-based wagering platform to offer clients sports and racing wagering products. In its first quarter trading update for 2022, PointsBet reported another solid quarter of growth driven by a fast-growing North American sports betting market. The company has ramped up its operations in Canada during the period under review and signed two long-term partnerships to offer its betting services. And last on the list is Vanek Vector's Video Gaming and Esports ETF, which is in the field of video game development, hardware and esports. Activision, Blizzard, Electronic Arts, Roblox and Take-Two are a few companies listed in the fund. The ETF has generated a return of over 12% per annum over the last five years and a return of over 6% in the last six months. Among its major holdings are graphics processing unit giant NVIDIA and games developer Take-Two Interactive of GTA and Red Dead series. Electronic Arts who are the makers of FIFA, Sims, Apex Legends, Call of Duty, makers Activision Blizzard and Roblox, the company behind the hugely popular Roblox global platform. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, why not check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Calcone Media.
Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So, for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Good morning and a very warm welcome. James Preston with you for Calkine TV, live from Sydney, and this is the Global Markets Roundup. Let's dive into some key highlights and happenings from Friday, starting with the US market. Global equity markets dipped on Friday, while the US dollar gained as rising consumer prices bolstered expectations of interest rate hikes, even with data showing solid growth in US consumer spending. The MSCI World Equities Index, which tracks shares in 50 different countries, dipped 0.25%. Benchmark US indices closed the week flat on Friday, October 29, weighed down by losses in technology stocks as inflation concerns rose after the latest government economic data. The S&P 500 was up by 0.19%, while the Dow Jones fell 0.25%, and the Nasdaq Composite rose 0.33%. Also, the small cap Russell 2000 was down by 0.03%. On Friday, the Commerce Department said consumer prices rose by 4.4% in September year over year, the fastest pace since 1991. Consumer spending also increased in the month, rising by 0.6% compared to 1% growth in the previous month. Communication and healthcare stocks led gains on the S&P 500 index on Friday. Real estate and energy stocks were the bottom movers and six of the 11 stock segments of the index closed in green. And now it's time for a very small break, but stay tuned as I'll be back with UK and Australian market updates in just a moment. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV.
Thanks for joining us. I'm James Preston and you're watching the Global Markets Roundup show exclusive to Kalkine TV. European equities ended flat on Friday as a jump in major financial stocks driven by surging bond yields offset weakness in high dividend yielding sectors and commodity companies reeling from a slide in oil and metal prices. The pan-European stock 600 index closed 0.1% higher. But it notched a gain of 4.6% in October, marking its best month in seven and recouping all of September's losses as strong third quarter earnings reports drew in investors. London shares ended in red on the last of October, with the FTSE 100 failing to touch the positive territory throughout the day. However, the losses were contained below 0.8%. Following a flatter Wall Street opening, the index parred a considerable chunk of losses in the terminal trade. The FTSE 100 ended up down by 11.9 points, or 0.16% from the previous close. Japanese shares reversed course to end marginally higher on Friday, as optimism around domestic corporate outlook outweighed investors' caution ahead of the country's general election. The Nikkei share average edged up by 0.25%, after losing as much as 1.2% earlier in the session. For the week, the index inched up by a total of 0.3%. China stocks closed up on Friday as consumer staples, information technology and healthcare firms all gained, while the real estate sector witnessed its worst week since February 2018 on a planned tax scheme. The blue chip CSI 300 index rose 0.9%, while the Shanghai Composite Index gained 0.8%. South Korean shares posted the sharpest weekly decline in three weeks after ending more than 1% lower on Friday. Weak economic data and recent earnings at home and abroad pointed to supply chain woes that may further weigh on the economy. The Kospi ended down 31.29% at 2,970.68, extending the declines to a third straight day and logging the sharpest decline since October 12. The Australian share market may start the first day of this week on a positive note with domestic technology stocks expected to track solid cues on Wall Street, while weaker iron ore prices are likely to pull down miners. According to the latest SPI futures, the ASX 200 benchmark fell 1.4% on Friday. Looking at the commodities and bond markets and US Treasury yields dipped from earlier gains, dragged down by concerns over rising consumer inflation for September that further stoked expectations of aggressive monetary policy action from the Federal Reserve to combat the surge in prices. The benchmark US 10-year yield traded down at 1.5539%. The dollar index continued to rebound from prior day losses on news that the Fed's preferred inflation measure showed prices continuing to rise faster than its 2% target. US dollar futures index increased by a total of 0.85%. Oil prices have also risen. US crude prices rose on expectations that the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, and also Russia and their allies would maintain production cuts. Brent crude rose 6 cents to settle at 84 US dollars and 38 cents, and the West Texas Intermediate crude rose 0.9% to trade at 83 dollars and 57 US cents a barrel. Gold prices fell off a surging US dollar weighed on the price of the precious metal. Spot gold dropped 0.9% to trade at 1,782 US dollars and 39 cents an ounce. And US gold futures fell 1.3% to US 1,783 dollars an ounce. And in terms of newsmakers, Westpac reported a cash profit of 5.35 billion Aussie dollars in the 2021 financial year. It also announced a $3.5 billion Aussie dollar off-market buyback. Seven West Media has entered into an agreement to acquire Prime Media Group for $121.9 million Aussie dollars. Linus Rare Earths has entered into an agreement with Japan Australia Rare Earths, and the deal allows Linus an extra five months to pay interest of $11.5 million US dollars. The Australian dollar was testing four months high on Friday as investors piled into bets that interest rates could rise as soon as April, hammering bonds and sending yields soaring to peaks not seen since 2019. The Aussie dollar stood at 75.46 cents, having breached resistance points overnight. It was up 1% for the week so far, eyeing the next technical target of 76.16 cents. 
All right, well, that's all for now. Stay tuned to Cowkind TV for the latest market updates, business news, and exclusive interviews. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. The crypto market is absolutely pumping at present. Bitcoin has reached its all-time high and a number of altcoins are also on fire. And in this video, I'll take a look at five altcoins that might be able to hedge against inflation. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Let's start with secret. Cryptos are no longer the secret wealth creators for just a few. Many people are jumping on board. Though crypto can also lead to losses given their volatility, secret crypto has so far done brilliantly with its returns. It's among the top 100 cryptos by market cap, and secret crypto is an independent blockchain and is one of the more anonymous offerings in the crypto space, which is very valuable in a time of decreasing privacy. Over the past 30 days, its price has nearly increased by fivefold from $2.04 US on the 28th of September to now be trading just over $9 as of the 28th of October. Curve DAO or CRV. CRV is a stablecoin exchange, indeed with decentralized attributes. It claims to be infusing liquidity into the stablecoins market by its automated market maker feature. CRV is the native token of Curve's decentralized autonomous organization, also dubbed as DAO. DAO is an Ethereum-based connector for smart contracts built on the blockchain. CRV has also experienced huge upswings over the past month, sitting at $2.26 on the 29th of September to now jump as high as $5.10 on the 26th of October before settling at $4.47 at the time of this recording. Thorchain or Rune Although Thor is typically identified by a hammer, this cryptocurrency takes Thor to the world of blockchain, as opposed to the dark world with the dark elves and ice giants. Anyway, it enables users to trade cryptocurrencies without having to lose the asset's custody. Rune is the native token of Thorchain. It can be used by network participants for the payment of fees. Rune has almost doubled in value over the past month from $6.44 on September 30 to its October 28 price of $12.30. And it also had an all-time high reached on May 19, 2021 of $20.24. Near Protocol. Near is a decentralized application platform. It uses the proof of stake protocol to let apps work on the web and it features stable fees with an ease of scalability of the platform. Near is the native cryptocurrency of the Near Protocol. On September 29, it was trading at $6.47 and more than doubled that price by October 26, hitting $13.17. It currently sits at just under $11 at the time of this recording. And our final altcoin in focus to help against inflation is Harmony. Now we know that Ethereum's blockchain is used to build dApps. Harmony also provides similar services to developers by claiming to provide improved processing speeds. Harmony's blockchain is said to allow the creation of blocks within seconds, and it might also soon become a cross-chain platform. Its native token, One, has more than doubled in price over the past 30 days. So to sum it all up, these are just a few altcoins that have provided incredible gains as of late. 
And with 2021 being yet another year of increasing costs, you could do worse than to consider adding some of these high-flying cryptos to your portfolio. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please like, share, subscribe to the channel, drop us a comment about what other crypto-related info you'd like us to break down, and of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Donating stocks instead of cash can often be a much better option for both parties. A wide range of charities, schools, hospitals and other non-profit organisations prefer receiving stocks as a gift or donation as it provides them with tax benefits and maximises their gains. These organisations appreciate all kinds of donations, but from a donor's perspective, cash donations aren't the most financially viable option. Several veteran investors already understand that stock donations are a better way to maximise their charitable giving and offer tax benefits to both parties and new investors are quickly catching on. So in this video, I'll run you through what the benefits of doing so are. But just quickly, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kaokai. Tax Benefits of Stock Donations The owner of a stock doesn't need to pay any capital gains tax in case of an increase in the value of the stock from the time of its purchase. The stock can instead be donated to another party to avoid the tax altogether. If the securities are being donated to a charitable organisation, the total amount of donation will be eligible for a tax deduction, and thus the donor will be incentivised to make a bigger donation. This benefits both parties as the avoidance of tax by donors leads to higher donations for charitable organisations. Another notable point to consider is that if the stock is held for less than a year, then your deduction would be limited to cost basis. While in the case of holding stocks for more than a year, the full fair market value of the donated stock may be deducted before giving it away. Also, it's generally better to sell a stock prior to donating cash to a charity if the stock is trading at a price less than what you purchased it for. This enables you to take the loss which can be used for tax purposes. Is donating a stock a good option? Seasoned investors and entrepreneurs get enormous tax benefits by donating stocks. Donating securities is becoming a very popular investment move for wealthy donors. While increasing private wealth accumulation is creating inequalities in society, incentivised charitable giving is genuinely creating a significant difference. Investors can use stock donations to integrate their investment strategy using tax-effective tactics. Wealthier investors use stock donations to optimise their portfolio, which has the added effect of benefiting a number of worthy causes in the community. So the bottom line is that stock donations are carried out online, they're safe, secure and can procure an even bigger advantage for charities than a standard cash donation. The tax breaks are of course also highly beneficial for donors. So if you're thinking of giving as we approach the festive season, how about thinking of doing so from your portfolio and not from your wallet? If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, 
saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. A pump and dump scheme is a way fraudsters use to manipulate stock markets to artificially inflate the price of a stock and generate illegal profits. Unscrupulous investors use the scheme to create a market frenzy that will inflate a stock's share price only to dump the shares laid out by selling them at a higher price. As a result, unsuspecting investors are left with a loss as their asset price falls, often ending up worthless. Other than penny stocks, fraudsters are now using these schemes in the case of cryptocurrencies as well. But don't worry, let's look at 5 tips to recognize pump and dump schemes. Before we get into it though, please give our channel a sub and hit that bell icon to stay ahead of the game. First up, scammers start a pump and dump scheme by sending emails to propagate their agenda. Even 1,000 recipients buying the given security can boost their purpose. Thus, you should never entertain such emails, which say that a given stock or cryptocurrency is a can't miss opportunity. Secondly, you should always be aware of unregistered or unlicensed advisors recommending investing in a particular security. These people are mostly interested in making money at your expense via the pump and dump schemes. It's always advised to conduct your research on a particular security before investing in it. Thirdly, when a zooming price coincides with a pump and dump email, it pays to be suspicious. It might mean that such a scheme is actually working for some fraudsters. As investors get drawn into the scheme, demand exceeds supply and prices jump. Thus, it's important to pay attention to the fact that is actually driving the prices. Next, the volume also rises with a rise in security prices. Daily traded stocks and cryptocurrencies are generally the kinds of securities targeted by scammers. It's also because only requiring a small increase in volume to push prices higher. When a stock that generally trades at a few thousand shares each day suddenly surges to a few million, price moves can be significant. And lastly, a group of message board participants advise others to make investments in stocks with certain characteristics. They generally advise to focus on stocks with low prices and high short interest. The share price surges sharply as the shorts are forced to cover. Investors must always be aware of pump and dump schemes. In case you find a particular advice good enough, always conduct your own detailed research and only then proceed. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ or just stay up to date. If you like this info, please give us a like, share and a comment as well. This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media. James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello and welcome. I'm Sage reporting for Calkai Media and this is the Crypto Catch, where we catch you up on what's been happening in the cryptocurrency space over the past 24 hours. First, the Bitcoin news. And the South Korean police have arrested three people it claims orchestrated a major crypto fraud ring that told investors they could take advantage of the so-called kimchi premium. The kimchi premium phenomenon involves sudden increases in South Korean trading volumes and spikes in demand for crypto assets that rise in excess of the global average on international trading platforms. This means that buying coins for fiat becomes more expensive on South Korean platforms such as than on international exchanges. The South Korean Customs Service has sought to crack down on kimchi premium traders, many of whom have sought to buy coins in over-the-counter trades in China, only to dump them on domestic platforms, trading them for cash at much higher prices. Bitcoin's currently valued at approximately US$61,502. And meanwhile, crypto users have been issued a warning as a new Squid Game cryptocurrency rockets in value in its first days of trading. The new cryptocurrency inspired by the South Korean survival drama Squid Game has jumped to US $38.04 after being valued at US $2.25 on Friday. However, it has been criticized for not allowing users to sell tokens with CoinMarketCap, issuing a warning, saying that they have received multiple reports that users have not been able to sell the token on crypto exchange PancakeSwap. However, the white paper for the coin does say it does include an anti-dumping technology that prevents people from selling their coins if certain conditions are not met. CoinMarketCap's rival platform CoinGecko said Squid Game is most likely a scam. Let's take a break and we'll be back with altcoin news as well as the day's winners and losers, so stay tuned. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Welcome back to Crypto Catch Sage here. Let's move on now to the altcoin news. And a new meme coin named after Tesla's founder Elon Musk has hit the market, dubbed Dogelon Mars. The crypto is to rise to 0.0000023 US dollars. The coin rose 3,780% in October and pushes the new altcoin to 92nd largest cryptocurrency by market cap. And moving on to today's biggest winners and losers. And the 63rd ranked crypto, Holo, has risen nearly 35% in the past 24 hours. The coin 
is now valued at US 0.014 US dollars with a total market cap of 2.4 billion US dollars. 80th ranked crypto quantum rose over 19% overnight to be valued at $15.46 US. Quantum has a market cap of over 1.5 billion US dollars. And today's losers, Decentraland dropped around 30% overnight to be valued at $2.75 US and Basic Attention Token dropped around 26% overnight to be valued at $2.75. And thank you for joining us and that's all for today's Crypto Catch. Stay tuned for more market news throughout the day. I'm Sage for Calcine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calcine TV. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Calkine TV. The troubles in Victoria by now have been well documented. Whilst COVID-19 is causing problems, the real virus increasingly is that of the Daniel Andrews government. Ruling with a hand over fist mentality that includes weaponising the police force against citizens, mandating vaccines for millions and as it now turns out, barring members of parliament from entering the Victorian chamber. One of those politicians who has been banned from entry into Parliament is Legislative Council Representative Tim Quilty from the Liberal Democrats, and he joins me live now on Calkine TV. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Hopefully you're hearing me this time. Tim, got you loud and clear. Now, look, you're one of the members of the Parliament yes. in exile at the moment. Can you explain what that is and why you're a part of it? Okay, so... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Andrews government brought in rules to say that uh, all members of parliament would have to show their vaccine passports in order to participate in the parliament. Um, it's because, and because they're doing this to everyone else in Victoria as well, they decided to make some special rules for them as well. Um, David and I refused to show our papers because we don't believe in the vaccine. We think it's a uh, gross violation of human rights of Victorians. Um, we, we we're we both vaccinated. We could easily show our papers and turn up, but we refused to do that, so we got kicked out of the parliament. Um, we called it a, a, a purge. Um, they kicked MPs out of parliament, and what's left is a rump parliament. Last time this happened in a West, Westminster democracy was back in 1648 when Cromwell uh, purged the parliament so he could get a, a remaining rump that would vote for him, support for him being the king, um, when he went on then to become dictator of... Uh, England. Um, so uh, a shocking thing that they've done, they've upturned hundreds of centuries of press, parliamentary precedent to do it, um, but we didn't buckle under it. So we have set up a rebel parliament or parliament in exile in a basement in a nightclub in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> and we've been conducting parliament from here for the last week. Now I understand as well that whilst you have got your separate parliament set up there, it now doesn't actually allow you to vote on parliamentary issues. How can that possibly be the case given you are still an elected representative? Yeah, well, exactly. This is the whole problem with it. Um, because te technically under the Constitution, you can't vote unless you're at the parliament. And then by passing this, this rule that barred us from accessing the parliament, they took our vote away. Um, and right when they were introducing their uh, permanent pandemic legislation, mm. the power, let's go, you know, and Andrew's the, pa the power to extend this state of emergency in depth. Um, or their, their motivation was to get rid of our voices, um, to get rid of our vote, to make it easier for them to push. 
Well, let's touch on that right now because obviously this is the big talking point at the moment is the fact that it's, it's pretty intense legislation that's being pushed forward. Typically what we've seen is a state of emergency that just seems to be constantly rolled over despite the current scenario that Victoria is experiencing. This would obviously give somewhat unprecedented powers. We're having people like yourself who can't vote on it. Do you now know what is actually included in it? Because it's been very much a document of secrecy. Oh, absolutely. They, they've been working on this bill for months, but uh, they didn't show it to any impact. In fact, the official government line was uh, MPs didn't deserve to see it. We weren't uh, supporting the government, so we had no right to see it, the legislation. It finally got out this week. Uh, it was leaked to the media first, who then passed it on to MPs. Um, so we finally got to see it. Um, parts of it are not terrible. They've, they've sort of half included the things we've been calling for, durative emergency more transparency and so on, um, revealing the advice that you for it. Um, but they could have done that anyway without this new legislation. Mm. Uh, making it uh, just indefinite, uh, the Premier's giving all the power to the Premier to make it go on and using uh, severe penalties. So it'll be up to two years in prison for anyone who knowing breaks a, a mandate. Um, so if you're outside without your mask on and they decide that was a particularly bad not mask wearing event um they could throw you in prison for two years it's shocking it's crazy stuff, especially when you consider Daniel Andrews was recently, of course, found in public twice without a mask on. I would love to see whether he would also potentially face the wrath of two years imprisonment for his own laws. But um, well, quite interesting there as well, Tim. I mean, you mentioned that some elements of it are fine, but there's also the, the subject of uh, potentially a $90,000 fine, for example, of trying to use uh, a fake COVID passport or, or things like that. Uh, typically as well, I mean, you mentioned there too that you haven't been able to see you had to get a leaked copy from the media usually there's about a month of consultation period why is this one so shrouded in mystery is there a concern about the entirety of the bill in that sense that there were things that he doesn't want seen in order to be assessed further you've got to assume that was behind it they didn't want um public opinion to build up against uh so the bill is going through the lower house today and uh, we're assuming it won't come to the upper um, until a couple of weeks time so there will be a little bit of time to review it but there's been very little concern in the uh they've, they've kept it all shrouded uh because I, we can only presume because they didn't want anyone to push it. um it's just not the way things are normally done uh and there's no need for it now the basically over they got the vaccination rates up at over 90 percent mm. um the crisis is over uh, it's time to go back to normal life but um andrews doesn't want to do that he wants to keep it rolling he wants to keep his powers yeah more lockdowns uh more vaccine mandates um what by well, Tim, the most bizarre part to me at present is that unvaccinated people at the moment in Victoria, they can actually go to a retail outlet, yet when the state hits 90% of double dosage, presumably it, it should be a safer state, according to how this all works, they'll then have those freedoms revoked. What have the discussions been around surrounding that decision, and does it have any correlation with science at all in that respect? Uh, it's, it's a science, yeah. Um, <laughs> what it really is, is uh, the law, or the current emergency uh, if someone takes that to court, it'll probably be ruled illegal because it's not uh, proportionate. Um, but under the new powers, have by that date in November, um, they'll be able to do whatever they like. So that, the reason they've postponed it is not the science or anything else. It's just because under the new laws, it'll be legal. And under the current laws, it probably won't. Right, okay. Well, look, Daniel Andrews has also recently stated that unvaccinated individuals will not be allowed to participate in regular Victorian life until potentially 2023. I mean, a full, m more than a year from now. Presumably, Victoria hits their 90% vaccination rate of the double dose by the end of this year. Why is that the decision then, if we're looking at potentially a year post double 90%? Um, don't ask me, it's insane. It's, it's utterly insane. Um, it makes no sense. Um, Andrews is angry that people defying his will um, and he's trying to force everyone to it, into it. Uh, I can't tell you more than that. It, it does not make sense. There is no science behind it. It's just um, Andrews' iron will to power uh, uh, trying to force it on everyone. I Has there been any consultation process with the likes of the Liberal Democrats or other parties or is it just within the Andrews circle creating these things? 
Uh, we, we certainly haven't been consulted about it. Um, and that the three cross benches who supported it, um, mm. the previous state of emergency extensions were involved in negotiations, although some of them claim they weren't. Oh, they say they were and they weren't. We don't know what the picture is there, but certainly the opposition and the rest of the crossbench have had no consultation on it. And I think don't think it's been very, very much consultation outside of the parliament either. We had a the Victorian Bar Association came out yesterday slamming it, um, and the fact that there's been no consultation that their government said they were consulted them, but all they did was a 45 minute uh, Teams uh, meeting with them, which they discussed almost nothing about the bill. Um, yeah, no consultation whatsoever. And Tim, who were those three crossbenchers that were approached? So we know um, on the last two states of emergency extensions, um, we had the, the Greens, um, uh, Animal Justice, Andy Medic, and the Reason Party, uh, Fiona. Uh, so um, those three M MPs are the ones that were involved in and they got a briefing on Monday from the government, and we don't know how much more briefing they had before that time or not. Um, and it seems likely that they will be the ones that support it again. I think pretty much the rest of the crossbench has come out against supporting this, um, mm. but a couple of them haven't made it public yet. Now, just for those who might be tuning in a little late to this interview, can you, one, if you're willing to do so, uh, declare what your vaccination status is and whether you believe people should be vaccinated? We know that you certainly not agreed to uh, provide the passport to enter Parliament, but where do you sit and where do the Liberal, Demo Liberal Democrats sit in terms of uh, vaccinated or unvaccinated and, and yourself, of course? So I'm vaccinated um, and I'm reasonably pro-vaccine. Uh, I've encouraged people to get a vaccine, but uh, as a party, we support consent. Uh, we we mm. support choice. Um, these things shouldn't be forced by the government. So people have the right to choose not to be vaccinated if they want. Um, as a party, we have always stand up for consent and for choice, um, and we'll never support uh, compulsory vaccination, vaccine mandates, or any oppressive tactics. And Tim, finally, the Australian Open debacle, this is an, an absolute mess. Obviously, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has suggested unvaccinated players will be allowed to compete. Andrews has now pushed back against that, suggesting that it's unfair to Victorians who have been jabbed. To me, it's not really an issue of fairness, though. How can the view be that I did it, so you have to do it too? Surely it has to be about health and, and not fairness, if it is indeed a vaccine which is designed to... I, I suppose, mitigate the risk of potential spread. What are your thoughts on it? And do you think that unvaccinated players should be able to play at the Australian Open? Um, obviously they should. Um, and again, it's all about Andrew's ego. He's, he said it won't happen and now he's gonna try and make it not happen. Um, I think the tennis authorities should push back and cancel open again if, if, if um, Andrew's trying to chuck his weight around like this. Um, to do with tennis, it doesn't have to do with safety, it's it, uh, about Andrew's ego. Well Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience? Um, I don't, don't know, this, it just, this keeps going on. Um, the, one, one day we'll get out of this. Uh, we're going to push back against this legislation the government's proposing, uh, if we've got to block it or not. Um, but. At some point, people got to wake up and realise that the government's completely out of control. Um, I'll say what I said to someone yesterday, never trust your governments. Don't give them the ability to use it. We've seen that now for 18 months. Um, governments are not to be trusted. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Right, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Well, that's Tim Quilty, MP for the Liberal Democrats. And if you missed any part of that conversation, you can catch the full interview later on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV.
Hi there, I'm Rose Jacobs here with you for Calkine Media. Today I'm asking if you are losing sleep over rising inflation. You can get your finances in order with these following tips. But first, make sure you press the bell icon for all the latest updates right here on Calkine. To remain in a consistent financial situation, wages must surge as living expenses go up. However, not all are fortunate to see their salaries rise due to several determining factors. So what should a person do in such a scenario? Here are a few key tips that can be employed in daily life to counter the rising cost of living. Number one, when the cost of living rises, the financial situation of a person can also change accordingly. And in such a scenario, budget plays an important role. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that a budget Budget is the foundation of one's financial life. In case you're not into making budgets just yet, there are several tools or apps, in fact, that are available and that can help you in this regard. These apps can help automate the entire budget. And if you already have a budget, you can update different costs accordingly. Number two, the best way to control the cost of living is to identify and steer clear of all those unnecessary spends. For instance, you can cut down on regular dine-outs or shopping. Proper planning ahead of your next shopping outing can help. In case you find it difficult to cut your discretionary spending, keep reading and listen to all of the other ways that I've got coming up. Number three, there are several recurring expenses that sneak into your budget, eating a substantial chunk of your monthly income. You can surely do without several monthly, quarterly or annual subscriptions, or you can simply change your subscription plans and opt for cheaper ones. There may be some expenses which really don't serve any purpose and can be totally done away with. And number four, in case you are unable to trim your expenses and your employer isn't keen on increasing your wages in accordance with the inflation rise, well then you must start to look at ways to boost your income. You might consider developing a new skill that could help increase your funds. It might help you to make extra money on the side. Now, there are several freelance jobs that you can look at to increase your monthly income. So, in a nutshell, it is natural for prices to keep rising with time. Therefore, you should look at increasing your income to save yourself from the negative impacts of the price rise. And in case you're unable to do so, you must prune your expenses accordingly. And that's it for today. If you like what you've learned, then don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe and go to calkinemedia.com for all our latest. I'm Rose Jacobs and I'll see you next time. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know.
Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, but today's guest is Mr. Vincent Fletcher, the CEO of Carton Cloud. And Carton Cloud streamlines your accounting and admin tasks from route optimization to invoice creation all in one place. They ensure every step of your transport and warehouse management operations is transparent, flawlessly controlled and efficiently conducted in their own words. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. So bringing you live today, we have Mr. Vincent Fletcher, CEO of Carton Cloud. Welcome to the show, Vincent. Hey, thanks very much for having me on. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks for making time for us. And there's been some encouraging data collated from Carton Cloud's Logistics Index, CCLI, showing high industry optimism, strong growth expectations. We're keen to find out more. Could you tell us how the index aggregates this data and what was the motivation behind your brand, please? Yeah, sure. So we, we began the, the Carton Cloud Logistics Index to just sort of get a bit of a snapshot of how the SME 3PL logistics space is is viewing you know business conditions and of course the last 18 months have been sort of unlike anything else what we found is that this kind of information it's not it's not easy to say access just from um, you know general sources because it's such a it's quite a niche specific industry and but we thought that it would be really valuable to get that information together being able to sort of combine it with the, the network of 3PLs that we uh, are in business with and um, and share it with everyone so the way that it works is every quarter we send out a questionnaire and the questionnaire has a total of eight questions on it. Of those eight questions, three of them are the same each time. And those questions are, how do you expect your business to perform in the next six months? What is your view of the current economic climate for your business? And based on the economic climate and the performance of your business, how would you rate the likelihood that your business will bring on additional staff within the next six months? So we're really just trying to get a sense check of, of how they're viewing you know, the situation that they're in and how they believe their business is going to perform. And what we do is we take the answers to those first three questions and we combine them together and then we end up with what we're calling our index value. Now, because this is the second time we've run this quarterly index, uh, we had a baseline that we could use from the last index that we ran. So how that works is last time we ended up with some scores and we used that to create a baseline of 100. And then this time when we ran the, the index again, we could use the same aggregated scores from the second quarter. And basically if we got a score of greater than 100, it would show that people were more optimistic than they had been in the previous quarter. And conversely, if the index came out at less than 100, then it meant that they were the less optimistic. The index itself in, in Q2, although it was still really good, it did see a slight drop. So we actually saw that businesses on the whole went down from our baseline of 100 down to, and eight, down to a score of 86. And I mean, there's been significant ongoing lockdowns through you know, most of Australia, well, most of Australia's population for, for the, sort of the last four months. Um, and we believe that this had you know, a bit of an impact on some of those scores that we saw. What interesting information. Thank you. And, and going to all that trouble to get that data aggregated, but for a very good purpose. Thanks for sharing that. How long have you been running that index for? Oh, so this is the second time that we've run it. So we're currently collecting data for the third index. So that would cover the period um, from July through to October. Okay. So we're, the way that it works is that if, if people fill out the form, then they can immediately access the results of the previous index. So we've done that to try and encourage businesses to put this information in, um, in order to actually, you know, get, get data coming in that we can use to share with everybody again afterward. Fantastic. Yeah. Straight from the horse's mouth. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, it's very interesting to hear what the results were. and. We'll discuss that more with you now. So we've seen some global havoc over the supply chain, logistics and shipping costs and delays across several industries that you touched on a bit there. How has the Australian logistics industry stayed neutral to the economic shifts, government stimulus and changes to business practices in response to the pandemic? Hmm, that's a good question. 
So I think it's like COVID-19 has been both good and bad for logistics. Obviously, you've got um, supply chain issues with a lot of international freight, and this is coming out of issues with, say, manufacturing shortages, like you're seeing with uh, chip manufacturing slowing down, you know, parts that people need to build computers and cars and things. Um, but then you've also got issues with containers sort of getting stockpiled in certain locations and not able to get back, which makes it even worse when they're trying to ship things internationally. However, although that's going on at sort of that, that international and often sea freight level, um, then you've got, you know, a really large number of people who previously weren't doing much on the e-commerce space now ordering a lot of stuff online and getting it delivered to their homes or to their businesses. The majority of the businesses that have been responding to our, um, our quarterly index are involved in the last mile. So they're typically businesses that are delivering, you know, food and beverage, furniture. They might be doing e-commerce fulfillment as well. Basically anything that they can deliver using a truck at the end. So a lot of these guys saw freight surges and, you know, but the, the downside that I think they would have experienced simultaneously was probably more pricing pressure, you know, people's expectations increasing quite dramatically around them because, you know, there is so much more home delivery stuff going on now. The way that you need to perform in that market has gone up. So I think they probably saw increased demand for their services, but probably also higher pricing pressure. And I think those two things together would have led to, you know, a bit of a neutral outcome on the whole. Great. Thank you so much for your insider's insights there. It's definitely looking much different from the outside in compared to the inside out so we do appreciate that um, there seems to be quite a variance between what the senior staff said to the operational staff in regards to the level of optimism on the economic climate yeah. do you do you have um, any uh, insights to share on that according to the data I think it said that 70% of the senior staff were optimistic yet only 40% of the operational staff were tending towards optimism yeah my, my read on that was you know we're, we're largely sampling small medium-sized businesses and so in a lot of cases the senior staff are the owners or somebody well connected to the owner and I I looked at the data and I found it quite surprising at first but then I thought you know in order to start a small business you you really have to be an optimist because there's so many challenges that come up along the way that people that aren't optimistic, they don't typically go out and begin businesses. I think it's probably partly just how those two different groups in general, and I, and I know that I'm sort of stereotyping here a bit, but how those two different groups actually view opportunity in general. And I think that in a lot of cases when you're dealing with SMEs, the guys that are running them, they have to be optimist. And those results come through in the in the survey that we conducted i mean as opposed to say some of the staff that they might have hired who you know they're simply not in those shoes they don't have to be great thank you so much it's it's so true what you say there the people that run the companies it's a 24-hour job really and the fact that they're creating opportunities for people to jump on board and get some great deals and even to be employees is is fantastic it's it's really um what keeps the um, cogs and screws ticking in, in industry and, and the economy. So great to hear that a majority of the respondents this quarter believe their businesses will perform well or very well in the next six months. That's definitely inspiring to hear. Um, how do you think the hiring intentions will be impacted by this? So it was interesting, you know, of those three questions uh, that I mentioned at the start, you know, the first two about how do you just see your business performing? How do you see the sort of the economic climate at the moment? And then the last one being, how do you feel like, will you be bringing on more staff in the next six months? The results for the first two actually remained really similar to the first quarter, but we had a 37% drop in optimism around hiring more people into the organization. And so that was quite interesting. And I mean, that contributed to, you know, the vast majority of the total drop from 100 to 86. I think a big part of this is potentially technology coming in and, and having a role and businesses realizing that they can't just solve some of these problems by simply adding more headcount to their organizations, especially if they're coming under pricing pressure for, you know, the reasons that I spoke about earlier. And so I think in some cases now they're probably figuring out, like, how do we work smarter rather than just layering in more cost in order to do this additional volume. You know, just 
anecdotally in the last six months we've seen you know quite a few businesses sign up to our our application who had sort of previously been on the fence for you know 18 months to two years and in a lot of those cases they were citing that their their customers are just demanding better technology or that they simply have to figure out a way to do things more efficiently to remain competitive so i did wonder if there was you know if, if that was the primary driver behind these these stats that we're seeing there certainly has been a lot of technological developments um, occurring even in the last 18 months. So it's very interesting to see the impacts it's having on industry. Um, we're coming to the end of our discussion now, uh, Vincent, and investors are putting more pressure on businesses to take consideration of their ESG policies. And there were no respondents who believe their operations are very good at following environmentally friendly practices. Well, a majority of the respondents, which was 82%, thought their operations were okay. Now, do you think this has something to do with the Australian Federal Government's um, perhaps indecisiveness on their carbon emissions policy? Do you think this could be what's causing um, businesses to maybe not do as much as they could? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, now, we didn't have data from the first CCLI around this particular question, so we didn't have anything to compare it to. Uh, do people think that they're doing better or do they think that they're doing worse quarter on quarter? Because this, this made up one of the five questions, which is sort of a new question just to get some, some interesting information. Our take is that it's so hard to know what good looks like in this space at the moment. And I think, you know, there's a real lack of clear guidelines on on how you know individuals or businesses can make a meaningful contribution towards you know the reduction of CO2 or just how they can better you know handle waste and these kinds of things. What we found in our data was that 70% of the responders stated that they were implementing paperless technologies um, as sort of the you know the most common way that they felt that they were becoming more environmentally friendly, obviously reducing paper waste. After that, it was followed by people improving the way in which they dispose of waste. So in logistics, you end up with a ton of like, you know, pallet wrapping, which is sort of plastic, almost like glad wrap that you wrap around pallets. Um, you know, you end up with lots and lots of cardboard. And the way in which that stuff is collected and recycled, that, you know, it, it has a big impact on how much of that just ends up in landfill versus actually getting reused. After they had looked at those two, the next largest was that businesses were looking towards route, route optimization as a way in which they could, you know, reduce their their consumption or their their environmental tax. And a big thing there is that if you're, you know, really effectively using a route optimization tool, then the number of miles that your drivers need to go, the amount of fuel that they need to burn, it reduces. Um, and you know, ideally, this wouldn't be an issue. And you know, I'm sad to see. Uh, we got shown all these great Tesla trucks, I think two or three years ago now, and uh, you still can't buy them, right? Um, and I think that whole market is still sort of in its infancy, which is really sad. And we saw that in the data, you know, like only 14% of the businesses that were out polling said that they were look, looking to invest in electric vehicles to help improve their green practices, which was surprising given the hype around them. And I think it's just showing that the, you know, that market is, is sort of taking it's taking more time to come online than what they had expected in the sort of commercial sense. Exactly, exactly. There's, uh, I think there'll be some progress in the next few years. I've heard New South Wales has put out a road map to introduce more electric vehicles and, and some road use incentives. But yes, we definitely are lagging in, in regards to that. But there's been some interesting developments with electric vehicle trucks coming out of Queensland. I think we had someone on the show not long ago. So I guess um, oh, as it becomes more popular, it'll be advertised more, hopefully. Um, thank you yeah, so the, much. The commercials of them are, are going to just revolutionise everything if you don't have to fix trucks, because they're super expensive just to keep running. But you know, at the moment, and if you're running, say, a refrigerated warehouse in summer, and you're trying to either run it at refrigerated or frozen temperatures, even if you've got that whole thing covered in solar, there's no way that you can cover the electricity consumption of the condensers that you need to do it. And um, yeah, it's just it's a it's a real shame because you you continue to have to pull power from the grid, which you know the majority of which is produced by coal. 
Very true. Thank you so much, Vincent, for sharing your insights today. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. And best of luck with your near-term goals with Cart and Cloud as well. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. And if you've just joined us, we had an informative discussion with Mr. Vincent Fletcher, CEO of Cart and Cloud, and the full recorded interview will be available via YouTube at Calkine Media. Please keep watching Calkine for more expert talks, live market updates, and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. Bitcoin has been the star of the cryptocurrency realm with all eyes fixed on the price movements of the internet's favorite coin. The previous year has been exceptional for Bitcoin owing to some major developments impacting its prices. Despite the pandemic wreaking havoc in the financial markets over the year 2020, the cryptocurrency arena has remained largely unaffected, with prices even soaring to unprecedented levels during the year. And Bitcoin has been no stranger to this price rally and has been at the center of it all. In fact, the commotion observed in the crypto space has been mostly about Bitcoin. Over the past one year, the coin's prices have skyrocketed 315%. So your $100 US investment a year ago would be about $415 now. Was this because the previous year was jam-packed with historic events? Well, we know the year 2020 will be remembered for more reasons than just one. However, for Bitcoin, both 2020 and the following year of 2021 have been significant. When the central banks across the globe resorted to lowering interest rates in early last year, Bitcoin was hailed as a safety net against interest-based investments. In fact, many investors turned to Bitcoin as fears of investment losses gripped equity and bond markets. Things shaped up further when institutional investors jumped on the bandwagon as well, solidifying the crypto's reputation as a serious investment option. On top of that, public companies started converting their cash treasuries into cryptocurrencies, adding more credibility to their value. In October of 2020, Bitcoin gained more mainstream attention as PayPal started allowing its customers to trade in the cryptocurrency. Due to its growing acceptance, Bitcoin adapted to a more professional environment and came a long way from its initial dubious stages of being used on the dark web. As if these developments were not enough, US-based automaker Tesla also put in $1.5 billion worth of investment into the cryptocurrency. Only adding to this, Tesla CEO Elon Musk shook the markets with his statements about the possibility of accepting the cryptocurrency as a form of payment. Recently, Bitcoin again made headlines as the Central American country of El Salvador made its legal tender. Though a major price dip followed the announcement, it created a ripple in the market, 
where some countries also expressed their desire to follow El Salvador. Talks about Bitcoin ETFs are also currently in progress. The bottom line is that due to the extreme volatile nature of the cryptocurrency world, countries continue to tread carefully on the decision of making it a legal tender. El Salvador's population has protested the government's move, stating the lack of proper internet facilities for the Bitcoin trade as the reason. Therefore, after an interesting journey over the last year, the question arises on where ongoing trends can take Bitcoin. Even as experts cite high market volatility as a cause for concern, support continues to vouch for the crypto's viability and growing strength. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. And if you like this info, please sub to our channel and hit that bell icon. For regular updates, head over to our website at calcaimedia.com. This has been Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Hello and good morning. Holly Shields here live from Calcai Studio in Sydney and you're watching The Early Trades. A show where we share with you a glimpse of the Australian share market opening trade scene along with the global and domestic drivers triggering a market momentum. Today, Aussie shares have risen at the open but have been weighed down by a heavy loss from Westpac after its cash profit missed expectations. The S&P ASX 200 index was up 0.3% as well. Aussie Bank Westpac was down 5% after its cash profit missed expectations. Global Asset Management Group Janice Henderson was up 5.2%. Meanwhile, energy company Ausnet Services soared 4.1% after accepting an improved $10.2 billion offer from Brookfield. And WiseTech Global was up as well 3.5%. Meanwhile, on the losing side, medical equipment company ResMed was down 5.6%. Coal miner Whitehaven Coal slid 3.5% to 2.52, and St. Barbara lost 2.7 to $1.43. The week ahead is likely to be dominated by central bank meetings, particularly the Reserve Bank, which meets tomorrow in the shadow of last week's rates tantrum. The S&P ASX 200 dived 107.1.44% on Friday as the yield on the 10-year Aussie government bonds blasted through 2% for the first time since March of 2019. The RBA's failure to defend its yield target on the three-year government bond sharpened concerns by the bank, which will announce a change of policy tomorrow. Investors are bracing for the bank to abandon the target, a sign of higher rates which might be coming. They also might be altering their official guidance on the rates outlook as well. And today brings reports on inflation, manufacturing and job advertising. Construction data and building approvals are due on Wednesday. Retail sales and trade data on Thursday and an RBA monetary policy statement on Friday. The AGM session rolls around today with updates from Waypoint REIT, PSC Insurance Group as well. On Wednesday then, we'll have AGMs from Domino's Pizza, Wally's, Seta, Woods Properties. And Thursday from Maya, Zipco, NIB Holdings, Domain, Credit Corp, AMS and downer EDI. Then on Friday, the AGMs will get are from Qantas, Spark New Zealand and Integral Diagnostics. Well, moving on now to the IPOs, it looks like it's been a busy week, which brings us nine new listings, including a couple held from the last week period. Step 1 Clothing was due to list on 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time today. The company sells men's underwear online. Judo Capital at 12.30 p.m. is one of the largest launches this month. The firm provides banking services to small and medium enterprises. Meanwhile, the rest of the week currently looks like this. Adam Resources Rentons Technologies to be listed on Tuesday. Austral Resources C29 Metals to list on Wednesday. 
Hamlin Gold, Vulcan Steel as well on Thursday, and Green Tech Metals on Friday. Now let's have a look at the newsmakers from the morning trade. Well, ASX listed real estate investment trust Charter Hall Social Infrastructure REIT has acquired multiple healthcare and childcare properties for a total of $58.4 million. These acquisitions include a healthcare property in Heidelberg, Victoria, leased to a wholly owned subsidiary of ASX listed Helios. It also includes two premium childcare assets located in the southeast of Queensland. The company also increased its guidance as well. Its financial year 22 forecast distribution has been upped from 16.7% to 16.9%, an increase of 7.6% from the financial year 21. And energy company Osnet Services is set to be acquired by Brookfield after agreeing to the private equity giant's $10.2 billion bid. Brookfield is leading a consortium which includes co-investors Sun Super Superannuation Fund, Alberta Investment Management Corp and the Investment Management Corporation of Ontario plus Healthcare of Ontario Pension Plan. Under the arrangement, Osnet's shareholders will receive 265 a share plus an additional consideration if the scheme has not been implemented by the 31st of March 2022. APA Group was also granted due diligence but will be closed off from the data room until it can lob a superior proposal at Osnet. The Osnet Board of Directors unanimously recommends that shareholders vote in favour of the scheme in the absence of a superior proposal. Singapore Power, which owns a 32.74% stake in Osnet, has said it will be voting in favour of the scheme. And meanwhile, media company Seven West Media has entered into an agreement to acquire Prime Media Group for $121.9 million. The bid represents a 57% premium to Prime Media's close on Friday. The deal is subject to a vote from Prime Media shareholders and is said to be held in December of this year. Prime Media Board has indicated it intends to recommend shareholders to vote in favour of the proposal. Seven West said that major shareholders representing 43.5% of shareholders had indicated their support for the transaction. And on the flip side, Big Four member Westpac has reported a cash profit of $5.35 billion in the 2021 financial year and announced a $3.5 billion off-market buyback. This is following the lead off the other major banks. And while its cash profit fell short of expectations for $5.24 billion, it was twice as much as a year ago. Meanwhile, statutory net profit rose 138% to $5.46 billion and cash EPS firmed up 102% to $1.46. Westpac's net interest margin slid 4 basis points to 2.04%, while its return on equity rose 372 basis points to 7.6%. Its city capital ratio rose 119 basis points to 12.32%, and the bank nearly doubled its final distribution, declaring a final dividend of $0.60 cents compared with its $0.31 cents dividend from a year prior. Westpac has also announced an off-market buyback of up to $3.5 billion of capital. Well, that's all for now on the early morning trains, but stay tuned to Calcine TV because we have many more shows lined up for you today. Holly Shield signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Nicole Sedotti, the founder of Cl Studio Clever. And Studio Clever is a boutique studio specialising in custom website design in Sydney. They focus on user experience design and website optimization strategy to make it easier to run businesses, market the services and win more clients. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates and successful business owners to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Ms. Nicole, Nicole Sedotti, founder of Studio Clever. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Hi Sage, thanks for having me. Well Nicole, it's so great to have you on the show because SEO optimization is so important running an e-commerce especially and there's so many tricks of the trade so it'll be great to have your expert opinion. So how can a strategic design make it easier to run an online business and grow the company at the same time? Well I think most businesses today know that a website is so much more than a glorified business card. Um, when created strategically, your website should be attracting more leads, it should be converting those leads into sales, and it has an enormous potential to reduce the admin burden on the team, whether it's a small team or a big corporate. The ability to reduce admin through using automation technologies on the website is a massive benefit. And thank you for putting that so succinctly for us. Um, you started Studio Clever, formerly named Pop.media, in 2012, is that correct? That is, yes. And since then you've almost worked with a range now. of... I'm, I'm sorry? Sorry, I just said almost 10 years now, yeah. Absolutely, yes. And you've, ranged with a wor uh, sorry, you've worked with a range of companies from tiny startups to associations, scaling businesses like Ola Cabs, Australia and New Zealand, all the way up to corporates such as Optiva, Allianz and News Corp as well. So Nicole, in this journey, what are the key things that you've learned and implemented while strategizing custom websites for your current clientele? So the key thing really is that everything needs a solid foundation. Um, it's all about what the client wants, what the business is trying to achieve. So I think that's one area where a lot of websites that you might see on the internet are missing the mark. Uh, they, they aren't achieving anything for anybody and when you sort of turn up on there it's not even as a user it's not letting you get where you want to go. So if we're looking at everything with a really solid foundation about what the business is trying to achieve, what they're trying to communicate to their clients and customers, then you're in a really good position to move forward. And one of the best benefits really of a really strategic online presence is the ability to react to market change. So a good example is during COVID, any business that was already well set up online was able to completely mitigate the risk of having to make that pivot. Great. So understanding your business thoroughly is the first step towards designing a successful website. Okay, and that takes a lot more work than it sounds actually to actually really dot those I's and cross those T's. However, new challenges arise um, as the market changes and businesses need to pivot and rebrand, as you just mentioned with the COVID scenario. So how in those um, cases where the market changes and businesses have to adapt quickly, how does a business continue to deliver optimum results in your opinion? So the key is, of course, understanding the business is, is crucial. But more than that, it's about really understanding the numbers. So every business knows that from a financial standpoint, they need to know their numbers. But that really comes all the way back to the design and marketing of the business website. And if your design and marketing metrics can be plugged in to the business metrics in other areas and your actual financial goals and results, then you're in a really good position to move forward, to pivot without too much stress, um, essentially quantify everything and you're in a really good position to grow and react to change. That sounds that sounds fantastic. I mean, it sounds like it's, it's easy to achieve if you know what you're doing. 
But I guess it must be frustrating for those small businesses out there who are trying to do it themselves and they've got all the keywords right and they're using the high volume keywords and yet they can't get on that first page in a Google search. In your expert opinion, how can companies of different scales grow their businesses confidently and organically in this ever-changing world? I think startups and small businesses actually have an incredible advantage in this area because the, of the large corporates I've worked with in bigger enterprise organisations, they have so much existing infrastructure that it can be really, really hard to make digital change. But if you're starting from a blank page, you can set up all of your systems to help you out. And beyond just the keywords, the benefit of your website is being able to start that conversation with your potential clients and customers really early in the piece so they can get to know you online and you can be really building your authority as the expert in your area. And then they come in and they'll buy from you because they know you, they like you, they trust you. Okay, so you were saying that knowing who your audience is is really important as well and you've got to attract their attention, capture their interest and then hopefully make them want you, make them desire you. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. I wonder what sort of tactics that businesses would um, deploy or employ to make that happen. Um, do you have any insights to share on that? <laughs> I do. So one of the main tactics I always advise businesses to get on with is, is blogging and it actually it can be terrifying to a lot of businesses to start writing. But writing a blog post has an enormous advantage where you can be having a conversation with your client about your expertise. You can be talking about how you can solve their problem. You can be starting to educate about what their problem actually is. And a lot of clients out there, so so for small businesses, their clients mightn't even know the full extent of the problem that can be solved yet. So your website and every single article that you write is an excellent opportunity to fully explore what the problem is and let the audience know why it is that they need you to solve it. And that can help massively with your keywords as well, of course. Great, okay, so you just need to instill that confidence in your audience that you are authentic in your mission to, to help provide solutions. Great, thank you for that. Um, we're reaching the end of the discussion um, right now. So lastly, what new revolutions can you forecast for your industry and digital workflows in the years to come? Well, I think automation is already massive, but businesses are getting better and better at understanding how they can leverage automation technology and how they can use it to their advantage. Um, I see a lot of businesses who are maybe using little bits of automation here and there, but the key areas where everyone should be really having a go is things like online appointment bookings, um, productizing services so that things can be automatically paid for online. And all of that comes together, as well as email nurturing, of course, setting up welcome email series and all of those sorts of things can really help to give you a well-rounded, automated process that guides your customer, supports your customer without you even needing to be involved. So it, it's a huge load off your, your admin workload, as well as looking after a customer better. Um, another thing that I think is, is definitely huge and will continue to grow is artificial intelligence. Um, AI obviously won't overtake entire workflows anytime soon, but it can be used for smaller tasks. So one area a lot of my clients are using it for at the moment is actually copywriting. There are some really great copywriting tools out there. Now, what I'd say is you still obviously, you need to be a good writer to use these well because Google penalizes um, spammy content or content that's not really authoritative. So if you're writing quality content, then you're going to win. But one way to make writing that content faster is by really utilizing AI and it can just speed up your process massively. So there'll be small tasks throughout a workflow that can be benefited from the use of AI and every workflow should be using automation at every single point that it possibly can to streamline, systematize and make life easier. That's great. Thank you so much. So if a company was to come to you and they've been using an online um, provider of SEO um, tools and they say, here's what I've been doing, 
how can you help me? I can't make sense of it. Are you able to take over from there? Is it an easy transition over to your services? Well, the first thing I ever do with any client is go through what they're doing now and have a look at what, what they want to achieve. So everything starts with those foundations. So we need to look at where they want to go, how they can be helped. And I actually, I have a, a day service, that a clever day where I help a lot of clients just sort through a lot of the systems, whether it's the website, whether it's SEO, all sorts of things, and we'll get to the bottom of everything and clean it up. Sounds magic, because some of it seems straight, straightforward, like the keywords, for example, but then there's also other things with backlinks and meta tags that seem like you need a little bit more insight into um, web development to really work that part out. Do you know of any yeah, good and tools And understanding online? audiences, I think, and, um, mm -hmm. and where people are in the flow of their, their journey, the customer journey. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It just seems the more you know, the more you know you don't know. It's just a rabbit hole and it keeps opening up. It's so interesting. Well, thank you for sharing your insights today. I really do appreciate your time, Nicole. Was there any final words you'd like to share before we close off the discussion? Uh, I think just good luck to everybody out there having a go online. Building an online business is very rewarding and you have a lot of potential for growth, so go get it. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. It's been appreciated. Thank you, Sage. And if you've just joined us, we had a very informative discussion with Ms. Nicole Sedotti, who is the founder of Studio Clever. And you can watch the full recording via YouTube at Calkine Media. Please keep watching for more expert talks, live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised at InvestWise with Calkine. Morning pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. If you're a stock market enthusiast, you very well know why it's imperative for investors to have strategies up their sleeve to eke out maximum gains. Generally, investors and traders resort to strategies which are followed most commonly. However, there are several overlooked stock market investment strategies that can come up with relatively high gains and less risks. With that said, let's shed some light on five under the radar strategies. But before we get into it, please give our channel a sub and hit that bell icon to stay ahead of the game. First up is covered call options. A call option is a contract option that allows an investor to purchase a security at a strike price until the option expires. On the other hand, a put option allows buyers to sell a security at a particular price until the option reaches expiry. A covered call option is written when an investor is already in possession of a security and is used to boost income and provide some downside protection. Next is relative strength. There are always some stocks in the market that are trending higher even as the overall market is selling off. These shares perform well relative to the market as a whole or to relevant benchmarks. 
technical analysts employ an indicator termed as the Relative Strength Index, or RSI, to generate overbought or oversold signals. Following the relative strength is the end of day trading strategy. The end of day trading strategy is all about trading near the market closing. The strategy involves studying of price action in comparison to previous day's price movements to speculate how the price could move and decide on any indications being employed in the system. However, traders must fix a limit order, a stop loss order and a take profit order to cut down any overnight risk. The fourth strategy to keep in mind is scalping. Scalping is about cashing in on small price changes and making a fast profit of reselling. Scalpers seek to scalp a small profit from each trade with the aim to accumulate those little gains into a significant size. However, this strategy should not be used without a strict exit strategy. And lastly, dollar cost averaging. Under this, you can purchase shares irrespective of price and end up buying shares at a low price when the market is bearish. Then the time proceeds, your cost will average down. So what's the bottom line? Well, investors and traders should always keep in mind that there is no silver bullet strategy or fixed term pattern for maximizing their profits from stock markets. There are some overlooked but sound investment strategies which could also deliver sound results. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other info to boost your financial IQ. And if you like this, please give us a like, share and a comment as well as a sub. This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Welcome to Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Robert Russell, founder of Truckit.net, Australia's leading freight marketplace, which offers listings for freight jobs with access to a vast network of transport providers, and you'll sure find someone for your job. Truckit.net is an Australian company with an easy-to-use online marketplace to receive competitive quotes. So keep watching till the end to find out more. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and bringing you live today. We have Mr. Robert Russell, founder of CEO Truckit.net. Welcome to the show, Robert. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sage. So, Robert, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. You've had quite an impressive journey from the international rugby circuit to now running an innovative digital marketplace for freight. Could you share your journey with us, please? Yeah, I, I guess it all, well, it all started here in, I'm based in Brisbane, and um, before I, I guess my rugby career played a bit of a part in it, we, I moved over to, uh, to Scotland to play to play, in, uh, to play a professional rugby, which led on to an international career. And I think as a rugby player, you get a bit of spare time. So uh, throughout that process, I started looking into um, what would be life after rugby. And, and I think it was e-commerce that really, um, I'd done a Bachelor of Business or Commerce back here in Brisbane. And, and um, I, I really saw the opportunity in the online world and started a business over there. Uh, and on exiting that business and coming back to Australia in 2012, it was during my time over there that I, I really saw the um, opportunity, I guess, in, in online tech and, and marketplaces. Um, you know, marketplaces have become a big part of uh, the online space and, and our lives, I think, um, yeah, for everyone. So it was sort of, yeah, international rugby through to, to, to now um, running a, yeah, truck it, which is Australia's largest freight marketplace. That's fantastic. A very inspirational story because not everyone has the foresight to think that way. So congratulations. And here we are today interviewing you on Expert Talks. Well, established in 2012, Truckett's digital marketplace matches people wishing to freight large items with transport operators. Um, who do you tend to find are your main clients? Do they tend to come from one industry or veer towards domestic or international freight? And do you count yourself as somewhat of a watchdog for consumers? 
Yeah, look, you know, as, as you said, we're a, we're a marketplace. We're here to match, um, you know, freight consumers of, of all, uh, you know, both personal and business. So we, we have uh, customers or clients, you know, in the business space, we've got large corporates, um, we've got mining and resources companies, we've got, you know, large retailers, right down to the, the mum and, and dad businesses. And on the personal side, we've got a lot of um, personal freight being done, I suppose, with, um, you know, the increase in online shopping. There's a lot of people that buy off places such as Grays Online. Um, we have a great partnership with Grays Online. And, you know, they're, they're buying things such as, you know, could be vehicles, motor vehicles, cars, jet skis, uh, furniture, anything like that. And, and we're really here to help them move it. So um, we do, um, I guess, yeah, absolutely. I, we, we consider ourselves a bit of a watchdog. I mean, we're a very transparent marketplace with the, um, you know, everyone can see what's going on. So it's the, you know, free market forces of supply and demand that, that really, um, you, you know, that really run the, the marketplace, I guess. And, and I guess in a sense, it's a, it's a watchdog for everyone. So, you know, it's, it's mostly down to, to sort of spot market um, or spot prices rather than contracted rates. So when someone's got that harder to move item or something they don't have a contract in place for, um, yeah, they use truck it. Sounds great. So do you find, you mentioned there, the supply and demand um, of the free market tends to uh, balance out the more expensive um, providers to, and to the cheaper ones that offer more economical rates? Do you think it sort of balances out or do the more expensive ones actually offer a better service? Yeah, no, we, we see all that. I mean, um, absolutely. We, we've a lot of customers are users for exactly that reason. They, you know, they, they're, the rates they might get or they don't know where to start, who to go to, and especially if they've got a, a rate with a network carrier or someone that, and it's going to a place that they're not regularly using, they probably don't have that sort of volume discount. So um, we see, you know, price differentials, you know, you know, is, is a huge range. Um, and we hear that from our customers all the time. So it's exactly that reason that they use us. And, um, yeah, that's been a, it's been a great asset of the business, I suppose, being able to do that. And, you know, just back on the, on the provider side, we, we've got providers who are, you know, tier one uh, carriers right down to, again, the owner operators um, doing business, but they all um, competing for the work. And um, I think free markets, as I said before, they, they have a balancing effect. So, um, the, you know, the customers looked after. Well, I think your service definitely provides plenty of advantages for both the providers and the customers. It sounds great. It makes it so easy all in one place and they can just pick and choose what they want. That sounds fantastic. Um, in September, truck users posted more than 17,000 freight jobs on the marketplace. And this is a 65% increase on the June uh, figures, which was 60% on the same month last year. So what do you think is driving this growth? Is there a fee for using your service? Yeah, well, in terms of driving the growth, I mean, obviously the, the COVID effect has certainly played a part. Um, you know, it's forced people to do a lot more stuff online, which has been great for the business. But I think ultimately, um, you know, the, the scale of business is now, we really see sort of network effects taking hold. You know, we've got great liquidity in the marketplace. We've got a lot of We've got over 6,000 transport providers that use us and we've, um, we've had over 400,000 customers. So there is really good liquidity and um, I think that's really starting to show the way now. I mean, even with COVID restrictions um, you know, easing, we don't expect um, it to change. You know, people's you know, user behaviours have, uh, I'd say, have learnt to trust and use marketplaces such as Trucket. And we'll, we uh, you know, believe that that will continue. So. Um, I think it's you know it's a it's a very bright future, and I think that's that's the main reason for you know the growth that we've seen um, you know between uh, this time last year and now. Yeah, fantastic. And this is a little bit off the main discussion, but just wondering, uh, search engine optimization is vital um, in e-commerce. Um, do you think your e-commerce strategy has helped put you in the forefront of the industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, digital marketing is is paramount to what we do. We've got some great um, agencies that help look after us, and we've got great staff that really run all those marketing campaigns. And SEO, search engine optimization, is a is a is a big part of what we do. 
um, just as other paid forms of, of marketing as well. So it is, you know, it's, it's critical to get that part right and we're, we're very fortunate to have um, great people in those positions to, to, to ensure that we're getting great results. Fantastic. Thanks very much for sharing your insights. So um, another side of things that's a little bit grey is how are freight fees decided upon generally? Does it vary from company to company or is there a standard overall? Um, how do the fuel levy and road vehicle operating costs come into play, please? Yeah, well, those things, obviously, as, as they increase, they, they play a part in the, in the pricing. Um, but just to be clear, we, we don't actually set the pricing. We're not um, the likes of, we're not Uber who, who, who name the price. We let our providers, our transport providers, name their price. So, um, you know, they factor all those things in when they're, when they're doing that. Some people have rate tables and they get adjusted. But yeah, we, we see it's a, it's a bit of a, a topic, I suppose, at the moment. Those, those mm. increasing costs are, are driving the prices up. They certainly are. They're making it quite tricky for certain industries, depending if you're in table grapes or wine or some of the commodities at the moment. It's uh, getting quite expensive. Uh, and shipping costs have surged, with many expecting inflation to hit record levels due to this. Uh, what are your thoughts on the subject for the near future and your near-term goals for truckit.net, please? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, inflation's... Inflation is just part of life, as I see it. Um, you know, it, it's there will be inflationary things that happen, and certainly in this industry, I believe. But it, you know, it's not going to change um, the opportunities we have uh, or the goals we have. I mean, I think it's a great time, it's a great opportunity for for transport providers at the moment, and um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people coming into the market. It has um, struggled a bit with the uh, the last few months with some of the more restricted lockdowns we've seen, but. Um, Right now, we're seeing a lot come back in, and um, yeah, it's a busy space. And you know, yeah, I think it's got a, a, a very bright future for, for for the transport providers who want to get involved in the industry. And obviously, consumers are using it, are using us more and more, and they're using on you know um, digital means to, to move their goods. So yeah, so it's um, we've got a yeah a very optimistic future. Yes, well, the industry's been great for creating jobs over the downturn, that's for sure. It's been giving a lot of people a chance to keep, um, keep the roof over their heads working in deliveries and logistics, so that's, that's been fantastic. Well, we have to start winding up the discussion. Was there anything you'd like to share with the viewers before we close up today? Uh, no, nothing other than that. I think it's... Um yeah, like I, I think I've, hopefully I've given a, them a good rundown of um, what the business is, and if they if they'd like to know more, yeah, go to truckit.net, and um, we've got a you know we pride ourselves on great customer support. Um, that's been a key focus for us for a long time. So if we can help anyone out, we 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 have phone support, and um, yeah, only too happy to help anyone. Thanks so much for sharing your time today, Robert. We really do appreciate your insights. Thanks very much, Sage. And for those who've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Robert Russell, CEO, founder of truckit.net. Please watch the full recording on YouTube via Calkine Media and keep watching for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV.
let's talk about crypto exchanges, Binance versus Kraken and see how they differ. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. The global crypto market has been fast evolving with technological innovation and investment. And as the industry continues to expand, new crypto coins are entering the market at a rapid pace. Similarly, crypto exchanges are upgrading their platforms to keep up with demand. New opportunities and high returns are drawing more investors into the industry. 2021 has been significant as it saw the market touching 2 trillion US dollars in August for the first time. Crypto exchanges Binance and Kraken have been in investors' limelights. So let's look at the two exchanges and understand their unique features. Kraken is a US-based global cryptocurrency exchange founded back in 2011. It offers crypto trading, staking and services to individual customers and institutions globally. The firm offers three major platforms for trading, the Kraken Mobile app, Kraken Pro Mobile app and the Kraken Futures app. Currently, over 80 cryptocurrencies can be traded in the exchange. In addition, it provides a wide range of options for individual traders for personal crypto investment accounts. However, Kraken crypto apps are not available for New York and Washington residents. For the funding accounts, Kraken lets its users pay through fiat currencies or cryptocurrencies. It also provides margin accounts and futures trading and over-the-counter trading through its platform. Kraken provides rewards to passive traders for staking cryptos and fiat currencies, and it doesn't have a wallet. Binance is a leading crypto exchange founded by Changpeng Zhao in 2017. It's registered in the Cayman Islands. The company has high-frequency trading software. Besides crypto trading, Binance provides a range of services for individual traders and institutions, which includes futures trading, margin trading, NFT services, and also Binance Academy. That's an educational resource for beginners. However, unlike Kraken, Binance offers more cryptocurrencies for trading. A primary reason for its popularity among traders looking for more coin and token variety to trade. Its trading services include peer-to-peer -peer transactions, a classic Binance trading interface, an advanced trading platform and an over-the-counter trading portal. However, those living in the US do not have access to the main Binance platform but they can use the country-specific platform. Although the US platform offers fewer assets than its original platform, it still provides various features for individuals and institutions. Binance also offers crypto loans. Big traders can use its Visa cards for purchasing items globally. The global crypto market is currently worth around 1.9 trillion US dollars. Both Binance and Kraken exchanges have caught traders' attention due to their unique and innovative features. For instance, their easy-to-use interface and trading platforms are drawing in new users. However, traders should evaluate the companies and the crypto assets carefully before investing in them. Now, if you like this video, please press the like button and share, and you can also make comments. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. For more information, log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Damien Dow. Damien is the co-founder and CEO of Active Place. That's a specialized social platform bringing people together to embrace their health and wellness. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. A very warm welcome to you today, Damien. Hello, thanks very much. Now, I'm very interested to hear more about this. You're obviously very passionate about health and wellness. What can you tell me about Active Place and how can it help people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Active Place, you know, our vision is to grow a world of healthier, more active people. Uh, the platform itself is a social marketplace, which is the first for the health and fitness category. And what we do is we provide a online home <coughs> for, for businesses to find and connect to people that are living a healthy and active lifestyle. Fabulous. Now, as you mentioned, there is one of the world's first only health and fitness social marketplaces. What is Active Place's mission and vision? Absolutely. Well, our vision is to, to grow a, health, a world of healthier, more active people. And we do that by bringing uh, people and businesses together in the one place. At the moment, what we're finding is <clears throat> there's no home for someone's active life online. You have Facebook for your friends and family. You have LinkedIn for your business and your profession. But you get to have anything online for your health and fitness. And for us, it's about bringing that together and bringing a destination uh, and a home for both businesses and, and users on, online. Now, we can all be very distracted in everyday life. How does Active Place help to motivate people to stay active and healthy? Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> we know that um, you know, people on, on or technology, and it's, it's been a huge part of health and fitness and it's growing considerably online at the moment in health and fitness and what's going on with the global health crisis. <clears throat> we're seeing that 10 out of every 11 minutes that people spend on their mobile are in an app. So for us, it was really important, firstly, that Active Place was an app-first product, which it is. And for us, it's about centralising uh, that component so someone can come to there as a destination to find active things to do, like events and experiences. They can find a like-minded community. Uh, they can be inspired and they can find experts to help them achieve their goals in, in their health and fitness world as well. Um, so for us, it's about bringing that together and, and creating that emotive, um, that, that emotive, tangible component so someone will keep coming back. And what was the motive behind this launch? What inspired you to launch this company? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's an idea I, I've had for, for a while. Um, I've been a, an athlete, uh, an endurance athlete for quite a while and um, unfortunately I had a, um, a, an injury, a hip replacement which took me out of the sport and for me I had to start looking around uh, at new places or new ways to be active and um, you know, I had to reinvent myself and how I stay healthy and fit and when I started looking out there I realised that it was a real mess. There was um, a lot of information, um, heavy fragmentation a lot, across a lot of platforms and uh, you didn't know what to trust. And for me, I needed to find a solution um, for my active life. And, and that's really where the idea started to come from, was my own pain points, my own um, personal problems in this area. Well, that's magnificent that you are now able to help people. You mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic earlier, and that's obviously meant many people have had to work from home. What have been the key lifestyle changes that you've experienced that people have had to adapt to? Yeah, you look, what we've seen is absolutely a, a huge take up with technology. Um, you know, just in Q1 of 2020 alone, there was over 600 million downloads of health and fitness apps globally, you know, which is considerable. So everyone's turning to a virtual experience now for their health and fitness. Um, and di in addition to that, we're also seeing people's awareness of their health and fitness now being something that they're taking a lot more seriously. And that's just accelerating the, the increase of technology in this category. And finally, we're seeing people have a lot more time now at home and uh, they have the time to go out there and be active and uh, to do something uh, that they, they love to do outdoors. Um, and that's, the, that's really the three trends we're seeing at the moment. 
And what do you feel is the most popular trend for an activity at the moment? Is there something that really stands out that males and females want to get their hands on? Yeah, I think, I think again, with um, the global health crisis, it, it's caused um, a lot of challenges and a lot of these um, active things people do outside are, are typically traditional services uh, that are offline. Uh, they're things like, you know, uh, participating in a running or cycling event or triathlon event, swimming event. They're, they're going out and experiencing tours and experiences across the world and locally. Um, and they're even seeing going to see your, your professional practitioner um, as well. And all these things that were typically offline um, have had the trouble now that they need to be coming online. And, and that's where we come in and help. And what we've really seen is some very strong trends across active programs. So people are participating or, or downloading virtual programs, be it a yoga program, a Pilates program, a fitness program, um, a meditation area. So that's what we're seeing a lot of people coming in and, and sort of doing these things they can do at home. They're quick, they're easy, and they can you know, they do them uh, inside in their lounge room. So with the virtual world mentioned there, what do you believe is the future for health and fitness business after the global health crisis? And, and how can Active Place help there? Yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, technology is really escalating into this category. Um, we're seeing a lot of those traditional services, as I mentioned, um, a little bit flat-footed at the moment, uh, not quite knowing what to do and where to go um, and having the answers to where, where uh, they need to continue to run their business. And that's where we really, really see that support to come in, where Active Place is that, that uh, social marketplace that enables business SaaS tools and business services so they can now bring their full business online, not just delivery or one component from end to end now. We provide a solution where businesses can come in, they can find a customer, grow and retain a community, uh, they can build their brand, and then they can obviously execute commercial outcomes uh, with their products on our platform as well. And for us, it's about facilitating an opportunity for these businesses to have a great offline and online solution for their customers. So, you know, their, their future viability and their future success uh, for them to prosper, uh, to prosper is, is real and, and can continue to happen. And Damien, you recently published an e-book for small to medium-sized businesses in health and fitness. What are the key takeaways from this book and why should business leaders read this? Yeah, yeah, we, look, that's, uh, that's a free piece of content that we've got out there. It's a, it's a series of e-books that we'll be publishing to help businesses, particularly in these times of, of need and a lot of uncertainty about what to do and where to go and how to find a customer and, you know, what is the, this new world you know, look like and how, and how do I need to manage my business in it. And so for us, it's about giving back a little bit more to the community and, and more importantly, making sure that we, we help businesses into the future uh, to ensure they prosper, and as I said, survive in this new world we're all living in now. Absolutely. Well, let's hope you do bring more health and wellness into the world. It was fantastic chatting with you today, Damien. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thanks for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the Crypto Buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. everyone great to have your company here on Calkine TV I'm Rachel and you're watching the buzzing trends and the main stock in the limelight today is Westpac 
that says the bank announced a $3.5 billion buyback. Others in the big four ASX Bank Group, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, the National Australia Bank and the Australian New Zealand Banking Group have announced their respective buybacks. Shares of Westpac are currently trading at $24.26. The buyback will be carried out via an off-market tender process which will be open on the 17th of November and close on the 17th of December. Under the buyback offer, shareholders can sell their shares at specified discounts to the market price of between 8% to 14% inclusive and or as a final price application. The buyback is actually smaller than what the market expected it to be. The bank said the capital component will be $11.34 per share. The dividend component will be the buyback price less the capital component. Commenting on the share buyback, Westpac chairman John McFarlane says, our improved operating performance and positive progress on our strategic priorities, including the completion of a number of divestments, have strengthened capital and allowed them to announce this buyback. It appears that the bank is in the early stages of restructuring that should help the bank correct its previous problems. Meanwhile, Westpac also announced its earnings with a full year 2021, and the bank reported a cash profit of $5.35 billion during that period. Even as the bank's cash profit fell short of expectations for $5.42 billion, it was twice as much as a year ago. Westpac reported a cash profit of $5.35 billion in financial year 2021. Now here are some highlights of the full year results. Statutory net profit was up 138% year on year to $5.4 billion and cash earnings rose 105% to $5.3 billion. Cash earnings per share rose 102%. So 146 cents and net interest margin was down at four basis points to 2.04 percent. Return on equity was up 372 basis points to 7.6 percent. And CT1 at capital ratio was up 119 basis points to 12.32 percent. Westpac CEO Peter King says he's pleased with the progress they're making to transform Westpac into a simpler, stronger bank. Credit quality has remained remarkably good with stressed exposure to continuing to decline off last year's peak, while mortgage 90-plus day delinquencies were also significantly lower. Here's a closer look at Westpac's dividend. Now, the bank almost doubled its final dividend at 60 cents, as against 31 cents a year ago. Meanwhile, the bank seems to be cautiously optimistic on the future and expects the Australian economy to rebound over the next 12 months. Well, that's all for now. We'll be back very soon with our Buzzing Trend show to share the latest market insights with you. Till then, stay tuned to Tecalkine TV for more stock, business and economy-related hot trends. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Tim Gray. Tim is the founder of Profit Systems. They provide supply chain software to manufacturers with highly complicated supply chain processes. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. 
Hi, Tim. Welcome to Calkine. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Good to speak with you today. Now, firstly, Tim, can you tell us a little bit more about Profit Systems and where the inspiration for the company came from? Certainly. Uh, about 20 years ago, I started, I uh, was doing rapid employment and improvement for my clients in the areas of supply chain. And we kept falling over the reality that most businesses, most manufacturing companies, IT departments were heading towards standardized systems and, and uh, standard installs of SAP and Oracle and so on. And it made them very unresponsive to the changing needs of, of the business and to deliver rapid improvement. We needed to have tools that could show us where opportunities existed in the supply chain. And uh, initially we started building Excel spreadsheets and found they weren't robust enough. So we put the thinking cap on and started building the profit suite. And today that's uh, our, our lead and most of our work comes from uh, deploying systems and, and consulting around integrating the supply chain planning tools into businesses, ARP systems and their businesses. Now, in your experience, how do you believe that people can disaster-proof their businesses? It's a very topical uh, terminology you use. The, the uh, last 18 months has shown more disruption in most supply chains around the world than, than many of us have seen for the rest of our careers. Um, some of the most important things to do, I, I like to use the term of synchronising. We, we have to synchronise uh, our, our demand signals are our best understanding of what our customers might want. All the way through uh, our supply planning, our capacity and resource planning, our transport planning, and our purchasing and procurement. And they sound fairly obvious things to do, but uh, uncommonly rare to see in, in most businesses. So really getting alignment through the business. Um, and, and what's interesting too is there's been an enormous push to improve forecasting because I think it's very obvious to everybody in the boardroom that what happened last year is unlikely to happen again this year and certainly what was happening two years ago is no indicator at all to, to how this year is unfolding and uh, it's really interesting that we are seeing a lot of examples of businesses getting focused on forecasting but then waiting for the forecasting to deliver results and one of the most profound messages I have for my clients is don't don't wait, absolutely set up and improve your forecasting. But having a process to forecast and having a forecast is one thing, then using it in with all its errors and all its assumptions, just share that with the rest of the business. Having one set of numbers is powerfully liberating for a business uh, and, and is often missed. And that really helps businesses start future proofing. Having a forecast, not enough, but having uh, sharing that and sh particularly sharing things like knowing where your forecast is poor, and sharing that information as well is uh, uncommon, but incredibly powerful once it's done. Absolutely. And, and on that note, what do you believe in your opinion could be the reason for failing to deliver optimum results, despite some businesses investing millions of dollars? It's a great question. Many, many businesses uh, invest heavily in their ARP systems, and it's very um, e easy at, at the board level to presume that if we buy SAP, and I'm not beating up on SAP, but if we buy SAP or if we buy Oracle, it's set on the brochure that we can do all things. So surely we should do it all in, in, in our ERP system. But when it comes to planning, running your business, uh, running your planning through your ERP system is a little bit like driving a car, uh, looking in the rear vision mirror. The reason I say that is uh, your ERP systems are perfect at telling you when an order was received, when the stock was picked, when the, when the product was manufactured, uh, when it was dispatched from the warehouse, when the quality texts were done and when the invoice was paid. The, the, and these are all essential and they're absolutely essential parts of the business. But the commonality with that is that they've all happened. And so there's no longer any doubt about those particular actions. And ERPs are necessary for telling us what's happened and tracking our immediate execution. But they're not sufficient when it comes to planning. When we plan, we need to be able to see forward. In the, using the current analogy, we've got to be able to look forward through the windscreen, see what's coming, see vehicles that are getting in a lane or potholes and so on. So for me, when I'm planning, I don't just want the rear vision mirror, I want all the windscreen, I want a heads up display, I want the Google Navigator. I want to have the whole gambit of forward detection systems that can tell me what's going on ahead and so I can navigate before I get into trouble. Um, and, and you know, a lot of people often say to us when they're, when they're early on the journey of working with us that, 
the ERP systems, surely they must be sufficient. You know, they said on the brochure they could do this. Um, the best indicator you have that they're falling short is that almost everybody that has these systems will end up planning in Excel. And Excel is a great prototyping tool, but they, they're there and it's available to everybody in the business, but they're not robust, they're not sufficient, they're not scalable. So the the reality is we need to have businesses, when we're planning for business, we need to be able to see things like what happens if the FX changes, what happens if my ship misses a delay or container price goes up another 50%, I hope that doesn't happen, but we've seen crazy, uh, crazy uh, responses around the world at the moment. And once, once we have various scenarios, we need to be able to run them to ground and see what are the impacts on, on our resources, on our share prices, on our, on our raw material procurement, on our, uh, on our footprints, on our, on our crew working hours and conditions and so on. And once we've run those to ground, we've worked through the various scenarios, then we can choose as a management team, which of those we're going to execute to, and then we push that back into the ARP system. But ARP systems are not designed for doing that kind of what if scenario. They're designed to track what's happened and they advertise having other features, but they're all kind of con constrained by this need to be able to report and record and what's actually happened. And what is the most crucial aspect to be taken care of while working on supply chain management so that it does turn out to be a game changer for businesses? Yeah, we've seen really good evidence, particularly over the disruption of the last 18 months of businesses absolutely going gangbusters and still being able to navigate the many disruptions that they've had. Uh, and, and the key elements uh, run to that point I made earlier about synchronization. They need to have a, a forecast and forecast fast, but they can't get stuck at that forecasting level waiting for the forecast to solve all the answers. They then need to run that forecast in, into integrated business planning or sales and operations planning processes so they can see what resources they need where, what crew they need where, how much and which customers they're going to satisfy, and if they're constrained, you know, who are they going to let down and make these tactical decisions with knowledge and foresight and then um, e execute that uh, and, and keep tracking that. The, the key here in such a time of disruption is not to have one plan and just go blindly to that. It's to, to frequently reassess that. And a little bit like in a yacht race where you tack, you know, in, into the wind, um, it doesn't matter that you're not right on course. It matters that everyone's pulling in the same direction. And as long as your business is synchronised, uh, and, and you regularly review these assumptions and the plans, you'll do very, very well. Uh, and, and that's the key where we're seeing our, our business and our clients and customers that are really excelling have really embraced that synchronization, make sure their organization is nimble and agile, as opposed to those businesses that are struggling or just focusing on forecasting um, or, or still in the chaos land of leaving every silo to, to work on their own. It's definitely be about having a different set of eyes on things, isn't it? So, so Tim, in your experience, what's the key to shifting decision making from a business being reactive to them being agile and opportunistic? Yeah, it's interesting to me. That's really at the gets to the heart of why anybody would invest or should be investing in business software. Um, in my mind, you want to be making faster, more informed decisions. If your organisation isn't able to do that, then I, credit, then I question why would you spend money on any any system? Um, and I'll put that in in the context of if in the if where you're planning, if you can't see what my customers might need tomorrow or outside of the order horizon, I, I'm left with no choice but we call it hopium. I'm left with no choice but looking at last year and I'm trying to apply some instinct about what materials I might purchase or what materials I might need to to, to make uh, and. Uh, and where I might put in my, my supply network and hope that it's somewhere near where a customer finally consumes it. Um, if, however, if I have a, a forecast and a supply plan and I, and I can see what the consequences of our expected requirements are, we're now planning to serve. And so we've got a, a clearer picture and we can make decisions around which customers to serve if we don't have enough, how am I going to do a fair share allocation? But the, the highest level of uh, of decision making comes if we can show the cost to serve while we're planning um, so that everyone in the supply chain can see well when we serve this customer it costs $1.50 a pallet to move but when we're serving this customer it's costing $5 a pallet what's different and it actually elevates the decision making process and starts driving this innovation that we stop just thinking about supply and we start thinking about supply at the best possible cost and that's an enormous transition from the poor, 
for people that were working in the hoping phase where they're just relying on, on their instinct and what's happened in the past to guess what's happening in the future. We're now talking about um, having plans and having the right information to make the best decisions at the time. In my opinion, organisations should be demanding that every, every decision point in their supply chain should be supported by having the cost and consequences of each decision choice that they've got. So they can make, if we're going to try and source material from Thailand, um, because uh, you know, I don't know, Singapore is not available, or, or South Africa mills have gone offline, or whatever the, the the contrast is. We need to see what those cost, what the shipping lanes mean, how how much extra whip we're going to carry. Um, you know, are they are they approved suppliers, and if not, how long will it take? All this information must be readily available so we can make informed decisions. What happens in the chaos realm is that we're we're responding with just thumb in the air and and trying to anticipate with instinct rather than with information, and it slows the whole process down, and we, we end up not working synchronisation. Well, it's definitely been a disruptive few years for many businesses. It's great to know that there are companies like Profit Systems out there. Thanks so much for your time today, Tim. My pleasure. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Chinese property development company Evergrande is on the brink of collapse, and its fall could have serious ramifications for cryptocurrency as evidenced by recent impacts to Bitcoin. On the 21st of September, the price of Bitcoin dropped by as much as 11%, kicking out the week on a negative note. On Wednesday, September 22, Bitcoin was trading at 42,137 US dollars and 60 cents as of 1:10 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. The price of Bitcoin has fluctuated over the last month immensely, with the highest price being just under 53,000 US dollars, but also experiencing a dip down to 39,787 US dollars and 61 cents. Other major cryptos such as Ether, Cardano and Litecoin have also been experiencing dips and as of the 21st of September we're still experiencing a downward trend. Let's take a look though at exactly why Bitcoin declined. With a maximum circulation of 21 million coins and an enormous market cap, many have argued that in crypto terms Bitcoin is somewhat of a safe haven. Consumers understand that Bitcoin's price typically falls in tandem with the price of other risky assets. September has been an even more volatile month than usual for crypto and Bitcoin in particular. The most recent crash occurred merely days after a string of reports demonstrating the currency's durability. For instance, El Salvador now possesses the world's third largest network of cryptocurrency ATMs bringing the total number of Central American crypto ATMs up to 70% coverage. However, because it is a decentralized system, it can often be challenging to identify the specific route of a crypto market crash. 
The price swings this time around are thought to be tied to China's real estate sector, notably the Chinese enterprise Evergrande Group. With nearly 300 billion US dollars in liabilities, Evergrande is the world's most indebted real estate firm, and markets throughout the world have plummeted in concern that China may permit Evergrande to default on its debts. So what impact could Evergrande's potential default have on cryptocurrency markets more broadly? Because crypto markets never cease trading, financial shockwaves are prone to rip through them rapidly. Several decentralized trading platforms and global exchanges have enabled investors to sell and purchase cryptos 24-7. The constant ability for trade, though, exposes crypto to external forces more constantly than shares traded during stock market sessions. If Evergrande were to fall, for example, after the conclusion of a day's trade, crypto could immediately feel the brunt of such an occurrence. Conversely, the immediacy of trades and the constant ability to do so also provides crypto investors with the ability to sniff out danger and act swiftly. Whilst this could protect individual crypto investors, a group fleeing in unison could have several damaging impacts to the crypto market. And given the wide-reaching ramifications that Evergrande's potential default or collapse could have, crypto could be in for a very rocky road over the next month. Furthermore, if Evergrande defaults, it might have a significant influence on China's economy as a whole, as well as countries around the world. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment about what other crypto-related information that you'd like us to delve into. And of course, don't forget to press that bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mo Hamduna. Mo is the founder of MoWorks. MoWorks is a full service independent creative agency. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello, Mo. Good to speak with you today. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. No problem. Very interested to hear more about Mo Works. So, could you explain for our audience a little bit more about what you do? Sure. So, um, we run an agency here. We, we're based in Docklands. We work with our clients um, in three, uh, three key aspects. We work with the clients who potentially uh, utilize some form of a digital product as part of their solution. Uh, so, either uh, an application, a web app, an e-commerce, or uh, a SaaS product. Um, and then we help with them. We work with them on uh, aspect of the, the brand itself, uh, building uh, 
the strategy behind it, then the design and development or the innovation aspect of the product itself, and then helping uh, take it to, to market. And Mo, what do you believe are the key drivers to help a company to build a distinctive brand? Um, a distinctive brand. So uh, I believe a key aspect to build uh, a strong and distinctive brand uh, nowadays is really by having a more inclusive brand, a brand that really embraces the diversity of its people, the, the diversity of the the customer you bring in your brand to, and of course the community that's surrounding your business or, or the product itself. So, by inclusivity, I mean. Um, um, this inclusivity can be really reflected in um, in the core of the brand, like in the vision itself, in the value that y you have. Um, it can also, as part of the positioning of the brand, like once you understand your 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 consumer base and how diverse they are, and you build an inclusive brand, this can be uh, reflected in the positioning of it and in the persona of the brand itself. So how do you help your clients build on their business strategies and help them to realize their ideas? Um, I mean, with this question, um, I believe it can be answered in many ways. Because we, um, if, if we want to build uh, or to help our, work with our client in building strategy around their brand itself, so um, here it's more we take it to really uh, understand the uh, uh, the, the problem they, they here trying to solve, the, um, the current uh, um, status of the market itself and understand really how they see themselves fit. Are they more uh, looking to be uh, a brand that uh, have high quality but really low in prices like, some, like Google or Amazon, you, you know, they're competing in prices at the same time they're not compromising the quality or the expectation. Or are you more trying to be a premium product uh, with premium prices? So uh, there's lots of things come in place if you want to think of it from, um, I would say, uh, a brand point of view. But if you also want to strategize or you want to think of um, strategies for um, um, how you can bring your ideas uh, to life um, or what sort of idea you should explore and, um, and implement, here, potentially, we, we work with them in, um, in more some form of a discovery phase where uh, we can work with their uh, front of the front staff. Um, they have uh, to understand uh, the pain point they're facing, um, etc. And in today's highly competitive business market, a user-centric approach is a must. How can businesses implement user-centric innovation techniques and strategies? Yep, yeah, perfect. So this actually relates back to the last point I was talking about. So if you want to implement, uh, as you said, the user-centric uh, techniques, basically, it's really you want to go to, uh, as simple as going back to the to the users. Now, going back to consumers too early, sometimes it can backfire uh, because not every all consumers understand what they need if they don't see it just yet. So I believe a good approach usually is by chatting to uh, your front staff, the staff that really dealing and dealing on a daily basis with their your consumer, because usually your your front staff have their own pain by this uh, daily interaction with the consumers or they actually see the pain or hear it from the consumer themselves. So I believe it's always a great start. It's by going to your, um, your employee who interact on a daily basis with the consumer. Another way to, uh, in uh, implementing uh, a user-centric uh, technique is really by checking other complementary um, industries, not particularly your industry, so you can look at something similar or uh, can be complementary to your space or not, and just really and see how they innovate. How what what is new in that industry? Uh, what the stuff that they brought in and it's doing a mass success, and see how you can bring this into your own industry. And we've seen this one like with our clients um, in either in the construction sp uh, space or solar or safety. We've been looking at 
other industries such as retail, e-commerce, fintech, and we're seeing what been happening in that space that booming for them, that doing great result, uh, showing lots of innovation. And then we are bringing them into those, let's say, less digitized uh, industries and see, okay, this is, it's a, a new concept, it's an, a new, it's been tested, but in another industry, and maybe it's time to test it in, in this space itself, like in the solar or in a B2B construction space, etc. Now, in relation to the pandemic, what have you witnessed regarding businesses moving to meet the demands of the transforming digital world? Look, um, at this stage, I believe it's almost clear for all of us how, how many things has changed. Like we've been mo mo over a year uh, on it and um, uh, it's quite obvious that things like majority of the consumers and businesses are more tech savvy. Uh, everyone understand how to navigate their way through QR codes, through Zoom calls, etc. So, so this is one of the most important things is really it pushed people, I believe that were hesitant or to, to change, hesitant to digitize lots of um, um, of aspect of their business and push them to, to, to do that change. And once, I believe once they've been in the change now for over a year, most of them, they start recognizing how actually it's, it's more comfortable in the digital world. Um, and it's easier to do business. It's cutting lots of the stuff that is unwanted. Uh, um, and we saw changes in how you do grocery, in how you do learning, in how you do the telehealth, QR code. Majority of these stuff uh, are here to stay. This is, I believe, are one of the biggest changes that uh, is happening currently to the Australian market uh, and its consumers. Um, for us, for example, at MoWorks, we saw also um, a different type of request from our clients. And this has really been, um, I don't want to say shocking, but it's, uh, it was expected, but was really great to see that. Now, uh, last year we built an, an app, for example, for telehealth that connect uh, uh, people with pharmacists to issue uh, a medical certificate. Uh, we also worked on in a new project to uh, digitize an event, business event uh, business into a virtual events um, and help different businesses who just start digitizing their processes to allow their their team to work from anywhere from home etc well it's such a great space to be working in thank you so much for explaining mo works to us mo no worries Th thank you for having me and thank you for your time today with that i will sign off but watch this space for more till then stay apprised and invest wise with calkine Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. So the question on everyone's lips, can Monero breach the $300 level by the year end? Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. Now Monero is an open source decentralized cryptocurrency that uses privacy enhancing technologies and aims to provide protection to all users and secures transaction amounts, addresses balances and transaction histories. It has proven to be a resilient crypto so far. Developed back in 2014, Monero uses ring signatures, zero knowledge proofs and stealth addresses to disguise the transaction details. I'll talk more on this later. It was Monero's underlying technology that attracted many investors to its platform as it keeps the identity of senders and recipients anonymous. You could compare Monero with other cryptos in the same category, such as Zcash. 
Monero is governed by its token XMR and is ranked 35th on CoinMarketCap. XMR has seen a bullish rally of late, especially after launching four privacy coins. So what makes Monero special? Well, Monero's framework was designed to keep traders at privacy and its underlying technology makes it one of the most secure coins in the crypto market. Monero's ring signature system mixes the digital signature of the sender along with signatures of other users, which keeps the name of the real sender hidden. XMR's Ring CT technology keeps the value of the transaction hidden, thereby giving its exceptional security feature to traders. Monero is considered to be a truly fungible token, and as a truly fungible cryptocurrency, Monero grants a trader an extra layer of privacy and is limitless in nature. Also, Monero doesn't possess a preset block size limit, thereby giving the investors and traders an ideal opportunity to participate in the activity within the blockchain. Being highly scalable, it's often considered to be one crypto that is able to accommodate a surge of growth. The recently launched Atomic Swap feature allows the users to swap Monero for Bitcoin seamlessly without the need for a broker to do the dealing. Through the Atomic Swap, the users are also able to hide details within the Bitcoin's ledger, thereby giving it an all-round security feature. So in conclusion, many experts believe that due to its ability to hide the transaction details, Monero comes across as a great coin to invest in. The recent bursts have definitely held the coin and it's expected to reach $280 to $300 US mark by the end of this year. Experts predict that the coin has potential to reach $500 US dollars by 2025, and this bullish run would surely give them hopes for a coin that not only gives good returns, but also ensures that the security of the transaction as well. Now, if you liked this video, please like, share, and comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. For regular updates and more information, log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel, signing off for Calkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Hello everyone, thanks again for joining us on another edition of Executive Corner, Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm your host, Sage, and today's special guest is Mr. Mark Duter, the Managing Director, CEO of Aerometrics Limited. And today's expert will share insights on operating a professional geospatial technology business specialising in aerial photography, photogrammetry, LIDAR, 3D modelling and aerial imagery subscription services. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. So today we're very lucky to have with us Mr. Mark Duter, the Managing Director, CEO of Aerometrics Limited. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, Sage, and good morning to you. Well, let's get started. You've had 16 years at Aerometrics and your leadership has been pivotal to establishing Aerometrics as an industry leader. Financial Year 21 saw Aerometrics deliver a strong increase in annual recurring revenue from its Metro Map subscription service and we would love you to tell our viewers 
that Metro Map is an aerial imagery data providing service offering high quality accurate imagery to, to a subscriber base. Mark, could you elaborate on that for the viewers as well, please? Yeah, of course. So Metro Map is, uh, I guess, a, a new way of uh, selling our aerial photography service. You know, we've always prided ourselves at being uh, top of the heap in the uh, geospatial uh, industry as, as far as provision of these services, but mostly it had been sold on a project basis. Now we're switching the focus to focus entirely on our Metro Map subscription model. Uh, and we're capturing every capital city uh, four times a year and every rural and regional city annually. So we've got a comprehensive coverage of the Australian urban, urbanised population with our Metro Map service. That's great to hear. Amazing work that you're doing there. And on that note, how can AI and machine learning improve processing efficiency and provide exciting new tools for customers across the Metro Map 3D and Leader product suite, please? Yeah, so AI is becoming a very interesting area for us. We deal with about 18 different industries and each one of those industries has its own uh, information needs that they're trying to extract from the data sets that we provide, whether it is aerial imagery or, or LIDAR, you know, the shape of the terrain, or 3D models, whatever. So they're all looking at it from their perspective. And AI enables us to take uh, take the customer down that towards that value chain where they're extracting information that is particularly useful to them. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of the AI techniques that we're developing, um, you know, are, are focusing on things that you can see in the imagery but you can't necessarily generate a whole lot of statistics. And sometimes that's all that the customer wants is a bunch of statistics of, mm. of uh, you know, the number of swimming pools or solar panels or the number of trees in a plantation or the number of cars in a car park, those sort of things. So uh, yeah, the aim is to make it just so much easier for the customer. Fantastic. Thank you so much for elaborating on that because I was um, getting curious to find out about which industries in particular uses this type of uh, technology and from what you said it's quite a broad base of, of industries that get involved. Would that be correct? Indeed. Yeah, that's right. Um, look, uh, I could rattle them all off but it's, it's mining, it's uh, defence, it's engineering infrastructure, it's architecture, real estate, property management, local government, uh, you know, you'd be surprised I think to find just how widespread the uh, the uptake of this service is and, and what a difference it makes to just about all of our customers. Thank you for summarising that in a nutshell for us. And the US 3D market is a billion dollar emerging market. How do you plan on capitalising on the vast opportunities in the world's largest economy? Yes, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, we're over there um, selling actively now and, you know, apart from a few hiccups early on with COVID, with We've now gaining some traction in the US market. We are talking to some of the largest corporations over there. Uh, we are starting to gain traction in the engineering market and the real estate and property management market. And, uh, you know, we can see uh, enormous potential uh, over there. The economy is 15 times larger than the Australian economy. Uh, and the US uptake of 3D modelling technology is, is a little bit behind Australia. Australia actually led the way as an early adopter of that technology. But uh, we're finding that the US market is rapidly catching on and uh, the potential uh, is huge. Great to hear and congratulations on being an industry leader and flying the flag for Australia there. Um, in your opinion, how is spatial data helping grow the evolving field of virtual tourism? Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, 3D modelling to the degree and the resolution and the accuracy that we're providing that service it is quite an immersive experience. Uh, you, it can be used as a base for virtual reality and augmented reality uh, type um, software and hardware um, implementations. And you know, we we find that uh, if we have produced a 3D model, a detailed 3D model of any city in the world, it's it's almost like being there. It revives a rush of memories and so forth if you have been there before. Um, and if if you haven't, it, it really does put things into context and, and perspective. Um, you know, we did our um, a very detailed model of the city of Po in southwestern France. Um, we've also mapped Philadelphia and just released San Francisco. Um, we had Denver as well. And you can walk through those models and just get the sense of, of actually being there. 
it's it is a, a truly remarkable thing. I can imagine it would be amazing. I think I've heard of this technology being used for also taking you back through historical ancient times, for example, walking through ancient um, pyramids and things like that. Really sounds yeah. fantastic. Um, hopefully we'll be travelling again before the, um, before the start of next year, so virtual reality won't be our only option, but it sounds very exciting. And LiDAR, which actually expands to light detection and ranging technology, is a remote sensing method for measuring distances, just for the viewers out there who may be new to this. What are the benefits of using LiDAR in urban development? I know you've touched on it a bit. Would you mind elaborating on that for us? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, you're right. It is a, a technique for measuring distances. Uh, but if you apply that uh, distance measuring technique millions of times over a second, which you can actually do two million samples a second, it's remarkable, uh, you, you build up a very accurate picture of the shape of the terrain and also all the infrastructure and vegetation that's sitting on top of the terrain. And that can be utilised in a whole number of uh, different ways. Uh, we started off initially measuring uh, pit volumes and stockpiles for the mining industry, uh, but we've diversified that uh, operation considerably now so that we're measuring uh, things like uh, construction and engineering, um, uh, measuring the amount of material that has to be moved for a, a new freeway or, or road construction, for example. Um, in uh, in uh, vegetation mapping, we can actually penetrate through the top of the canopy right down to the ground. So you can see the surface of the ground underneath uh, the vegetation, which is, would obscure uh, the uh, terrain surface in a normal aerial photograph. Um, and measuring the growth of uh, vegetation, the biomass now, we've got very sophisticated techniques for coming up with the biomass um, of a particular uh, area. and. Uh, that's found applications in bushfire fuel load modelling, for example, where we can we can really help to assess the risk uh, of bushfire fuel load modelling by uh, by mapping the understory and coming up with detailed statistics on that. There is a very wide range of applications for that again as well. Ten different industries that we're working with there now. Thank you so much. And we have to start winding up the discussion. But just before you go, how do uh, in, how do industries that require this technology find you? Do they do you market yourself quite rigorously, or do they seek you out just out of curiosity? Yeah, oh, I, I, good question. Up until now, it has been uh, more or less a question of um, companies seeking us out. We we were very busy just handling requests for quote and tender. I think we're adopting a much higher public profile now. We've, we've embarked on an advertising campaign for our Metro Map service, and uh, that's a, attracted a, a broad base of consumer uh, interest, I guess, particularly in the SME market. Uh, so, yeah, we're aiming to make, uh, make our brands household names, Aerometrics and Metro Map, uh, and so people are aware that uh, where to go when they, uh, when they need those particular services. And it is surprising. Uh, how many people find that they can't live without the service once they, they've actually got it. Yes, and then that's um, good to know. It's available on subscription through Aerometrics as well, the Metro Maps. Would that be correct? Yeah, that's correct. If you go to our website, metromap.com.au, you can take out a seven-day free trial, uh, even uh, take up a subscription online with a credit card. So it's, it's Fantastic. a very well, easy process. You. Easy process, sounds good. Well, thank you so much for sharing the valuable work that you're doing through Aerometrics um, today with us, Mark. We really do appreciate your valuable insights. Thank you, Sage. Appreciate it. And if you've just joined us, viewers, we had a mind-expanding conversation about some very new and exciting technology brought to, um, brought to us by Aerometrics Limited. We had Mr. Mark Duter, the Managing Director and CEO, live with us. You can catch the full interview at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel later today. And please stay watching Kalkine for further live expert talks and market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, 
saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market, as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calcine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, Dust off your passports, pack your bags, and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello, good afternoon. Sage here reporting live from Kalkine Studio. It's lunchtime here in Sydney and time for the Mid-Market Pulse. In today's show, we'll take a look at the overall Australian's share market performance by the mid-session trade. So without any further ado, let's get started. And the Australian shares were trading near the day's high by the afternoon session as a slew of mergers and acquisition deals and firm global queues boosted market sentiment. The market gains were capped by a sell-off in the mining and banking stocks, while the mining stocks, especially the gold companies, dropped due to a fall in the yellow metal prices. Banking stocks tumbled following lower than expected earnings by index heavyweight Westpac. The investors also remained focused to the Reserve Bank's board meeting on Tuesday. The central bank is expected to keep the interest rates unchanged while it may shift policy towards the next rate hike given the substantial rise in bond yields last week. By the afternoon trade, the ASX 200 index was up by 40.20 points or 0.55%. The benchmark index opened higher today and surged as much as 0.6%, tracking gains on Wall Street. And on the sectoral front, nine of the 11 sectoral indices were trading higher, led by telecom and consumer discretionaries. The telecommunications services sector gained 2.1%, while consumer discretionary surged 2%. And among others, utilities, tech, industrials, healthcare, energy and consumer staples all traded higher, over 1%. Bucking the trend, financials was the worst performing sector with a 0.6% loss followed by materials. And in the following segment, let's focus on the top gainers and losers by the mid-session trade. And the top gainers on the ASX pack were minerals exploration company Oracoba by rising 6.1%. Some of the other top performers were diversified financial group Janice Henderson, natural health business Blackmores, healthcare equipment manufacturer Polynovo and metal detection and mining technology company Kodan. On the flip side, Westpac Banking, one of the country's leading banks, was the worst performer with a 6.3% loss. 
Some of the other notable losers were healthcare firm ResMed and gold mining companies St Barbara, Silver Lake Resources and Newcrest Mining. And on this note, let's now move on to the stocks that created a buzz on the ASX today. First on the list is a Real Estate Investment Trust Charter Hall Social Infrastructure REIT. Shares of Charter Hall traded 0.3% higher by the mid-session after the Property Trust announced the acquisition of healthcare and childcare properties for 58.4 million Australian dollars. The company informed its shareholders this morning that it has purchased a healthcare property in Heidelberg, Victoria, leased to a wholly owned subsidiary of ASX listed Helios. It has also acquired two premium childcare assets located in South East Queensland. Boosted by continued tenant performance, the company has also raised distribution guidance for financial year 2022 from 16.7 cents per share up to 16.9 cents per share, up 7.6 per cent from 2021. Next is television and publishing business Seven West Media. Shares of Seven West Media rose over 4% after it inked a deal to acquire assets and business of Prime Media Group for 131.9 million Australian dollars. The transaction value of the deal is 57% premium to the last closing price of Prime Media Group shares on the 29th October 2021. Cheering the news, shares of Prime Media zoomed 74%. As per the deal, Seven West Media will purchase all the business and related assets of Prime Media Group via the acquisition of Prime Television Seven Affiliate Sales and all their subsidiaries. The deal is subjected to a vote of the Prime Media Group shareholders, which will be held in December 2021. Seven West Media had announced on Friday that it had successfully refinanced its existing 500 million Australian dollar syndicated facility agreement, which will be used to finance the deal. And moving on to the next, shares of Westpac Banking Corporation dropped over 6%. The share price of Australia's Big Four Bank fell after the lender reported lower than expected growth in annual cash profit. Cash profit jumped 105% for the financial year ended September 2021, driven by a turnaround in impairment charges and growth in mortgages. The profit, however, was lower than the definitive estimate of 5.5 billion Australian dollars. Net interest margin, a key measure of profitability, dipped by four basis points to 2.04%. The bank has also announced to conduct an off-market buyback of up to 3.5 billion Australian dollars of equity shares. The process will open on 17th November and close on 17th December 2021. The buyback will be offered to eligible shareholders who are registered holders of shares on the record date and have a registered address in Australia or New Zealand. And meanwhile, shares of Remelius Resources slipped nearly 1% after the gold producer proposed a revised bid to acquire Apollo Consolidating. The company has made an improved unconditional recommended takeover offer of 62 Australian cents per share higher than the previous bid and current offer from rival Gold Road Resources, each of which valued Apollo at 56 cents a share. The offer price includes 34 cents in cash and 0.1778 Romelius shares per Apollo share. The revised offer pegs a total market value of Apollo at around 181 million Australian dollars. And Apollo's board has unanimously recommended the shareholders to accept Romelius's offer in the absence of a superior proposal. The revised offer from Romelius opened today and Apollo shareholders have the opportunity to consider their position with a month. Romelius has also entered into a pre-bid acceptance arrangement with another significant shareholder of Apollo and has secured a 19.99% stake in Apollo. Among others, Osnet Services shares today rose 5% after the energy company accepted Brookfield's 10.2 billion Australian dollar offer. A consortium led by the Canadian private equity firm Brookfield proposed an offer of $2.65 Australian for every Osnet share, higher than APA Group's offer price of $2.60 Australian per share. And last week, Osnet had agreed to grant due diligence access to APA Group while it continued to engage with Brookfield on its indicative non-binding and conditional proposal. The scheme values Osnet at an enterprise value of 17.8 billion Australian dollars. And if the scheme is implemented, Osnet shareholders will receive total value 
of $2.65 Australian cash per share plus additional consideration of the scheme has not been implemented before 31st March 2022. And thank you for your company on that report, but that's all for now. Do keep watching Kalkai TV. Sage here signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello, James Preston here for Kaokai Media. The future of China's largest property group Evergrande hangs in the balance as the real estate giant faces its worst liquidity crisis to date. The crisis has shaken the Chinese market as well as global markets. Many pundits are watching the developments with an eye to the Lehman Brothers collapse of 2008 when the US investment bank went bankrupt due to the subprime mortgage crisis. Evergrande, the world's largest real estate borrower, is on the verge of a possible default as its outstanding debt ballooned to 310 billion US dollars by the end of the June quarter of 21, the largest by any publicly listed real estate company globally. This week is going to be critical for the beleaguered company as it faces the daunting task of paying interest dues of 83.5 million US dollars to its March 2022 bondholders on September the 23rd. Adding to it, Evergrande has to make another payment of 47.5 million US for its March 2024 notes due on September 29. If the company fails to make payment of the interest within a period of 30 days, both bonds would default, which in turn will affect negatively not only China's property market, but also global markets. In a much needed respite, the company, Evergrande, has reportedly reached a deal with its bond holders. The company's subsidiary, Hangda Real Estate Group said this morning that it would make a scheduled bond interest payment on its September 25 bond on time on September 23. The company, however, did not give any clarity on dues payments related to March 2022 bonds and March 24 notes. However, the risk of default still looms as the Chinese builder faces mammoth dues of 37.3 billion US dollars in the next 12 months which is nearly three times the company's cash reserves worth 13.5 billion US dollars. So, is the Australian market in trouble as a result? Well, while fears about the spillover from the potential collapse of Evergrande roiled the Australian stock market on Monday, the benchmark index, the ASX 200, gained some ground on Tuesday. The news of negotiations between Evergrande and its bondholders gave a strong boost to the Aussie market on Wednesday, helping the ASX 200 close 0.3% higher. However, investors needed to be cautious as the Evergrande crisis is ongoing. Australia's central bank on Wednesday warned that rising household debt, merely based on soaring property prices, may lead to financial instability. On Wednesday, RBA Assistant Governor Michelle Bullock explained, sharp rises in housing prices that are not associated with fundamentals could lead to instability by raising the risk of the subsequent decline. The bottom line is that China is Australia's biggest bilateral trade partner. The potential fallout of Evergrande will adversely impact the Aussie financial markets. However, the Australian market is in a better position to absorb a potential shock from a big company default, which is evident from a strong rebound in the equity market. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. 
For more information, just head across to the website, kaokaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kaokai. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calcine TV. Hello, James Preston here for Kaokai Media. The future of China's largest property group, Evergrande, hangs in the balance as the real estate giant faces its worst liquidity crisis to date. The crisis has shaken the Chinese market as well as global markets. Many pundits are watching the developments with an eye to the Lehman Brothers collapse of 2008 when the US investment bank went bankrupt due to the subprime mortgage crisis. Evergrande, the world's largest real estate borrower, is on the verge of a possible default as its outstanding debt ballooned to 310 billion US dollars by the end of the June quarter of 21, the largest by any publicly listed real estate company globally. This week is going to be critical for the beleaguered company as it faces the daunting task of paying interest dues of 83.5 million US dollars to its March 2022 bondholders on September the 23rd. Adding to it, Evergrande has to make another payment of 47.5 million US for its March 2024 notes due on September 29. If the company fails to make payment of the interest within a period of 30 days, both bonds would default, which in turn will affect negatively not only China's property market, but also global markets. In a much needed respite, the company, Evergrande, has reportedly reached a deal with its bond holders. The company's subsidiary, Hangda Real Estate Group said this morning that it would make a scheduled bond interest payment on its September 25 bond on time on September 23. The company, however, did not give any clarity on dues payments related to March 2022 bonds and March 24 notes. However, the risk of default still looms as the Chinese builder faces mammoth dues of 37.3 billion US dollars in the next 12 months which is nearly three times the company's cash reserves worth 13.5 billion US dollars. So, is the Australian market in trouble as a result? Well, while fears about the spillover from the potential collapse of Evergrande roiled the Australian stock market on Monday, the benchmark index, the ASX 200, gained some ground on Tuesday. The news of negotiations between Evergrande and its bondholders gave a strong boost to the Aussie market on Wednesday, helping the ASX 200 close 0.3% higher. However, investors needed to be cautious as the Evergrande crisis is ongoing. Australia's central bank on Wednesday warned that rising household debt, merely based on soaring property prices, may lead to financial instability. On Wednesday, RBA Assistant Governor Michelle Bullock explained, sharp rises in housing prices that are not associated with fundamentals could lead to instability by raising the risk of the subsequent decline. The bottom line is that China is Australia's biggest bilateral trade partner. The potential fallout of Evergrande will adversely impact the Aussie financial markets. However, the Australian market is in a better position to absorb a potential shock from a big company default, which is evident from a strong rebound in the equity market. 
If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kaokai. For more information, just head across to the website, kaokaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kaokai. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Let's talk about crypto exchanges, Binance versus Kraken, and see how they differ. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones, and you're watching Kalkine Media. The global crypto market has been fast evolving with technological innovation and investment. And as the industry continues to expand, new crypto coins are entering the market at a rapid pace. Similarly, crypto exchanges are upgrading their platforms to keep up with demand. New opportunities and high returns are drawing more investors into the industry. 2021 has been significant as it saw the market touching 2 trillion US dollars in August for the first time. Crypto exchanges Binance and Kraken have been in investors' limelights. So let's look at the two exchanges and understand their unique features. Kraken is a US-based global cryptocurrency exchange founded back in 2011. It offers crypto trading, staking and services to individual customers and institutions globally. The firm offers three major platforms for trading, the Kraken Mobile app, Kraken Pro Mobile app and the Kraken Futures app. Currently, over 80 cryptocurrencies can be traded in the exchange. In addition, it provides a wide range of options for individual traders for personal crypto investment accounts. However, Kraken crypto apps are not available for New York and Washington residents. For the funding accounts, Kraken lets its users pay through fiat currencies or cryptocurrencies. It also provides margin accounts and futures trading and over-the-counter trading through its platform. Kraken provides rewards to passive traders for staking cryptos and fiat currencies, and it doesn't have a wallet. Binance is a leading crypto exchange founded by Changpeng Zhao in 2017. It's registered in the Cayman Islands. The company has high-frequency trading software. Besides crypto trading, Binance provides a range of services for individual traders and institutions, which includes futures trading, margin trading, NFT services, and also Binance Academy. That's an educational resource for beginners. However, unlike Kraken, Binance offers more cryptocurrencies for trading. A primary reason for its popularity among traders looking for more coin and token variety to trade. Its trading services include peer-to-peer -peer transactions, a classic Binance trading interface, an advanced trading platform and an over-the-counter trading portal. However, those living in the US do not have access to the main Binance platform but they can use the country-specific platform. 
Although the US platform offers fewer assets than its original platform, it still provides various features for individuals and institutions. Binance also offers crypto loans. Big traders can use its Visa cards for purchasing items globally. The global crypto market is currently worth around 1.9 trillion US dollars. Both Binance and Kraken exchanges have caught traders' attention due to their unique and innovative features. For instance, their easy to use interface and trading platforms are drawing in new users. However, traders should evaluate the companies and the crypto assets carefully before investing in them. Now, if you like this video, please press the like button and share, and you can also make comments. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. For more information, log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Chinese property development company Evergrande is on the brink of collapse, and its fall could have serious ramifications for cryptocurrency as evidenced by recent impacts to Bitcoin. On the 21st of September, the price of Bitcoin dropped by as much as 11%, kicking out the week on a negative note. On Wednesday, September 22, Bitcoin was trading at $42,137 US dollars and 60 cents as of 1.10 pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. The price of Bitcoin has fluctuated over the last month immensely, with the highest price being just under 53,000 US dollars, but also experiencing a dip down to 39,787 US dollars and 61 cents. Other major cryptos such as Ether, Cardano and Litecoin have also been experiencing dips and as of the 21st of September we're still experiencing a downward trend. Let's take a look though at exactly why Bitcoin declined. With a maximum circulation of 21 million coins and an enormous market cap, many have argued that in crypto terms Bitcoin is somewhat of a safe haven. Consumers understand that Bitcoin's price typically falls in tandem with the price of other risky assets. September has been an even more volatile month than usual for crypto and Bitcoin in particular. The most recent crash occurred merely days after a string of reports demonstrating the currency's durability. For instance, El Salvador now possesses the world's third largest network of cryptocurrency ATMs bringing the total number of Central American crypto ATMs up to 70% coverage. However, because it is a decentralized system, it can often be challenging to identify the specific route of a crypto market crash. The price swings this time around are thought to be tied to China's real estate sector, notably the Chinese enterprise Evergrande Group. With nearly 300 billion US dollars in liabilities, Evergrande is the world's most indebted real estate firm, and markets throughout the world have plummeted in concern that China may permit Evergrande to default on its debts. So what impact could Evergrande's potential default have on cryptocurrency markets more broadly? Because crypto markets never cease trading, financial shockwaves are prone to rip through them rapidly. Several decentralized trading platforms and global exchanges have enabled investors to sell and purchase cryptos 24-7. The constant ability for trade, though, exposes crypto to external forces more constantly than shares traded during stock market sessions. If Evergrande were to fall, for example, after the conclusion of a day's trade, crypto could immediately feel the brunt of such an occurrence. Conversely, the immediacy of trades and the constant ability to do so also provides crypto investors with the ability to sniff out danger and act swiftly. Whilst this could protect individual crypto investors, a group fleeing in unison could have several damaging impacts to the crypto market. And given the wide-reaching ramifications that Evergrande's potential default or collapse could have, crypto could be in for a very rocky road over the next month. Furthermore, if Evergrande defaults, 
it might have a significant influence on China's economy as a whole, as well as countries around the world. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment about what other crypto-related information that you'd like us to delve into. And of course, don't forget to press that bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. In this episode, we'll be shining a light on Encore Accounting, a firm that offers far more than accounting services. It helps people run their business better using its vast industry experience with proven strategies to maximise client results. Alan Mason is the Managing Director at Encore Accounting. He has over 30 years of experience as a chartered accountant, nearly 15 years in financial services and non-accounting based businesses. And today he joins us to talk in depth about Encore Accounting. Alan, thanks for joining us today. Hi James, thanks for having us. Well Alan, great to have you here. And as I've mentioned, Encore Accounting goes above and beyond standard accountancy work. Can you break down exactly what it is that Encore does for other businesses that other accountancy firms simply don't? Well, <laughs> it's a hard one because there are a lot of accounting firms out there. Some do the right thing and look after their clients and some, like we all know in, in any business and in any industry, um, there are people that just don't care about their clients and you know, you, uh, that's tragic. And I've written a number of books where we're really out there trying to focus and trying to help. I mean. You know, people find tax boring and they go, oh, we don't want to be involved with all the accounting stuff. Well, I'll leave that to others. But let me tell you, you lose half your income, 30% to 50% of your income. It's a major incentive to do something about it and to think about it and be proactive. And sitting on doing this nine months after the year end, well, you're wasting your time. You need to get be proactive. You need to be ahead of the game. You might need to use different structures. I mean, many times we'll come up with um, you know, need to have a property trust or we might need to have asset protection or we might need to shuffle money from one entity to another to, to save tax. There might be losses in one part. So you just need to be above and ahead of the game and looking at it and, you know, your accountant's part of your team. You, you need to be able to get on the phone, ring them and say, what do I do here? I'm looking to do this mm. or my year has been crap or my year has been good what are the issues that are going to follow from that and just be part of your team. And, and I've, I wrote a book, What would, how would I choose an accountant? What would I look for if I was to find or look for an accountant? So I wrote a book on it. <laughs> that might sound funny because it says how to choose that on core accounting. I, I, in subliminal. <laughs> so, so it goes through the message at night, you know, like subliminal, choose account, on core accounting, choose account accounting. <laughs> but no, no, I'm only joking. But, but I mean, one of the most important members of your team is your accountant. Every business in Australia has an accountant. Are they looking after that business? Well, I have to tell you in maybe a third of the cases, they are not. 
<laughs> well, well, Alan, talking about that book that you've mentioned there itself, I mean, you've, you've mentioned that it breaks down exactly the steps that you should take to actually look at getting the right account of your business. Can you just briefly touch on some of those points that are in the book? Well, oddly enough, and when I'm dealing with business owners, you're dealing with something that is a little bit foreign to them. You talk accounting, you talk tax, it's a little bit hard. To, to a business owner, generally they're good at marketing or they're good at what they do, a plumber, a carpenter, a builder, mm. but they're not good at their accounting stuff. So sometimes they don't know what they, what, what they need to do. They don't know what they need to look for. So I suppose my biggest takeaway is that if you feel your accountant's not helping you, if you feel your accountant's not on your team, take, follow that gut feeling. Whenever we don't follow our gut feeling, we always find later that, oh, we should have done that. That was the mm. right way to go. Why, why didn't we just do what we had that gut feeling to do? And, and yes, you need to look for someone suitably qualified, CA or CPA. You need to know, have someone that's alert to um, financial structures and systems. You need to have someone that is IT savvy. I can tell you there are still a few accountants out there that um, are not IT savvy. Uh, how they survive in the world today, I, it's beyond me. So no, you're right. You, you do need, need to to, uh, to grow, adapt, and change to make sure that you are facilitating with the, the current world. That's obviously a big point. Now, as part of that, you obviously have to plan for the future as well. It's not just simply about, you know, I've been working for the past six months. It's now come around to the, uh, the cutoff date, the end of July. You've actually got to look for the future. So planning tax is crucial. How do you help your clients plan for growth and tax management moving forward? Well, we need to get close to them for a start. We need to be on top of the figures and we, they need to be on an online system that we can look at it, log in anytime on your phone and know how you're tracking. So you don't want to leave these things at the last minute. And you know, often people say, the more money I make, the more tax I pay. <laughs> That's not true. It is not true. Tax office probably want you to believe that. Some people probably want you to believe that. but. Honestly, if you're a step ahead, it, it is just a myth. Um, so with clever planning, um, restructuring, and looking at, and look, sometimes there are situations where there's not a lot I can do. But I, can I tell you that many times there have been situations where I've changed, uh, uh, where uh, on our website, we talk about a situation where, or in my latest book, um, a client had a million dollar tax bill, I finished up paying 268,000. So, you know, more money I make, the more tax I pay. Not true. Mm. Now, a lot of what we're talking about here, Alan, is uh, obviously companies and, and corporate entities. Uh, do you do much work with uh, private citizens, for example, who might come to you and say, look, I'm a high net worth individual. That's just my salary, though. Can you help me in the same way that you help a business? Do you have a lot of those clients too? We do. We do. We have quite a lot of high net worth clients, in fact. Um, and some that want to be high net worth clients. <laughs> want to try I fall into that category. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yes, we do. Um, and remember, if you've got a lot of income, you need to be thinking ahead of the game again. And maybe you're looking at buying properties or, or investments or gearing or different structures. You need to be looking at asset protection. You know, there's a lot of things that fall out. Um, we, we work a lot with, with self-made super funds for instance. And, but people, sometimes people are a little bit scared about self-made super. They think it's a tax, they think it's all well, the regulation affects them, but it's a tax haven. You know, where else can you pay tax at 15% on, on its income in accumulation mode or zero, I'll repeat that, zero, zero tax when it's in accumulation, sorry, in pension mode. So wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? If you can get a tax deduction on the way in, the money you put in from one pocket, out of one pocket into your other pocket, so from out of your business into your super, or if you're an employee, you might want to top up up to the concessional limits to get a tax deduction on the money that you put in. So look, there are lots of options. Um, it's not a perfect world. We're dealing with a tax system that is overly complicated. I mean. I, when, I, when you talk about the amount of tax legislation that's out there, over 100,000 pages. If wow. I was to put all of the regulations and all the sections of the Act on the floor, page by page, it would reach the ceiling. 
that's how much there is. And I'm assuming that's a pretty tall ceiling too. This is not like a little den underneath the house. This is this is a big skyscraper, unfortunately. But I, I mean, you mentioned there about self-managed super funds, and obviously there is uh, some important intricacies there. Whether it could be, you know, as you mentioned, zero percent potentially of tax. What in general, though, would you say is the significance of setting one up, and and why is there somewhat of a hesitation in not doing so? Firstly, it may not be right for you, so you need to look at that and make sure it is right for you. Secondly, sometimes there are situations where it's the only way to go. For instance, if you're looking to buy a property that you couldn't buy outside of super, you might look to transfer a rollover over your industry money into that fund. You might be looking at um, other clever strategies. We've, we've actually, we had one client that we purchased their business through their super fund. Very special, a lot of rules um, and a lot of compliance, but it made a lot of sense and in fact meant that the business paid, made, made profit and paid no tax. And the amounts the owner took out, which was a pension payment, um, out of their pension, out of their super fund, was tax free. So, yeah, you know, you know, there are strategies out there. You, you don't realize what can be done. And you don't realize sometimes what um, high net worth people do. And, and they, uh, they are demanding and they want me to do stuff. And I love doing it because, you know, it's a challenge. And if I can um, pull a rabbit out of the hat, it makes my day. <laughs> now, we all like magic tricks, especially when it comes to money, that's for sure. Now, obviously, uh, COVID-19 has thrown a lot of different businesses into disarray. It's been, you know, over 18 months now we've all been having to deal with this. A couple of questions on that front. What are the challenges you found in your business personally? And as part of the pandemic and, and the response from government, a lot of people were allowed to then dip into their super. Now, is that a smart move in general or is it very much a case-by-case -case basis? Would you recommend someone hopping into their super, for example? Uh, it is a case-by-case -case basis. I, I honestly wouldn't recommend it because if you're young and you take 10000 out now, in 30 years, that 10000 could have been worth 100000 So mm. really, last resort. You, you, shouldn't, you should try to not do it. But if you can't pay your rent and you can't pay your costs or you're about to be put on the street, certainly. And, and that's what it's intended. It's intended for those challenging situations. And look, it has been a difficult period. When on the, I remember it vividly, when on the 12th of March, the Prime Minister made his announcement, it was almost like the world caved in. It was almost like, what do we do? And every business was in the same category. I worked feverishly over that weekend. I remember it was a Thursday night, 6 p.m., Prime Minister made his announcement. By Monday morning, I had produced a booklet on all of the JobKeeper and all of the stimulus packages and all of the things wow. that were available because we needed to be on the front foot with our clients. We needed them to survive. We needed to help them survive. And we put that out. I mean, the booklet changed about 10 times, I've got to tell you. And the tax office themselves <laughs> took two weeks to get their head around what they needed to do. So you can imagine the, the confusion for clients. And you've got people in all different situations, trusts, companies, employing, not employing, um, a myriad of, of situations that were so different that required us to step back and think about the legislation and what was being put through and then work out what we could do to help our clients. How with this impact. We had probably, um, and, and I get asked this question often, um, of our client base now, we would have maybe 20% or less that would be suffering because of COVID-19, 80% doing well. And when I say do well, they're doing extremely well. So it's only a small percentage. Um, and because we're across so many different industries, that's probably why that's the case for us. Mm. If we were specialised in hospitality or a few areas like that, then maybe um, the impact would be different. But JobKeeper really helped our clients go forward. We even got grants. We're just doing all the grants at the moment for clients, um, $5,000, $10,000 grants, um, the lockdown grants that, that came out a little while ago. These things are there to help. Um, the system doesn't help the client, unfortunately. You, you, you think that you know, the government's got the right intention, they want to do the right thing and help their client and help businesses and business owners, but sometimes there are so many barriers that they put up. It's, 
you'd be surprised. And at our end, we, we that's why I don't have as much hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's because of all, you know, trying to deal with, with with getting through the minefield of the regulations, and some people qualify, they don't, and you know, they had a business restructure last year, so so they don't qualify for the thirty percent drop. And I, I can tell you a, a hundred sob stories of situations where mm. they should have got it, they're re, they're really entitled to it, but the legislation doesn't fit their situation. Well, Alan, I think there's a, a very key reason you've pointed out there as to why. I've got a bit more up here than yourself. I'm not having to deal with the stress of that situation, that is for sure, mate. But uh, look, you also may mention as well about you know being able to pull a rabbit out of the hat. There's a bit of magic involved in what you're doing. Is there actually a magic formula that will ensure success every time for a business? I'm asked this all the time, and we work with business owners, and we want them to succeed. Why do we want them to succeed? Because they want to, they've got to pay our bill. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> we want them to succeed. <laughs> so there are three things that a business owner needs to do. And we, we, we work with them all the time. Sorry to be flippant. And very simple, three things. Plan, monitor, and correct. PMC. So plan. What's your business? What, what's your reason for being in business? What are you trying to achieve? Sit down and do a business plan, and we can help you with that. One page, two page, whether it's sales to this or, or, or what I'm trying to achieve there. So plan. So then the second thing is monitor it. And you've got to monitor your progress. If, if I was to walk out the door tomorrow and I wanted to head to Melbourne, I'd know to turn left, not right. So you've got to monitor your, your, how, you know, your systems, your progress towards your destination, what you're trying to achieve. Today, with zero QuickBooks Online, direct feed from your bank account into your business um, accounting system, you know it day by day. I can tell you with every one of our clients that we've pushed onto zero or QuickBooks, I can look at it and I can tell them what their profit is today. So we need to know that and need to be monitoring that. And then the third thing is to correct. So you've got to correct any deviations. So as you're starting to get on the wrong road, so you find you're heading to Melbourne, but you, you, you've got a traffic block somewhere, so you need to go around that. If you've got all your information on zero, you're monitoring where you're heading, you can make those changes. And if you've got to close your business because it's not going too well, you need to do that. If you've got to put more people on because your um, sales are increasing, you need to do that. You need to know what your break even point. So when we work with clients, we'll say, well, what are you trying to make? What profit? you're trying to achieve? What are you trying to do with your business? Why are you in business? <laughs> Maybe you should go home. <laughs> no, I don't say that. Um, but, but um, and I've seen businesses where they're making a loss and it's like, well, hang on, close your doors. You get more, come on unemployment benefit or something, you don't earn more money because at the moment you're sucking mm -hmm. out on your mortgage and you're, 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 you're going on a road to, to nowhere. So you've got to correct any deviations. We we'll sit down and, and calculate a break even point with a client. So we'll say, okay, you want to make 300,000 profit. Um, let's reverse engineer that back up to, to work out what the income has to be. Overhead, break even point, all those things. And it works out maybe 10,000 a week, for example. They've got to have turnover of 10,000 a week. So then we're, you're looking at it, it's Thursday of the week or Friday. Did you make target? Did you make 10,000 a week? You didn't? Well, you're not going to make your budget. You're not going to make your, your profit. So then you've got to correct it. So correct any deviations. Keep yourself on track. Keep yourself aligned with where you want to be, where your business wants to be, and really be proactive. And if you haven't made your budget, I can't tell you how many times I've seen clients go, well, I'll ring up that extra client or I'll make that extra call or I'll push this extra salesman out there and see if we can get that budget for that week. And then next week. The next week, the next week. That's how you succeed every time. <laughs> no, you're not wrong. It certainly is an ongoing process. It's one you've got to keep your fingers on top of the pulse the entire time. And that, of course, includes getting your accountant in on the conversation. Get across that, it's for sure. Alan, we've run out of time, but just before I let you go, three things I want to touch on. Uh, you've mentioned a book. What is the book? Where can we get it? Same for the booklet surrounding all those rules to do with grants and COVID. And also, how can we find your website? Well, our website's easy, encoreaccounting.com.au, and our books are on our uh, publishing website, which is broadviewpublishing.com.au. 
Um, our latest book, Tax Secrets of the Rich, I've, I've, I've actually it's a case study, if you like, of, of all those things that we've, we've done to save people heaps of money. Um, that comes out in a couple of weeks. Um, we've got links on our, web, on our um, um, Broadview Publishing website. And uh, initially that'll come out. If you want to subscribe to our newsletter, we'll be sending out our books free for two days, for the first two days on Amazon. So um, certainly Ooh, subscribe like to Yeah. So Tax Secrets of the Rich by Kerry Packer's former accountant. That's, I used to work for Kerry. So it's a little bit, um, um, a few secrets there that, um, and, and for instance, Kerry would not have minded some of the things we did uh, in those days to, to disclose it because he had a bit of an opinion on tax, as you might know. <laughs> yes, yes, we certainly do know. Well, look, uh, Alan, really looking forward to having a read of that Tax Secrets of the Rich. We'll actually have to catch up in a few weeks, I'd imagine, to, uh, to have a chat once it's released. But it's been great to have a chat with you today and uh, all the best of luck with Encore Accounting. Thank you. Thank you, James. Well, that is Alan Mason, the Managing Director for Encore Accounting. Very fun chat as well. If you missed any part of it, all you have to do is head across to the YouTube channel, Calco Media. You can also find every single one of our expert talks to date. The entire catalogue is there, ready for you to peruse. That's all for this one, though. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calco. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. In this episode, we'll be shining a light on Ascension Cloud Solutions, a tech consulting agency based in Wollongong in New South Wales. It works with experts in a wide range of technologies and practices in order to provide businesses a holistic approach that ensures a stable design, execution and integration when implementing software for business. Connor Goldberg is the Managing Director of Ascension Cloud Solutions and he joins me now for an in-depth look at the company. Connor, great to have your company today. Hey James, great to be here. Now Connor, I've just given a brief little overview of what Ascension Cloud Services does, but in your own words, what exactly are the services that Ascension Cloud Solutions provides for other businesses? Sure. Uh, by and large, uh, we're a tech-based consultancy that uh, see, uh, that looks to streamline different business processes for a wide range of different types of business models. Uh, primarily, our customer focus is more geared towards uh, startups and emerging businesses that are looking to sort of build their digital brand footprint. And so that'll include things like uh, web design and development, uh, different SEO and digital marketing strategies, as well as uh, integrating their social media platforms, uh, communications with internal staff, and different custom level uh, applications for internal administration use, as well as custom built mobile applications if they're looking to go uh, to the consumer market. So quite a diverse array of things that you're covering there. I mean, it's pretty much a one-stop shop solution for any business that is looking to have an online presence, I would imagine. And, and that is something I want to focus on here. Obviously, the backdrop of the pandemic has meant a large amount of work has now shifted remotely or businesses being shut down means that a very strong online presence has never been more important. So in your opinion, which tools do businesses need to conduct a professional marketing platform and really solidify their online existence? 
Yeah, so uh, by and large, it's going to really depend on what you're after as a business. We primarily work with uh, Shopify stores since they have a dedicated suite of plugins which can be implemented on standalone sites as well as the ability to offer a order fulfillment and tracking service uh, for their e-commerce type stores. Overall, the tooling that Shopify seems to provide with their themes and layouts uh, fit with the majority of our clients' needs and uh, offer a good uh, all-in-one solution to a more professional marketing standpoint. However, uh, some clients are going to require custom-built web and mobile applications that we alluded to earlier, as well as different customer resource management platforms and administration portals for those clients, we'll use a wide range of different technologies that we build in-house uh, that are specific to their, uh, their own needs. Uh, for our design process, we're going to use tools such as InDesign and Figma so that clients can easily visualize and ensure that their digital, uh, that their digital design standards are adhered to. And we'll also uh, integrate different types of technologies uh, powered by MySQL, DynamoDB, Node.js, and React uh, for more of their tech-based requirements with uh, their web and mobile applications. We may mention there about e-commerce. What would you say are some of the key e-business strategies that companies should be focusing on given the current climate that we're experiencing? Yeah, sure. I'd say for e-commerce uh, specifically, by and large, uh, your marketing strategy needs to be on point. So some good tips for marketing strategy would be to have a blog and uh, outreach to other media channels so that you can provide valuable free content for your user base to consistently come in and actually get some actual value out of your co uh, company and sort of build that brand awareness. Uh, paid advertisement through social media platforms is also another big one. Uh, that right now, the two main players would be Instagram and Facebook, and actually promoting your advertisements through them and increasing your advertisement engagement by using things such as video and visual effects will help you actually stand out from the crowd. Other different tips for other e-businesses would be to actually improve your communication channels. Uh, there are actually a wide range of tools that are available, such as Slack, Discord, Microsoft Teams, and Skype, that will actually be available for remote businesses so that they can actually reduce their expenses and, uh, in turn, allow for an increased budget for remote work expenses for their own staff. Uh, this may include things like internet rebates to ensure that their internet service provided is of a high standard, mm -hmm. company laptops uh, so that they have their hardware requirements met, as well as other software licenses that are going to be required on a day-to-day -day basis so that you can maintain that business-as-usual flow and ensure that you have a steady uh, work environment for your staff members. Well, Connie, you may have mentioned there about part of this being obviously the promotion of what you're doing with your business and Facebook and Instagram being two of the places to look at there. Obviously, there's a whole other list of them, whether it be Pinterest or Twitter or anything like that. TikTok is obviously one that's now come through in the past, say, 18 months, pretty much since the pandemic came about. Is that one that you're now looking a bit closer at, given it, it is seeing such a huge rise recently? I think that TikTok in particular is a very interesting sort of concept and that it's seeing a wide range of growth. However, from my own personal perspective, I see TikTok as more of a trend as opposed to something that's sustainable long term. Uh, if you were to ask me the same question as Vine, uh, uh, Vine and TikTok are largely very comparable to each other as social media platforms. Uh, whereas TikTok is sort of trying to really build that brand awareness and actually sort of uh, pivot into a space that Vine wasn't able to do within a short amount of time. Uh, whether or not they're there yet to the point where they can actually become a sustainable platform uh, on their own, uh, it's, right now it's too early to tell. But I'm very much of the opinion that currently I think it's just a trend and it'll likely fade within maybe three, four years or so. Wow, big call, but uh, look, I like that there's a bit of confidence behind it. Let's have a look at some of the packages that you offer there for Ascension Cloud Solutions. Could you break down sure. what each of those packages entails and if they're catered to different sort of budgets? 
Yeah, sure. So we offer a wide, uh, wide variety of packages that are usually uh, tailor built to take into a business's uh, budget into consideration. Uh, currently, we actually do have a limited time offer where we're selling uh, single custom landing pages using a single layout that we have uh, built for our other uh, clients for starting at a price of $550. This will include all domain hosting costs for the first three years as well as provide five uh, company email addresses that are dedicated uh, for your staff members. Uh, going up from there, we do offer three, four, five web page solutions at fixed price contracts, mm -hmm. uh, varying at about $1,500 or so per page. Uh, on top of that, we do also offer different SEO and digital marketing services. Uh, however, those are all uh, custom and tailored built depending on uh, what sort of uh, outreach you're trying to get and achieve for your own marketing purposes. Connor, have you also noticed a bit of a shift towards custom mobile and web applications? Because I know you're talking there about primarily websites, but one thing we are seeing, of course, is you know a rise and rise of everybody wanting to have their own smartphone app, for example. So have you seen an increase in that space? And if there has been, why do you think that is? Look, I think by and large, the demand for mobile and web apps haven't really changed uh, drastically over the past five uh, years or so. But right now we're seeing a current uh, change in demand or shift in terms of the technologies used to develop uh, mobile applications in particular. So uh, if we look to the web application space, right, we have a lot of templated solutions that are making it easier for business owners to actually implement their own web design practices mm -hmm. through Shopify, WordPress, Wix, Elementor, Magento, the list goes on. There's a solution dedicated to a wide variety of business owners that try to cut out the development process. But over time, what we're seeing happening is that certain platforms or products will actually require a specialist in that field to really understand the different features that each service offers and when to actually implement what for a particular solution. And so by and large, I think the simplest approach is to just have something that is a simple platform that business owners can sort of implement, and then you can have a specialist sort of extend upon it. So if you make something too feature heavy, user experience isn't going to be as great. And I think a lot of those templated solutions are starting to suffer from that as a result. In terms of the mobile development space though, by and large, you need to have a development company that's really able to sort of build a custom mobile app for yourself as a business owner. And I think if there is going to be a shift, it'll largely be a similar sort of direction as the web-based applications. You're going to have these companies that are looking to bridge the gap between mobile developer and business owner so that a business owner can then drag and drop these different modules, custom mm -hmm. build a little mobile app for themselves, and then uh, immediately publish and market it. And I think that's probably where the shift is probably going to be head headed for in that direction. I think you're right. I mean, we've seen things like Canva, for example, now being valued at more than Telstra, and that was not a thing of what, about six, seven years ago, it's had such a, a huge rise and much the same as things like uh, Wix or whether it's WordPress, it's having that ability to, to cut out the middleman, I suppose, but when it comes down to creating, as you said, those very specialised niche apps that do exactly what the business is after, that's when it does come time to consult an expert like yourself. One of the other things that you're doing there is UX design. Now, for the uninitiated, can you break down what UX design is and what are the solutions that you offer in that space? Sure. So uh, UX design is primarily putting yourself into the position of the customer to provide the best user experience possible, hence the term UX. Hmm. So you want to think about what value your product is actually trying to achieve and accomplish for your own user base. And then you want to sort of eliminate all the different little middleman uh, processes that happen in between so that a customer isn't deterred from utilizing your platform. So we operate off of a five-step process uh, in terms of our development launch. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have an initial project planning and consultation that lets us get to know the ins and outs of your business and your business model, uh, what sort of practices you're trying to achieve, what your goals are, and what your users are largely trying to get out of your product. 
Then we'll opt to have an architectural design stage. This will incorporate things like wireframes, data gathering and market research, as well as an assessment on the different technologies that will be required. And then once that has all been established and we have a visual rendering uh, that's been adhered to, we will then move on to the development and implementation of those technologies that we had deemed to be necessary for the project. Then we undergo a phase of testing with the business owners and of course deployment and launch so that it goes direct to the consumer. So during that architectural design phase, that's where we plot out the user journey uh, and we try and put ourselves in the shoes of our ideal customers. So we'll have a wide variety of customers that will come in, but based on market research data uh, gathered through surveys, analytics, etc., we can sort of plot out what an ideal user of our product looks like, how they interact with the app, and ensure that the majority of our user base is going to be happy with the features that we provide in a streamlined, in as streamlined as a manner as possible. Ultimately, that's what UX is trying to achieve, and it's all about just making your product easier and more intuitive to utilize for your user base. And I can tell you now, 100% WordPress is not going to be able to do that for you. That is far too complex, and that's where you come in. Connor, just before I let you go, where can we find Ascension Cloud Solutions? Yeah, sure. So we're uh, right now we're on our social media accounts for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we can, you can also visit us on our website at ascensioncloudsolutions.com. Wonderful stuff. Well, Connor, great to chat today. Hopefully, we can catch up soon to dive a little bit more into Ascension. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. That's Connor Goldberg, the Managing Director of Ascension Cloud Solutions. And if you missed any part of that chat or you'd like to browse our extensive catalogue of expert talks, simply head across to our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. That's all for this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, this is Sage. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. Today's special guest is Mr. Andrew McConville, the CEO of the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association. UK, Europe and the US are seeing significant increases in their energy prices and Australia is one of the major exporters of liquid natural gas. How will the energy crunch being experienced in the Northern Hemisphere affect Australian liquid natural gas supply and prices? Well, today's expert will share some insights from running an Australian organisation whose vision is energy for a better Australia and whose aim is to be the effective voice of the oil and gas industry on the issues that matter working collaboratively with the industry and the community. So we bring to you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market. So today we're very lucky to share some space with Mr. Andrew McConville, CEO of the Australian Petroleum Production Exploration Association, or APPEA. It's a pleasure to meet you, Andrew. Thanks, Sage. Very, very good to be here. Thank you. Thanks for making time for Kalkine TV. Now, the commodities have been catching the investors' attention with the rally in the prices of crude oil and other metals. Could you explain APPEA's role in the Australian commodity sector, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, APIA does represent the upstream oil and gas sector, so explorers and producers. And you know, what I really want to stress here is 
the size and significance of the Australian oil and gas industry. We represent about 3% of GDP and about 11% uh, of Australia's total exports. We employ about 80,000 people and, and many, many hundreds of thousands more through the value chain that depend uh, on oil and gas. And I mean, just recently, we did some work where we looked at uh, the scope of the opportunity uh, that's before the industry. And we did some work with EY. And if we can get the growth settings right, we see an extra $350 billion worth of investment opportunity in the industry and about another 220,000 jobs. And certainly when we look at the profile of demand uh, for particularly LNG, Australian LNG, um, out to 2040, it's, it's very, very solid. Uh, demand for liquefied natural gas in Asia will increase by about 52% between now and 2040. So there's a wonderful opportunity here for Australia to play a major role and continue to deliver benefit to our economy, but also to those economies to the north of us. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. So they're so valuable working so closely in the space. And for the lay people that don't really have access to those stats, so thanks for that. And as the world fights the harmful effects of climate change through carbon emissions, LNG has come into the spotlight. How is Australia's supply of LNG placed for future demands, please? Yeah, look, we are very well placed. I mean, I think the first and most important point to make is that we as an industry and we as an association absolutely support the science of climate change and, you know, putting in place those policies that are going to deliver net zero uh, by 2050. In terms of our industry, uh, the, the growth opportunity to the north, as I said before, the increase in demand of, of around 52%. Uh, we see short-term uh, increases in demand across the world of about 8% between now and, and 2025. And liquefied natural gas plays a really important role um, in firming up uh, an electricity system as it shifts to a greater uptake of renewables. So for example, here in Australia, and then uh, particularly in the Asian economies, as they switch from coal to gas, um, what we see is that uh, using natural gas in the electricity system, natural gas has about half uh, the carbon emissions of, of coal. And even here in Australia, we see that the overall emissions profile of uh, natural gas, when we look across the entire energy grid, is lower um, than the average emissions uh, profile um, of, of the grid. So it's a very, very effective tool. And the Australian government has, has estimated that you know, the use of natural gas could result in emissions reduction of about 170 million metric tonnes if uh, countries were to switch to, to using natural gas. And I think what we have to understand is that as we look to the transition of, of energy, if you like, and as we look to how we move towards net zero uh, by 2050, we have to make sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Last year, um, you know, 83 per cent of the world's energy came from hydrocarbons, uh, which includes natural gas. So we need to look at ways in which we can help decarbonise uh, hydrocarbons, decarbonise natural gas, whilst maintaining um, energy security. And, you know, I think that's the real opportunity for Australia as we think through what's Australia's role. We can help with uh, the transition uh, to, to greater renewables. We can help with the decarbonising of natural gas through techniques like carbon capture and storage. Uh, and, and the industry is extraordinarily well placed um, to support the development of a hydrogen industry as well. So, you know, for Australia being so geographically well located to Asia where the population growth is, with our vast natural resources, our ability to decarbonise natural gas, I think we have a wonderful opportunity uh, to help in that transition uh, and to continue to supply into that into that market. And you, know, you mentioned there about prices. Well, one of the best ways to keep downward pressure on prices is to continue to ensure supply. And last year, Australia exported around $50 billion worth of natural gas to Asia. And, and you know, that will certainly continue if we can get the policy settings right to continue the development of the resource. So thank you so much for sharing your insights there. The UK and the US are experiencing an energy crunch at the moment in regards to the LNG prices. How does Australia's gas code of conduct come into play here? Do you think Australia will follow suit and will we see a surge in the prices of energy as well? Well, look, we're not, we're not seeing that at the moment. And, and in fact, when you look at uh, Australian gas prices compared to gas prices across Asia, you know, we are lower than uh, all of our major 
um, what's called manufacturing competitor uh, countries. And there is at, at the present point in time a significant gap between the price we're seeing in Asia, which is you know quite high, and, and where we are in Australia. And, and you know the code of conduct itself is, is the code of conduct is not about pricing. That's about ensuring that. Um, you know, the, the way in which participants behave in the marketplace is, is transparent uh, and effective and efficient. That's not about pricing. You know, what, if we want to talk about pricing, the best response to, to keeping downward pressure on prices here in Australia is to get more supply into the market. That's, that's simple economics. You know, if, if, if you have demand, you increase supply, your, your price will come down. And, and that's where we really need uh, to focus on and making sure that we have you know, a very deep and liquid market here in Australia. So work around the development of the Wollongbilla hub, uh, which the government is committed to doing. I think that's very, very important. It's about ensuring transparency and, and the ACCC uh, has just completed its work around the transparency in the marketplace. And what we wanna see is uh, policies from government that continue to encourage exploration so that gas can come into the market. That's what's going to keep the pressure on prices uh, and, and keep that downward pressure on prices. So, for example, the development of the Narrabri opportunity, the lifting of moratoriums in Victoria, the development of the Beedaloo Basin in, in the Northern Territory. These are the things that will keep the downward pressure on, on price. You know, it never works to have uh, governments try and regulate a price outcome in the market. Let the market work, get the supply into the market. That will get you the right price outcome. It sounds like Australia is definitely in a well, is well positioned to make a good use of those opportunities that are coming our way, hopefully, with expansion of the renewable space and how liquid natural gas will play a part in that. And it's exciting news about the development of the underwater pipeline to mine liquid natural gas from WA's offshore Scarborough gas field and to be transferred to Woodside's Pluto LNG facility beginning from 2023. How resilient do you believe is WA's nearshore gas mining facilities to continue despite danger to certain protected marine species? Yeah, look, the, the, the natural gas industry and, and, and the oil industry has been working closely, uh, you know, with the fishing community and, and the marine community for more than 60 years. You know, we are very well practiced at, at, at being able to, to, to coexist. And, you know, what we can be very confident of here in Australia is that we have a world-class regulator in Nopsema. We have one of the best and most rigorous uh, regulatory regimes, environmental regulatory regimes in the world. And, you know, what we've seen over the last 50 to 60 years is that the industries can uh, coexist. And I think we can have every confidence that we are able to access the significant resources that we have on the Northwest Shelf, for example, being able to, to coexist. I mean, you know, if you look at uh, the, the, the King Reef project um, off the Northwest Shelf, we it's, a, it's a fabulous example of um, you know, a, a reef being able to you know, essentially exist with, uh, with, with the oil and gas industry. And you know, right through the process from development of the resource, life cycle of the resource, decommissioning of the resource, you know, we are uh, absolutely committed to ensuring uh, that we can that we can coexist. And our record and performance to date would certainly underscore that. You know, whether it be on the northwest shelf, whether it be uh, off the shore in Darwin, whether it be in the Bass Strait. The industry has an enviable record of being able to extract what is a wonderful resource for Australia and the world, but being able to coexist safely uh, with, with the fishing community, with the marines community, to make sure that we can both uh, benefit from uh, the wonderful resources that we have in Australia. So we can be really confident with the frameworks we have in place that uh, both can happen. Yes, Australia does have a beautiful coastline. It would be great to keep it looking that way. But I think the new technologies that have developed as well in rehabilitation and sustaining uh, the natural environment through mining uh, infrastructure has improved and hopefully it will continue. Um, so green hydrogen is pulsing these days and is an emerging renewable resource that is gaining a lot of attention. How will the mining of liquid natural gas in Australia play a role in the production of green and blue hydrogen, please? Yeah, well, look, I mean, you know, Australia is, is, is wonderfully placed with the, the existing technology we have to be a, a world leader in the production um, of hydrogen. And in particular, if you look at there was some recent research by, by Energy Quest, and they pointed to actually the real opportunity for Australia and the real growth opportunity um, 
is is hydrogen from from natural gas. That's you know the the most economically sensible equation and the most efficient and effective means. So when you couple, for example, the production of blue hydrogen with with carbon capture and storage to offset the emissions, you know you, you have a very economically attractive uh, product. And our industry, you know, our business is producing, storing, and 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 moving moving natural moving natural gas and you know, hydrogen is a gas so the processes and the systems are, are very very similar and uh, you know natural gas uh, and, and, and its conversion into blue hydrogen is uh, a, you know, a well known well understood process uh, it allows us to get scale one of the challenges with with production of green hydrogen, at least in the short to near term, um, is scale. Whereas we can produce uh, blue hydrogen uh, at scale uh, now, and that will give us a wonderful opportunity to then move that product um, into the very energy hungry markets of, of Asia. And our industry, we believe, with our expertise in, in producing gas, uh, storing gas, moving gas, in uh, carbon capture and storage, which helps offset the emissions from the production process, those two things combined are the real opportunity. And if you look at some recent work by the International Energy Agency, they looked out to 2050, and um, you know their view was that by by 2040, 2050, you know the world will be producing around uh, you know 568 million tonnes of hydrogen, uh, coupled with carbon capture and storage, and and that's. That's Australia's sweet spot. That's that's what we, we we can do, and that's what we're focused on. So we see that that's where the real opportunity is. Yes, there will be a place and a and a and a an avenue for green hydrogen. But when we talk about hydrogen at scale and playing to Australia's natural advantages, where the real opportunity is is in the production of blue hydrogen combined with CCS. Looking at our geographical proximity to Asia. You put those three things together, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for our industry for, for future growth. Thank you so much for sharing those valuable insights, Andrew. That's fantastic because it's such a new technology, a new resource that um, I'm sure the viewers are keen to hear more about it. And Australia is an oil producer ranking about 31st in the world. Why do Australian refineries continue to import oil from the Asian reserves? Could you help us understand this a bit better? And how do the global oil supply and processing levels impact Australia's ability to profit from oil exports? Does this affect the price of the crude oil as well? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, again, it's a it's a question of, of supply. You know, there, there was a point in history where Australia was producing about 86 um, percent of its of its oil needs. Um, but, you know, when you go out and you explore for oil and gas and sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. And, and, and the simple reality of the economics of producing oil at the moment, so finding and producing oil are simply not attractive uh, for Australia. It just makes more economic sense to um, be importing oil from countries like Malaysia, um, where it's processed in Singapore uh, and then shipped and, and stored here. You've also got the cost of, of refining. And you know, unfortunately, Australia is quite a high cost uh, environment in which to conduct that sort of work. So the um, you know, producing and refining of, of oil, it makes more economic sense for it to be uh, imported. And, and you know, we've seen that with uh, the closure of a number of, of, of oil refineries. And, and what we've seen over the last 30 years is that we've been able to produce much more uh, natural gas, both offshore and onshore, but we haven't been in a position to, to find and produce as much oil and hence the shift to, to bringing that in from, from overseas. In terms of the impact of oil uh, on the marketplace, I mean, yes, we do see a global market both uh, in gas and, and the price of oil in Australia, that is very much linked uh, to to global prices. Brent crude, for example, uh, has a has a major impact on the price of oil here in Australia, and and it is the case that a lot of our uh, gas contracts are also oil linked contracts. So the two are are very very much linked together, very symbiotic. Um, but the question around why aren't we producing and refining oil uh, here in Australia is one of supply. We don't have as much oil as we used to in terms of production and economics. You know, the amount that we have versus being able to import it already refined makes more economic sense than importing a raw crude product and, and refining it here. And I think that's a reflection of you know, it is challenging to uh, undertake some industries in Australia that have uh, particularly high labour component costs um, that require large scale capital investment that you know, might be able to be done elsewhere. So it's about comparative advantage. And at the moment, uh, you know, the, the comparative advantage for Australia is in 
the exploration of natural gas, production of natural gas, um, liquefying that and exporting it overseas. The economics of oil for Australia uh, don't stack up from a production point of view at the moment, and hence you see um, that importation you know, happening. That doesn't mean, and I should stress this point, that we are in any way you know, insecure for oil. We have in place long-term agreements that ensure the security of oil in Australia. We have you know, extensive storage. We have relationships with uh, countries in Asia, with the United States, to ensure uh, Australia's oil security. So we shouldn't be worried about that. It's just we have a different, a different plan in place now, if you like, compared to, say, 20 years ago when we were almost self-sufficient in oil production. Right, that's very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing the insights there. And we're reaching the end of the discussion now. And you did mention a little bit about the potential for job creation in the liquid natural gas uh, industry a bit earlier in the discussion. And the oil and gas industry, from some statistics I came across recently, produces close to 80,000 jobs for Australians, directly and indirectly. Do you believe this will be sustained into the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the demand profile for, for natural gas and the growth of population in Asia, as I mentioned before, you know, demand for natural gas is forecast to increase by 52% between now and 2040. Between now and 2025, um, you know, production of uh, natural gas in Australia is forecast to increase from 108 billion cubic metres to 125 billion cubic metres. So you've got this production and demand profile. And uh, you know, we, we did some, some work recently with EY where we said, okay, if we can get all of the policy conditions right to support growth, so we get investment, we get exploration. In fact, what we, what we will see is you know, another $350 billion of investment and up to 220,000 jobs could still be generated um, in the industry. We look back the last decade, $450 billion uh, of investment. Right now in the pipeline, we have uh, you know, upwards of $130 billion of projects uh, you know, waiting to go. So when you look at demand, you look at investment, you look at the growth opportunities for Australia, the fact that we're blessed with an enormous supply of natural gas, I think the opportunities are you know, absolutely world class and outstanding. And, you know, we should see growth of that 80,000 jobs to a, you know, 150, 200,000 job scenario over the next you know, 10 to 20 years. And they are good jobs. They are high paying jobs. You know, it's almost double the national wage average for a job in the oil and gas industry. They're highly technical. They're using world class science. I mean, it is absolutely a very, very exciting opportunity for Australia and for anyone who wants to get in the industry. So I have absolutely no doubt um, that we will go from strength to strength and uh, you know, create new opportunities and continue to grow that 80,000 into something bigger. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's a very exciting space, as you say, at the moment with the emerging of new resources. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of training and development for people who are interested in the space if they get into mm -hmm. it now. So thanks so much for your time, Andrew. That discussion was very, very valuable. And viewers, if you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion about Australia's position in natural resources and the production and exploration of liquid natural gas here in Australia. And that was with Mr. Andrew McConville, the CEO of the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association. The full recorded interview will be available from the, the YouTube channel, Kalkine Media, in the next couple of days. And thanks for your time, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine.
So the question on everyone's lips, can Monero breach the $300 level by the year end? Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. Now, Monero is an open source, decentralized cryptocurrency that uses privacy enhancing technologies and aims to provide protection to all users and secures transaction amounts, addresses balances and transaction histories. It has proven to be a resilient crypto so far. Developed back in 2014, Monero uses ring signatures, zero knowledge proofs and stealth addresses to disguise the transaction details. I'll talk more on this later. It was Monero's underlying technology that attracted many investors to its platform as it keeps the identity of senders and recipients anonymous. You could compare Monero with other cryptos in the same category, such as Zcash. Monero is governed by its token XMR and is ranked 35th on CoinMarketCap. XMR has seen a bullish rally of late, especially after launching four privacy coins. So what makes Monero special? Well, Monero's framework was designed to keep traders privacy and its underlying technology makes it one of the most secure coins in the crypto market. Monero's ring signature system mixes the digital signature of the sender along with signatures of other users, which keeps the name of the real sender hidden. XMR's ring CT technology keeps the value of the transaction hidden thereby giving its exceptional security feature to traders. Monero is considered to be a truly fungible token and as a truly fungible cryptocurrency, Monero grants a trader an extra layer of privacy and is limitless in nature. Also, Monero doesn't possess a preset block size limit, thereby giving the investors and traders an ideal opportunity to participate in the activity within the blockchain. Being highly scalable, it's often considered to be one crypto that is able to accommodate a surge of growth. The recently launched Atomic Swap feature allows the users to swap Monero for Bitcoin seamlessly without the need for a broker to do the dealing. Through the Atomic Swap, the users are also able to hide details within the Bitcoin's ledger, thereby giving it an all-round security feature. So in conclusion, many experts believe that due to its ability to hide the transaction details, Monero comes across as a great coin to invest in. The recent bursts have definitely held the coin and it's expected to reach $280 to $300 US mark by the end of this year. Experts predict that the coin has potential to reach $500 US dollars by 2025. And this bullish run would surely give them hopes for a coin that not only gives good returns, but also ensures that the security of the transaction as well. Now, if you liked this video, please like, share and comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. For regular updates and more information, log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel, signing off for Calkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the Crypto Buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon and you'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. 
I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for joining us on our trending topic. Today we're bringing to you five best DeFi cryptos that could gain popularity in the fourth quarter of 2021. We're about to enter the fourth quarter of this year and despite some ups and downs in 2021, one sector that stood out this year was the decentralized finance or DeFi sector. And the DeFi industry caught the major attention in the second half of 2020. And ever since then, it has captured millions of users looking for innovative financial services in a decentralized context. Now, the DeFi industry reportedly has 100 billion US dollars locked in various blockchain protocols that offer decentralized financial services. Even the blockchain-based gaming and non-fungible tokens or NFTs are under the DeFi infrastructure and the rise in these two spaces is contributing to this sector's growth. Before we progress to the fourth quarter of 2021, let's take a look at the top five DeFi projects. Synthetics. It is a liquidity protocol for derivatives and acts as a backbone for derivatives trading in a decentralized finance infrastructure. The Synthetix protocol is based on the Ethereum blockchain and allows users to make synthetic representations of real-world assets as tokens. The tokens minted as synthetic representations can be pegged to the value of the asset. REN This open protocol allows its users to access inter-blockchain liquidity for decentralized applications. And this means that the users of the REN protocol can transfer all kinds of tokens between any blockchain and it does not create synthetic or wrapped tokens in the process. REN can transfer liquidity to any ecosystem with existing smart contracts and does not need synthetic representations. Maker. One of the earliest DeFi projects the Maker ecosystem was started with a vision to build a variety of decentralized financial products on blockchains that are smart contract enabled. This project is based on the Ethereum blockchain and it comprises a decentralized organization called Maker DAO and also Maker Protocol a software platform to enable users to issue and manage a stablecoin named DAI. Chainlink. This decentralized blockchain oracle network was built on the Ethereum blockchain by a community of researchers, developers and users for the public good and benefit of the blockchain ecosystem. And many decentralized applications need oracles to interact with a wide variety of data. And Chainlink is believed to be one of the leading providers of oracles. Phantom. This blockchain platform is highly scalable for DeFi or decentralized and enterprise applications. It aims to solve problems associated with smart contract platforms and helps in increasing the transaction speed. The native FTM token of this platform acts as a backbone for transactions and allows staking activities and fee collection. The FTM token is based on the proof of staking concept and it can be used for user rewards as well. The bottom line. Decentralized financial services are expected to rival and perhaps beat traditional financial services in the future. DeFi services don't require a need for an intermediary and that could be a reason why people will likely prefer DeFi projects in the future. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. But for more information, regular updates, head to the website calcinemedia.com. Sage here for Calcine Media. Hi, I'm
I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. The DeFi industry reportedly has 100 billion US dollars locked in various blockchain protocols that offer decentralized financial services like lending, staking, or borrowing. Even the blockchain based gaming and NFTs are under the DeFi infrastructure, and the rise in these two spaces is contributing to the sector's growth. So before we progress to the fourth quarter of this financial year, let's have a look at the top five DeFi projects to keep an eye on in this period. Before we get into it though, please give our channel a sub and hit that bell icon to stay ahead of the game. First up is Synthetics. It's a liquidity protocol for derivatives and acts as a backbone for derivatives trading in a decentralized finance infrastructure. The Synthetics protocol is based on the Ethereum blockchain and allows users to make synthetic representations of real-world assets as tokens. The tokens minted as synthetic representations can be pegged into the value of the asset. Priced at 10.84 US per token, SNX has surged by 153% in the last 12 months. Its circulating supply is just over 174 million tokens. Secondly, REN. This open protocol allows its users to access inter-blockchain liquidity for decentralized applications. This means that the users of REN protocol can transfer all kinds of tokens between any blockchain and it does not create synthetic or wrapped tokens in the process. REN can transfer liquidity to any ecosystem with existing smart contracts and does not need synthetic representations. Based on the data from CoinMarketCap, the REN token has a market cap of 796.3 million US dollars. Next up is Maker. One of the earliest DeFi projects, the Maker ecosystem was started with a vision to build a variety of decentralized financial products on blockchains that are smart contract enabled. This project is based on the Ethereum blockchain and it comprises a decentralized organization called Maker DAO and also Maker Protocol, a software platform to enable users to issue and manage a stable coin named DAI. MKR is the governance token of MakerDAO and Maker Protocol. It has a circulating supply of just over 900,000 tokens, and the max supply is just over 1 million MKR tokens. Chainlink. This decentralized blockchain oracle network was built on the Ethereum blockchain by a community of researchers, developers, and users for the public good and benefit of the blockchain ecosystem. Notably, oracles are decentralized data feed services on the blockchain. Many decentralized applications need oracles to interact with wide varieties of data and Chainlink is believed to be one of the leading providers of oracles. The native token of this protocol is Link and it powers the decentralized oracle network. Number five is Phantom. This blockchain platform is highly scalable for DeFi, decentralized, and enterprise applications. It aims to solve problems associated with smart contract platforms and helps in the increasing of transaction speeds. The native FTM token of this platform acts as a backbone for transactions and allows staking activities and fee collection. 
FCM tokens are based on the proof of staking concept and they can be used for user rewards as well. This token has surged by over 2,500 in the past year as of Thursday, the 23rd of September. The bottom line is that decentralized financial services are expected to rival and perhaps beat traditional financial services in the future. DeFi services don't require a need for any intermediary and could be a reason why people will likely prefer DeFi projects in the future. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. And if you like this info, please give us a like, share and a comment and head to our website at calcimedia.com. This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. everyone, I'm Rachel and you're watching Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Christopher Clark. Christopher is the CEO and Executive Director at Delta Drone International in Adelaide. Delta Drone is a multinational drones as a service business. Here at Calkine we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. A very warm welcome to you today, Christopher. Good morning, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Good to speak with you today. Now, firstly, could you just explain which businesses utilize your drones the most? So, so Rachel, we, um, we, we did a merger with uh, Paris, a listed uh, company called Parazer early on in this year. Um, and predominantly, this, uh, the strategy was really to, to tackle the Australian market and more specifically the mining and agricultural sectors using drones as a service. So we're really seeing the, the sort of mature uptake of drones and, and drones as a service within these industries, which is really creating some exciting opportunities for our investors. And I also believe you acquired 60% of the shares in our Vista, Perth-based provider of aerial and terrestrial surveying services. So congratulations on that. That's now your company's subsidiary. How is that merger instrumental to Delta Drone's growth strategy? So Rachel, I guess as, as part of, you know, with our, our, our new focus being on the Australian market, you know, we really wanted to accelerate our, our growth locally. And uh, we're really, really um, sort of uh, lucky and, and really great to, to have met up with uh, the Arvista team. Um, a really sort of a great bunch of, of guys that, um, that were really were going the same direction as, as what we were doing. And uh, it really was sort of a conversation of, of you know, let's do this together. Let's, uh, let's bring some of the, the learnings that what we've achieved and learned over in the African market, such as beyond visual line of sight flying. And uh, how do we incorporate it back into the, the Australian market and, uh, and really yeah, accelerate the, uh, the opportunities? Excellent. And we understand that the transaction will significantly expand your reach and penetration throughout Australia, specifically in the enterprise mining and agricultural sectors. Now, why do you believe these sectors are currently showing the most potential for your industry? Well, if you look at the uh, the drone market as a whole, it's it's currently uh, a, a sort of a, sort of turning over close to nearly a billion Australian dollars, um, and that's the opportunity that lies in in professional drone services locally. 
and the mining sector you know really takes up about many about 25 percent of that and uh, we really believe by you know generally when you look at drones and, and people think about drones there, there's so many opportunities and it's really about picking that niche and, and focusing on on a particular one or two sectors and uh, really meeting the customers um, sort of head on and, and, and solving their, their end problems. Um, you know, actually at the end of the day, what we generally are finding, especially in the mining sector, is that customers don't actually want to buy or operate drones because, you know, they, they operate within a highly regulated space. But actually at the end of the day, the customers are actually looking for a data product. You know, are they calculating volumes? Are they detecting cracks in high walls? So, so these are the things that we're, we're offering our customers saying, you know, you don't really want to fly on drones and, and spend your days out in the sun. You know, we'd rather give that over to us and we'll, uh, we'll manage the, uh, all the compliance and all the maintenance and, and take away all your headaches. Now, obviously, safety is always a big issue when you're talking about drones. And you've been conducting beyond visual line of sight flight trials with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. And Delta Drone's ability to fly drones safely over people with the patented ParaZero safety systems is obviously very commendable. Can you tell us why this type of technology will catapult the drone industry into its next era? Yeah, yeah. so this is probably one of the, the, the biggest reasons for the original um, merger. So uh, originally it's Delta Drone South Africa. Um, you know, we uh, sort of fo focused a lot on the service provisions and, and flying these beyond visual line of sight. And really, when we, we did the merger with ParaZero, who's got this incredible safety technology product that allows flights over people, um, it enables or unlocks the opportunities to then conduct drone flights in, in the urban space. So, you know, sort of combining our experience in, in beyond visual line of sight in rural with the ParaZero technology now uh, really opens up the opportunities, which you're seeing from the likes of Google Wing, um, you know, conducting these flights in, in, in Canberra as well, doing home deliveries using drones. You know, we're, we're really going to see just only more of those sort of service provisions coming to the market. But it's all about how do they get done safely and, uh, and confidently to, uh, to allow them to happen. Absolutely. And drone technology has truly matured in terms of its functionality as a cost effective and a highly sophisticated platform. What have been the significant developments in drone technology, you believe, in recent times? So we're really looking at the, not only, um, I guess, sort of, sort of socially and commercially, the, the maturity of the drone industry. I think we, um, we're almost finding drones are becoming as reliable as, as what aircraft are, are being. Um, and the more reliable aircraft can be, the more accepting and the more sort of complex environments that we can introduce them into. So you're not only seeing drones sort of becoming more autonomous and going underground, but drones are also being able to become more autonomous above ground and complete really uh, dangerous tasks we, we're now removing people from from uh, I mean high risky environments and uh, and it's how we combine not only the drone hardware but other sort of uh, applications such as um, AI or artificial intelligence um, to really um, remove those people from those dangerous areas and perform these tasks safely as well so so it's really sort of a combination of, of everything coming together and what are your thoughts on drones being used for nefarious reasons, such as potentially maybe in warfare or uh, spying between countries? How do certain incidents like this impact the drone industry? Yeah, Rachel, it's definitely certainly a concern. And uh, I guess a drone is, is like any other tool. It can be used, I guess, for the power of good or for the power of evil. And uh, and it's all in those who control who have the control. So. I think, you know, what we're going to start finding is, uh, is, is corporate Australia sort of really bringing drones. If you're operating within that, those sort of spaces, within the oil and gas and the mining sectors, you, you're bringing drones within to your risk management frameworks and, uh, and really deciding how, you know, how do you mitigate and how do you d determine friendly versus foe. So it, it again, only creates another opportunity for technology companies and, and defense uh, sort of specialists to, to get involved and, um, and, uh, and help identify and th those are the situations. Absolutely. And Delta Drone recently entered three new markets, Namibia, Zambia and Australia. Are there further expansion plans in the pipeline you'd like to talk about? So Rachel, I guess we're quite an entrepreneurial still kind of business, even though I mean, we're listed. We've, we've got about over 100, 100 people employed, um, you know, just uh, sort of released our half year uh, sort of financials at about uh, 2.5 million in revenue. 
And um, I, I think for us, it's really about growing organically with our customers. You know, we're all our big, all our customers are, are large multinationals, you know, such as the South 32s, the Anglo Americans, the Nuance, and the Syngentas of this world. And when they ask, uh, uh, you know, when they ask uh, us to, to sort of come into these new regions with them, you know, we, uh, we really want to grow with them and, and provide them the same quality of service that we're doing in, in our current jurisdictions. So for us, it's, it's pure organic growth and, uh, and you know, we, we, we'd like to run our business nice, sort of lean and mean, but uh, at the same time, uh, make sure that we're delivering uh, customer value. Absolutely. Well, best of luck for the future. It definitely sounds like it's a fantastic space to be in. It was great to chat with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch the space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Today we're bringing you a topic, 10 tips for buying your first house. In Australia, homes are sold through private sale or via auction. And in a private sale, a buyer can purchase a house at a price negotiated with the vendor. It is negotiated through a real estate agent. In the auction, a buyer can purchase a property by bidding against others in an open forum. If one is planning to buy a property, he or she should be aware of a few steps which can be helpful while purchasing for the first time. Inspection of the property. Before you place a bid or make an offer for a property, one must first inspect the property. And for this, one can get this inspected by property or pest inspections. Seek help to buy a property. It is also possible to appoint a buyer's advocate who would assist in finding and securing a property. Sort any previous debt. This may sound obvious, but the borrower may not get the required loan if he or she has some previous debt. In such a situation, the borrower pays large and unsecured debt before applying for the loan amount. Arrange your funds. Buying a house requires a huge deal of money, and hence one must handle the finances well before making an offer or bidding at auction. And generally, the deposit is 10% of the property price and is paid when the offer is accepted or the bid is successful. Borrowing of money. There are multiple ways through which one can buy property. It comprises major banks, mortgage brokers, credit unions, building societies and specialist home loan lenders. Know about additional costs involved. These are conveyance and legal fees, stamp duty, building and pest inspections, mortgage registration and transfer fees, loan application fees, mortgage insurance, council and utility rates, and home and contents insurance. Prepare yourself to get your dream house. Prepare yourself with all that's required, including paperwork, deposit and pre-approvals beforehand then the chances of getting the house 
would be in your favour in the situation where there is another buyer. Home and content insurance. Many people in places like Melbourne, Australia, take out insurance cover for their homes and belongings. And for this, buyers look for different companies providing insurance products. Connecting your utilities. Before moving into the new house, one must connect the utility facilities like gas, water, electricity, telephone, and the internet. Temporary resident rules and regulations. Now, if a person is a temporary resident, then he or she should notify the Foreign Investment Review Board of the plan to purchase the property. On the other hand, the person with a permanent visa does not need any approval to purchase a house or establish dwelling for investment reasons. Thanks for joining us on that report and hopefully you found it informative. If you do like the information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. But for more information, regular updates, head to the website, kalkinemedia.com. Stay tuned for Kalkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Crypto is going mainstream with an ETF set to launch on the ASX this week. I'm James Preston and thanks for tuning in to Kalkine TV for a special edition of the Buzzing Trends focused on the Better Shares Crypto Inv Innovators ETF or CRIP. CRIP will be the first crypto themed ETF and will be launched on the ASX this coming Thursday. It will aim to track the Bitwise Crypto Industry Innovators 30 index before fees and expenses. Current index constituents include cryptocurrency exchange platform Coinbase, Bitcoin mining company Riot Blockchain, and business intelligence firm MicroStrategy. The race to become the first crypto ETF on the ASX has been a marathon and not a sprint, but the inclusion of the new ETF still comes as a surprise to many crypto investors and experts who believe that there would not be a crypto-themed ETF listed on the ASX until at least 2022. Just last week, crypto investors were showing enthusiasm about the new Cosmos ETF, which had been billed as the closest thing to a crypto ETF. This ETF, however, tracks crypto mining companies rather than the performance of cryptocurrencies themselves, so it's not a direct crypto ETF. So what exactly is the BetaShares ETF? An ETF is a fund that tracks the performance of various other shares and commodities that have been pulled together. Similarly, a crypto ETF tracks the performance of various cryptocurrencies. It's essentially the closest thing to investing in Bitcoin on a regulated platform. And so, the BetaShares Crypto Innovators ETF will aim to track the Bitwise Crypto Industry Innovators 30 index before fees and expenses are taken into account. Bitwise is one of the largest global crypto asset managers. CRIP provides investors with access to a portfolio of global companies at the forefront of the rapidly emerging crypto space. CRIP's index is designed to capture the full breadth of the vast crypto space by providing exposure to those crypto companies whose balance sheets have at least 75% in crypto assets. Current index constituents include cryptocurrency exchange platform Coinbase, Bitcoin mining company Riot Blockchain and business intelligence firm MicroStrategy. It's being viewed as an excellent entry point for new investors or more traditional investors who may be risk adverse. The ETF in theory should provide for significantly lower volatility. 
It is important to note though that one doesn't buy individual ETFs, instead investors buy ETF units, similar to company shares. These ETF units can be purchased in the same manner that one would purchase shares, that is, through a broker or online share trading platform. Some of these platforms include eToro, IG Share Trading and also Bell Direct. The introduction of Crip is an exciting inclusion to the ASX. This will allow investors to participate in the quickly growing cryptocurrency space while being protected by stock market regulations otherwise not found on current crypto exchanges. The introduction of BetaShares Crypto Innovators ETF is an exciting inclusion to the ASX that will allow inv investors to participate in the quickly growing cryptocurrency space while being protected by stock market regulations otherwise not found on current cryptocurrency exchanges. Furthermore, it provides further legitimacy to an ever burgeoning space. Well, that's all for now. We'll be back soon with our hot performance program to share the latest market insights with you. Until then, stay tuned with Calkine TV for more stock, business and economy related hot trends. I'm James, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. Employment hero Koala and Mr. Yum are some of the popular names that have found mention in LinkedIn's list of the best 25 Aussie startups to work in for Australia. The fourth annual LinkedIn Top Startups list includes 25 emerging companies where Australians want to work now, especially during the coronavirus pandemic accelerated digital transformation. The companies on this list are at least seven years old and have at least 50 employees. They're privately held and headquartered in Australia. So that said, here are Australia's top five startups to work in for 2021. But before we get into it, please give our channel a sub and hit that bell icon to stay ahead of the game. First on our list is the investment management Sayers. Sayers was founded in 2020 by a team of talented and passionate professionals and was backed by Australian and US private capital. The second company on our list is Human Resources Space, Employment Hero. Employment Hero is an automated human resources, payroll and benefits platform for SMEs. Third on our list is the retail company Koala. 
Mattress and furniture retailer only designs products that suit the lifestyle of its customers and do wonders for the planet. Fourth is the digital menu provider company, Mr. Yum. It's a web-based mobile menu ordering and payment platform used by Australia's leading hospitality and entertainment venues for dine-in, pickup, and delivery. Fifth is the online health startup, Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is a healthcare technology company building digital experiences for patients. The survey looked at the LinkedIn data across four pillars, that is employee growth, job seek interest, member engagement with the company and its employees, and how well these startups pull talent from the LinkedIn top companies list. While startups may be a good place to work, even though as many as 90% of them fail, since they help employees gain experience and key skills. Due to these reasons, startups have gained more acceptance by employees in the recent years. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. For regular updates, head to our website at calcomedia.com and give this channel a sub if you like this info. This has been Holly Shields for Calco Media. everyone, I hope you guys are staying safe and keeping well. This is Rose Jacobs straight from Calkine Studio and you're watching Go Green with Calkine. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought devastation to millions around the world, disrupting many parts of the global economy. Governments and philanthropists have stepped up to protect lives and livelihoods. But climate change has continued and it ultimately threatens life on Earth. As countries begin to recover from the pandemic, we must seize any opportunity to tackle climate change. A major prospect is around the corner with the UK in partnership with Italy hosting the UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties in Glasgow between 31st October and 12th of November. Let's learn about what this conference is all about and why it's important this time. The COP26 Summit aims to bring parties together to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. In light of the worldwide effects of COVID-19, the associated parties had decided to reschedule the conference, which was initially slated for November last year. Rescheduling the conference ensures that all parties focus on the issues to be discussed at this vital conference and gives more time for the necessary preparations to take place. More than 190 world leaders will participate, along with tens of thousands of negotiators, government representatives, businesses and citizens for 12 days of talks. One of the reasons that the UK is determined to hold COP26 in person is to ensure that the world hears the issues of less developed countries and subsequent actions are taken. Let's now understand the key narratives to the UK and the participants. Firstly, countries are being asked to come forward with ambitious 2030 emission reduction targets and those that align with reaching net zero by the middle of the century. Secondly, countries most affected by climate change are being encouraged to protect and restore ecosystems, build defences, put warning systems in place and make infrastructure and agriculture more resilient to avoid loss of homes, livelihoods and lives. The conference also emphasises that international financial institutions must play their part and mobilise finance. Lastly, the conference might finalise the Paris rule book that will define the rules needed to implement the Paris Agreement. Well, securing a brighter future for generations to come requires countries to take urgent action to turn the tide on climate change. 
It is with ambition, courage and collaboration like the conference that we can recover cleaner, rebuild greener and restore our planet. On that note, I'm Rose Jacobs signing off. I'll see you in the next episode of Go Green with Calkine. Until then, stay safe. And if you like this video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it? how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Crypto is going mainstream with an ETF set to launch on the ASX this week. I'm James Preston and thanks for tuning in to Calkine TV for a special edition of the Buzzing Trends focused on the BetaShares Crypto Innovators ETF or CRIP. CRIP will be the first crypto themed ETF and will be launched on the ASX this coming Thursday. The race to become the first crypto ETF on the ASX has been a marathon and not a sprint. But the inclusion of the new ETF still comes as a surprise to many crypto investors and experts who believe there wouldn't be a crypto-themed ETF listed on the ASX until at least 2022. Just last week, crypto investors were showing enthusiasm about the new Cosmos ETF, which has been billed as the closest thing to a crypto ETF. This ETF, however, tracks crypto mining companies rather than the performance of cryptocurrencies themselves, so it's not a direct crypto ETF. For the uninitiated, an ETF is a fund that tracks the performance of various other shares and commodities that have been pulled together. Similarly, a crypto ETF tracks the performances of various cryptocurrencies. It's the closest thing to investing in Bitcoin on a regulated platform, and so the BetaShares Crypto Innovators ETF will aim to track the Bitwise Crypto Industry Innovators 30 index before fees and expenses. Now the current index constituents include cryptocurrency exchange platform Coinbase, also Bitcoin mining company Riot Blockchain, and business intelligence firm MicroStrategy. Bitwise is one of the largest global crypto asset managers 
and the Crip ETF will provide investors with access to a portfolio of global companies at the forefront of the rapidly emerging crypto space. Crip's index is designed to capture the full breadth of the vast crypto space by providing exposure to those crypto companies whose balance sheets have at least 75% in crypto assets. It's important to note that one does not need to buy individual ETFs. Instead, investors buy ETF units similar to company shares. These ETF units can be purchased in the same manner as typical shares, whether that be through a broker or online share trading platform such as eToro, IG Share Trading or Bell Direct. The introduction of CRIP is an exciting inclusion to the ASX that will allow investors to participate in the quickly growing cryptocurrency space while being protected by stock market regulations otherwise not found on current cryptocurrency exchanges. As for the world of crypto, it helps to provide further legitimacy to an ever burgeoning space and with theoretically less volatility, it could introduce a whole range of new players to the world of crypto. All right, well, that's all for now. We'll be back soon with our next live program and, of course, giving you the latest in business and financial updates. Until then, stay tuned to Cowkind TV. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
am Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Thanks for joining us yet again. This is Sage from Calkine TV and you are watching the Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today's guest is Mr. Jamie Andre, the founder of Bake Agency. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for a creative media company, Bake Agency, where the team of top Australian social creators with a passion for creating high quality social videos works. And they can help with anything from Facebook live streams to 360 virtual reality video, GIFs, still photography, even optimized Instagram, Facebook and YouTube video content. They cover almost everything. So today we're very lucky to have with us Mr. Jamie Andre, the founder of Bake Agency. It's a pleasure to meet you, Jamie. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Lovely. And I'm looking at your set there and on your desk we can see three sparkling trophies. Would you like to tell us what they're for before we get yeah, started? Yeah, some of our amazing clients got, uh, you know, we're really chuffed with some of the results we got for them. So they've uh, gifted us a range of trophies. So one was for the world's best treehouse, which ended up winning the world's best Airbnb. And there's a couple just sort of ongoing little little marketing pro trophies as a, as a small thank you for helping them out. So it's fun to show them off. Exactly. I'm glad I asked. The world's best treehouse. I have seen that pop up on Airbnb. That would be amazing. Can I just ask you before we start, have you actually visited it and stayed there? Yeah, so they've been clients of ours now for sort of six or seven years. They're probably moving into good friend slash mate space, but it's an amazing treehouse. I got the opportunity to see it uh, be built from scratch over sort of two or three years and um, having it sort of being embraced and celebrated as one of the top Airbnb destinations has just been fantastic. And we help those guys with a great you know, a range of content from 360 tours through to sort of viral videos and social content. So, yeah, it's been a great experience working with them and just a stunning place. So once we're out of lockdown, um, look it up and maybe go and have a look. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. And that's a brilliant segue, I think, to get started on today's discussion. So, Jamie, with your experience in project and commercial management, we're keen to share your insights today. And apart from the usual videos, um, you also handle the 360 degree videos, which you've just briefly mentioned. Would you please talk about the basics of the 360 degree videos and how do they help your clients, please? Yeah, it's a really interesting space. It's quite mature now. It might be five or six years old now, but it still hasn't taken off. You couldn't say it's mainstream. But the great thing with 360 video is traditional, I've got to get this right, traditional 2D video, a director chooses exactly where to look. So think of a feature film, think of a Marvel, a Marvel film. We've got a close up of Thor and the baddies are opposite Thor. Now, if that was a 360 video experience, you could choose where to look. You could look anywhere in that scene. So in the instance of the treehouse, it's amazing. So instead of just showing 2D imagery, we captured a range of 360 videos. People could actually look around. They could look up and see the tree growing through the building. They could check out the view. They could have a look what was behind them. If they wanted to have a look at uh, the hardwood floors below, they could have a look at the hardwood floors below. So 360 VR videos, all about discoverability and immersion for the viewer. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, that's really kind of blown me away because we're just not used to that at all. So um, excited to see what will happen next in the space. And getting organic traffic, as we know, is a tricky task. Please talk about the strategies that Bake implements for attracting organic traffic for social media content of your clients, please. Yeah, great, great question. This is a good one. I think people can get sidetracked by all the cool, fancy things like brand campaigns or paid media campaigns. I think they're still very important, um, like a TV spot or sponsoring the rugby league or something might be a great way to get mass eyeballs. But I think we focus more on that digital space um, and just the old school basics, you know, well written, well researched content that adds value. Um, great thumbnail. So from a YouTube point of view, helping getting views great thumbnails will help people to actually click and view your content because it's so competitive out there. There is so much content. 
and other boring things that actually really help drive value to your, your descriptions, your titles and your meta tags. So make sure you're getting in and doing some of those basics. Um, I think of it like sort of brushing the teeth for the business. These basics will help build a, a link profile or make it easy for people to actually find your content. There's nothing worse than making some beautiful, great content that no one finds. And, and we, we see that regularly. We've got some really brilliant, fantastic clients, but they get stuck with maybe some of the day-to-day -day stuff and that's where we can help them sort of optimize descriptions tags thumbnails so producing the content's one thing but uh, as i said you need to get that seen um, you can do things like even take a look at some of your competitors set some competitor benchmarks so it can't hurt to see what they're doing over the fence there maybe pinch some of their little tricks or see what uh, content might be working so yeah it's a, some of those basics i think is really important that's right. Well, they say invention does lead to innovation. And if something's working, why not see if it works for you too? I've noticed that the trending Instagram profiles usually have lots of hashtags, you know, 10, 15 sometimes. And with picking yeah. hashtags, sometimes it can be too oversaturated. Do you have any insights to share in regards to, like, if you click on the hashtag and it says there's 20,000 posts with that hashtag or a million posts, would it be better to go with a hashtag with a million or on the lower scale, say yeah. the 20,000? Well, I, I think maximize your hashtags, they're free. You can actually get in and then start to edit hashtags, particularly mm -hmm. with YouTube, you can get in and start to edit and test hashtags. Yeah. So I'd actually test some and I think of it like a portfolio. Um, think of it like a portfolio of shares. You wouldn't just bet the house all on BHP. You'd have a, have a range of hashtags to test. So do your hashtag research, look mm -hmm. at some competitors and then create a couple of different portfolios of 35 hashtags and you can go and test those and then test and measure and see what drives your traffic. So we do that with some of ours. We've got some um, Google Sheets with 35 hashtag pools and we can cut, paste, copy and test from that and then optimize and learn. And similarly, that's what we did with the world's best treehouse video. It's had something like, it's had several million views on YouTube now, but we measured the analytics and we watched what hashtags were working. So those analytics showed us that we're getting some great traffic from Germany of all places. So I think the hashtag was Barmhouse Profits, which is a German term, which we wouldn't have thought of. So that analytics insight was key for us to, to optimize that uh, hashtag strategy and that search strategy. So I reckon a portfolio and test, watch and learn. Thank you. That's very valuable information there. I really appreciate it. So turning the clicks, the organic clicks into sales uh, on, on e-commerce sites is also another tricky aspect to having a digital enterprise and in today's highly competitive digital space it's important to create brand identity through a personalized style of social media marketing so please suggest the basic methods of creating a personalized social media platform in your opinion please there's a couple things you touched on there i think you need to turn on your your tracking your tracking pixels your facebook your linkedin your twitter your instagram tracking pixels so you can start to send customized communications to to potential customers mm -hmm. but I think from building a brand point of view I think people are getting very savvy now and I think there's a real this is a hunch but we, we've watched and tested and and measured some of this want authentic stories so there's lots of everyone's spinning up an e-commerce store there's lots of stories of sort of dodgy stores being set up and people potentially being ripped off so I think if you can build that authenticity show the founders show some of the team maybe show a little bit behind that curtain show, don't give away your secret source of course but let people know that you are real and live and breathe those values and then maybe back that up with a, a content calendar that supports that um, don't make it onerous on your business it needs to be achievable don't try and be like a kardashian and do 100 a day i don't know how many she does but she's nearly got unlimited resources and that's her business model but for average businesses that might may not be the way to play and that may not be what your customers want so set up a, a realistic content calendar maybe it's two to three posts a week and it's an email and maybe a podcast but set something that's achievable and realistic and stick with it you now it's hyper competitive out there so it might take you a year two or three years to really get traction but if you bundle it with a range of your business's marketing activities you've actually got a great pool of content and assets that customers when they come to research or review or discover you they're looking at three four five different touch points they're seeing your brand's authentic. They're seeing real customer testimonials. I think that's a, a net asset and a net value for the business. So be authentic and feel free to, you know, just as I said, give a little bit away, show a little bit uh, behind the curtain and be honest and authentic. 
Thank you for your insights there. And it, you're absolutely right. It is a full-time job, and the first two to three years could be the most difficult, but also some of the most vital. Um, so thank yeah. you for that. Yes, people should stick with it if that's their passion. Now, would you please give us some of your expert views on the 360 and VR or virtual reality videos space? Now, you blew me away before because working with the camera, we learn about crossing the line and things like that. And you've said that people can look anywhere with 360 video. Um, could you share yeah. some of the best practice and analytics in the space with us now? There's a school of thought. It's, it's emerging and you can break rules similar to in traditional 2D. You can cross the line. Um, but I think approach it like a scene. So make it immersive. So give people something to actually discover. Now, the other thing it is, it can be disorientating for people. So you can just use it on your phone. You can use it on a tablet. We can use it on a desktop. We can either use the mouse to choose where to look, whether it's up, down or behind you. Or you can get some VR type glasses. But don't cut too quick in your 360 scenes, it can be really disorientating for users. So give it time to let it settle. And I think of it more like a, a theatre set, like or, or a stage show. That's kind of 180 degrees, but you know, you've got a, a cast of 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, 50 people, even at the opera, you can choose where to look. So when you're setting up a scene or a 360 shoot, think about you know key points of area where people can have a look. Um, give them enough time to actually discover. And there's some best practice around uh, maybe adding a, a narrator. So we've done some tests using a bit of a, a voice walkthrough, just saying, here you are, you're at the treehouse, you can see the views here, the uninterrupted views of the national parks. So we've used a narrator to help let people know what they're looking at and where they're going. And also text. We've done a bunch of tests with text. So some little pop-up text that says, world's best treehouse or spa and fireplace included or overlooks the national park. So those little text call outs can help settle your viewer. They're not going to get nervous or, or feel queasy. It will just help them direct their intention. So hopefully those tips will help anybody thinking about creating a 360 VR scene. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so in your opinion, we're reaching the end of our discussion now. What are the most recent social media trends that have captured your attention, please? Yeah, it's 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 Look, YouTube's still hot. I think um, get in and do your tags, descriptions, and optimize your thumbnails. This live streaming's really big. That's not going anywhere soon. TikTok's blowing up from a creator's point of view. Um, so maybe there's something there for a brand to maybe go and do a, a, a paid campaign. I think it's tough for some brands to suddenly get on that TikTok bandwagon, but there are so many eyeballs and there's so many people there. Maybe it's an opportunity to do some paid sponsorships. Um, influencers are still really big. That's a, I think that's a great way to show authenticity. But once again, that influencer space has, has bloomed. So you've got to work out a way how to get to good influencers that are focused around your niche and will help you drive value. So make sure you do your research and find some good influencers there. and Kick a few tires, ask some hard questions. Um, look, and LinkedIn's still popular, but I'm finding it personally, being on it for many years now, it feels a little bit spammy with everyone's personal branding. So um, it feels like it's moved a little bit away from being true B2B um, with the news feeds and things and a little bit more spamish. But uh, that's one of our key tips for clients. Look, don't be spammy. Drive value, keep it authentic and, and create great optimised content. And hopefully over time you'll build an audience and drive value. So. Thank you. It's so interesting to see how the different platforms attract different demographics and ethnographics even. Um, do you have any insights to share, for example, Facebook advertising? No one really, there's no manual or handbook on how to use it. Are there any insights you could share on, on how to set up ads? Or does Bake Agency yeah, offer so that service? We do less of the media side, so we help with the planning and the creation and the making of the content. We can help with some strategy and give you some guidelines, but we don't have a, a media team sitting there ready to book ads. But if you did want to learn more, Facebook's got some great learning modules online to, to, to talk step by step through making ads. They've got a, a bit of a builder there. So if you did want to, you can sort of DIY and build some ads. So I think it actually starts with who you're trying to reach. Create some great creative content, whether it's a headline and a thumbnail. It doesn't always have to be video. And then you can go through there. The last few years have gotten really good. You can go through their user-friendly widget and set up and start testing some ads. So I think the great thing there is you can just test with a budget of $50, $100, and you can be super niche as well. So we can help with the strategy and give you the recommendations to help find your audiences. 
Uh, and then maybe you either do it yourself or you might engage an agency to physically do the paid. But there's some terrific tools you can target by geography, you can target by demographic, you can create lookalike audiences. There's some really great tools. There. And the other big thing is make sure you've got your analytics, your Google ad analytics set up, and make sure you've got your, your Facebook tracking pixel. Now, tracking's had a bit of a bad uh, rap lately that people think it's snooping and there's privacy issues, mm -hmm. but it can be key for your brand to retarget people. So if someone's watched a piece of content or visited your site, that could be a signal of intent, so you could then target them again later, so you can start to drive them down through your funnel. So think of that. That's the that's that's how that content will work. You'll have a range of content sitting at various parts of your funnel, and customers will pick their way through it on their path to purchase until they buy from you. So you may not get an instant sale, mm -hmm. but doing the right things, the right hashtags, analytics, and tagging can can help those clients come back and and be a future customer. Yes, fingers crossed. Thanks so much for your time today, Jamie. And on that note, it's interesting. Pleasure. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but when I've been thinking about products or services, sometimes just by chance it might pop up on my Facebook feed and like something similar or what I was thinking of. And I'm not sure how that ties into analytics or my searches, but it's pretty neat. That's all I can say about that. Have you experienced that at all or know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's got a lot of press as well. People got a little bit excited or really curious about it. There, I looked into this a couple of years ago. There is a tool called, uh, when you build an app for a phone, you use a range of various tools to build that app. You might use some hard coding, you might use some Google Analytics, you might use some pixels. So there's a tool called Alfonso app. Um, and it actually integrates into your app and listens to what people are loosely saying based off the microphone on the, uh, on the telephone. So they've sort of said that can help sort of target ads to you a bit later. So if you're talking about a brand or an area of interest, that's how some of those ads can start to pop up in your feed. Uh, I think now with Google Nest and Google Home and Amazon, whatever well, the, what are the, whatever the Amazon uh, at home version is called, they actually listen to your conversation as well. So I'm not sure if they're actually tracking um, hashtags and points of intent, but I'm sure that's not far away. These guys are really sharp and their ad businesses are built around, you know, helping people get targeted ads and converting customers. And a lot of it can also be a, potentially your search history and also the rules that someone sets up publisher or campaign site. It depends how they set up and, and curate that, uh, that campaign as well. Sometimes it can be spammy, but as you said, sometimes it's just right, just at the right time and you're getting really relevant information. So it's a bit of a moving feast, but um, don't let it spook you. Um, and I think now with this new privacy policy standards, we can actually come in and turn cookies off and turn cookies on. And Apple with their new phone, I think they've they've taken a bit of a, I've been doing some reading, they've taken a bit of a, a move towards more privacy and protecting uh, and allowing the, the user to, to opt in. So a uh, bit of a changing space. So let's see how it goes in the next six or 12 months. Absolutely. Very exciting space to watch. And thank you so much for sharing your insider's perspective. It's obviously a very different world from the inside. So thank you again, Jamie, for your time today. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks. And if you've, just, if you've just joined us, viewers, we had a very inspiring conversation with Mr. Jamie Andre, the founder of The Bake Agency. And the full recorded interview will be available from Calkine Media's YouTube channel later today. So please check it out. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. 
At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. A number of cryptos have been bucking the September trend of volatility and are experiencing strong growth. One of those is Free River, and in this video, I'll tell you everything you need to know about the crypto. But just quickly, please subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. All right then, what is Free River? Free River is a decentralized exchange and trading tools platform on the Moon River blockchain. The Free River cryptocurrency was launched in 2021. Free is the native utility token that is used, and it's used to access premium trading tools for liquidity, mining and farming, and for governance votes. Free River's decentralized exchange incorporates automated money maker principles to help price Moon River tokens. It also provides professional trading view charts and order books related to all MOVR tokens. And it also features a portfolio manager and new tokens bots. Performance wise, Free River is flowing like its namesake. It's been trading 120.33% higher from the last 24 hours and currently holds a market rank of 2,846 on CoinMarketCap. The cryptocurrency currently has a total and maximum supply of 1 million coins, but the current total circulation is unconfirmed. Free River has been trading with a volume of 2.9 million US dollars through the last 24 hours, although the live market cap is still not available. The current fully diluted market cap stands at just over 12.1 million US dollars. Free River Price Movement The current market price of Free River is 13 US dollars and 28 cents. On the 20th of September, Free River closed 35.63% down at 12 US dollars and 67 cents with a trading volume of 2,507,697 US dollars and 53 cents. The seven day high hit 21 US dollars and 60 cents, which also happened to be the 90 day high. The currency slipped by 43.99% on its all time high as of the 19th of September. Where to buy Free River? Free River is available for purchase on its trading tool platform, Moon River. But to purchase Free River or free tokens, investors will be required to either have Bitcoin, abbreviated as BTC, or Ethereum, ETH, for their trading purpose. For Free River, you're best to exchange with Bitcoin as the starting base. Since Free is an altcoin, it needs to be transferred to an altcoin exchange. So once you purchase Bitcoin or Ether, you'll need to send it across. After the Bitcoin or Ether transfer, the buyer needs to deposit the cryptocurrency to the exchange from Coinbase. The buyer can purchase the free token from the exchange view after receiving the deposit confirmation. Free River Tokens in Circulation Launched on the 28th of August 2021 with around 500,000 free tokens, that makes up 50% of the total supply. Further 40% of the free supply is likely to be released by Free Rivers Farms along with liquidity and mining pools, with the last emission occurring 5 years from the launch date. The remaining 10% of the supply has been set aside for marketing and partnership related efforts. So in short, things are well placed to allow Free River to flow well into the future. And you could do worse than checking out the white paper as you might find a red hot option. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about any other crypto related information that you'd like us to delve into. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. 
I'm James Preston, reporting for Cowkind. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Kalkine Media. In a bid to address the ongoing carbon dioxide shortage in the country, UK government has struck a deal with major carbon dioxide suppliers. The government has announced that it has made a deal with two UK factories to restart the CO2 production. The paucity of the CO2 has led to supply chain chaos across the island nation. The EU-based fertilizer firm CF Industries that produces CO2 as a byproduct has halted its production due to the soaring gas prices. This situation is likely to lead to a food and drink shortage in the coming days as the carbon dioxide is widely used in the food industry for packaging and other related processes like prolonging the shelf life of meat products. Ministers have agreed to pay millions of pounds of the taxpayers' cash to allow CF to restart the production of its Billingham plant. The government has announced to pay the firm's operating costs for three weeks as the market adapts to the soaring gas prices. That being said, however, the incentives are not confirmed yet and the overall cost would be capped. It can take around three days for the plants to restart CO2 production in its two sites, that is Tesside and Cheshire. That means there can be more of such days with disruption in food and drink supplies. And as the fertilizer factories of the UK have halted their operations, it results in a 60% cut of the UK's food grade carbon dioxide supply. The Environment Secretary of the UK that is, George Eustace said that it'll cost around tens of millions of dollars to underpin some of the fixed costs, but it is likely that a temporary shortage will be taking place as the market needs to adjust. The CF deal will not be a loan for the UK government, but it'll be a payment to underwrite some of the firm's fixed costs, he said. The food industry is aware of the sharp price hike of carbon dioxide that's roughly estimated around 200 euros a tonne and will eventually get closer to 1,000 euros a tonne. The Food and Drink Federation has stressed that the UK was not going to run out of food, but there can be major concerns over food supply to supermarkets along with other food outlets. While the food industry must deal with the CO2 crisis for a few more days, the remaining UK carbon dioxide production is being prioritized for medical purposes. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay in the loop. For regular updates, head to our website at calcaimedia.com and if you like this video, please give us a like, share and comment. This has been Holly Shields for Calcaim Media.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. The term cryptocurrency is no longer a catchphrase. Countries worldwide are embracing this new type of currency and moving toward a digital payment system. And as a result, investors are set to invest in the most revolutionary cryptocurrencies. In today's show, we've got you the top five fastest growing cryptos in 2021 and why they're worth keeping an eye on. Hi, I'm Sage, and let's get started with today's hot performers. The year 2021 has been a year to remember, with more bull runs, celebrity tweets and upgrade releases. The year has proven to be a tremendous year for cryptos, and the crypto space has been buzzing, with some cryptos in line to becoming the next crypto to watch out for. So seeing this year's hype around the crypto world, the cryptocurrency market is expected to evolve rapidly, and there are no indicators to show that it will slow down. Against this backdrop, let us now look at the top five fastest growing cryptos in 2021 and why they're worth keeping an eye on. First up is Cardano. With around 1,923% gains in 2021, Cardano is one of the top five fastest growing cryptocurrencies. Cardano is notable for its early use of a proof of stake platform on which developers may design blockchain based applications. This method minimizes energy use while speeding up transaction times. Cardano is widely regarded as a competitor to the Ethereum network. It has been functioning in large volumes continuously in terms of being liquid. Decentralized apps and smart contracts are also possible. While Cardano is comparable to Ethereum in functionality, it operates differently and has the fundamental goal of improving the world. The cryptocurrencies market's cap skyrocketed to 10 billion US dollars in just a few months following its inception in 2017. We have heaps more on the top five cryptos to keep an eye on and we'll be back right after this. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome back to The Hot Performers by Kalkine TV. We are taking a look over the top five performing cryptos and why you should keep your eyes on them. And at the moment, we are discussing Cardano, whose market capitalization skyrocketed to 10 billion US dollars in just a few months following its inception in 2017. The cryptocurrency has grown by 1,923% in just a year. It reached an all time high of $3.80 on the 2nd of September after breaking past many all time highs during the year. And Ethereum appears on our list in the second position with around 1,024% gains this year. Ethereum is the second largest cryptocurrency and has the most growth potential. So this year, Ethereum has seen many all-time highs because of its usage of smart contracts. Ethereum has become a darling among programmers. Ethereum has solidified its position in the crypto world due to many network upgrades and a thriving DeFi business. Ethereum, which aims to decentralize the internet, offers developers a platform to build several popular decentralized apps. It's undoubtedly the most versatile cryptocurrency. And in the third position is Polkadot with around 890% gains in 2021. Polkadot has been one of the cryptos with the loftiest ambitions. Polkadot is a network that allows assets and data to be transferred between blockchain networks, enabling them to become interoperable. And furthermore, the platform intends to establish a private, fully decentralized web that enables each network to be monitored independently. There are significant benefits to using the platform, which may lead to its dominance in the landscape. Polkadot began trading at $9.14 at the start of 2021, and it touched an all-time high of $49.69 on the 15th of May. Polkadot's currently up around 890% this year. And moving on to the next, crypto Bitcoin with 361% yearly gains in 2021. Bitcoin is expected to remain one of the world's fastest growing digital assets. It was invented back in 2009 by a person using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto and continues to dominate and win ground against other cryptos, despite being the world's oldest crypto. And during the current year, Bitcoin has exploded in popularity. The crypto remains a popular choice among the experienced and inexperienced investors, and it is the most widely accepted digital currency. While institutional money flooded into Bitcoin in 2020, the cryptocurrency rocketed to new heights in 2021. And Bitcoin began the year at $21,148 and steadily rose to a new all-time high of $64,863 on the 14th of April, 2021. The price of the crypto is now around $61,193. And in a year, Bitcoin has increased around 361%. The last crypto to keep on the watch list is Chainlink. With 174% yearly gains, Chainlink was launched in 2017 and its popularity has been continuously increasing since then. Because of its ability to combine real-world data with smart contracts, it operates as a link between the blockchain and the outside world. The platform integrates payment mechanisms easily and external information feeds with complicated smart contracts using the Oracle network. Chainlink Crypto is a pioneer in this field and remains one of the first platforms to achieve this. The network has been widely employed throughout DeFi applications because it sources data and feeds it to the apps. It also works with Google's BigQuery data analytics platform. The platform has witnessed considerable growth starting at around $11 this year and now selling at around $31. And Chainlink reached an all-time high of $52.88 on May 2021. In a year, Chainlink grew by 174%. 
So these top five fastest growing cryptos offer a wide range of applications and have shown to be significant assets in the crypto world. As a result, they steal the spotlight and occupy a prominent position in the cryptocurrency industry. Thanks for joining us, but that's all for today. And keep watching Calkine TV for all such crypto market related insights and the latest buzzing trends. Sage here signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. France, as part of its legal offensive against Australia in the aftermath of the AUK-US deal, is rumoured to be pushing for the postponement of the proposed trade deal between the European Union and Australia. The move came in retaliation after Australia cancelled the contract for 12 attack class French submarines, which Paris alleges was a unilateral move by Canberra. Earlier on Monday, Australia's Trade Minister Dan Tehan had said that he would seek a meeting with France to alleviate the ongoing tensions between the two nations over Australia's decision to scrap the submarine deal valued at around 56 billion euros. The Australian Trade Minister seemed very keen to meet France during his Paris visit in October. Tehan was confident over Australia's decision that it would not hamper the European Union-Australia trade and called it business as usual. After cancelling its order of a fleet of conventional submarines from France last week, Australia announced it would build at least eight nuclear-powered submarines with British and US technology under the new AUK-US Security Partnership. On Monday, both Britain and Australia insisted that the diplomatic crisis would cloud the European Union and Australia trade relations. But following Australia's decision, France furiously recalled its ambassadors from both Canberra and from Washington. Speaking at the UN General Assembly in New York on Monday, France's Foreign Minister, Jan Yves Le Drian, said that he would discuss the French vision over the matter for more strategically independent Europe. Le Drian said that it's not only a France-Australian affair, but a rupture of trust in alliances that calls for a serious reflection about the concept of alliances more broadly. The EU trade talks are set to continue as the French ambassador to Australia, Jean-Pierre Thibault, had previously denied media reports that said France was lobbying the European Union to cancel a trade deal with Australia that has been under negotiation since 2018. The Bolt said that the negotiations do continue with a strong interest for Australia to continue with free trade agreements with the European Union. Such a deal has the capacity to deliver high benefits for Australia, according to the Ambassador. If you enjoy the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment, and of course, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to press that bell icon to stay across the latest from Calkine. For more info, just head across to the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Brian Leadman. Brian is the chairman of Nutritional Growth Solutions. They're a global nutrition company creating supplements to support growth development in children and young people. 
Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. A very warm welcome to you, Brian. Thank you, Rach, for having me. Good to chat to you today. Now, firstly, Brian, could you tell me more about Nutritional Growth Solution and what does the company do that you're proud of? Um, well, thanks for asking. So the company is actually an Israeli company that we brought here to the Australian Stock Exchange and uh, we listed in about July last year, which has been a tremendously good listing for investors as well. Share price has been uh, significantly higher and, and, and you know, it fluctuates up and down. But the, the thing that we are most proud of is, is that we're actually a unique company in that we have the only... Um, product that actually assists children to achieve their their optimal height and uh, we've done clinical trials in Israel that were done at uh, a prestigious um, Schneider Institute for children a major hospital in Tel Aviv and it showed that the kids in that study who received the healthy height formula actually grew on average about 30 percent taller than the children who were on placebo and so that was uh, an incredible outcome and uh, you know we're commercializing this product worldwide uh, we have uh, sales in the united states uh, we just started selling in china we've got sales in italy and uh, we're growing and, and uh, the uh, the actual sales figures for the company exceed expectations every quarter we keep hitting new record sales that sounds absolutely fantastic and i believe you have successfully completed a recent share placement that raised five million dollars Congratulations for that, Brian. Now, could you tell me, how are you planning on using that money? Well, we're very much a marketing play. So we have our primary products that are already being developed and commercialized, being Healthy Height. And so that product is, is really marketing. It's about getting the branding awareness um, and distribution channels um, widening. So currently we're selling through Amazon in the United States. We're also expanding those sales onto actual shelves in pharmacies. So um, there's expenditure going into growing that particular sales channel, and also we recently entered into in, uh, sorry into uh, Italy, and uh, the sales for the first quarter in Italy were over five hundred thousand dollars. That was a terrific first quarter, and uh, moving into China is actually um, a really huge market opportunity for us, and and uh, we've made some strategic hires there to uh, facilitate our introduction into that market, and most importantly, uh, we recently we just signed up. Um, chemist warehouse in China as a distribution partner for our products in China. So, so this takes uh, cash, I suppose, to, in order to grow the sales and and, uh, and awareness and marketing for the company. And I think that'll pay tremendous dividends in the short term. Fabulous! Congratulations on that distribution deal. Now, could you tell us about your three pillar growth strategy? And do you think that Healthy Heights could make it to be a global household name? Well, I think it can, because if you think about where Healthy Height came from, it was actually a licensing deal that was done with GlaxoSmithKline some years ago for $15 million, where they acquired the rights to the product in India. And it's actually sold in India today under the Horlicks brand, and it's available right across India, across uh, all, the, all the, uh, the pharmacy chains. So we, I don't actually have visibility in the sales of a healthy height in India, but we do know the sales must be very good because um, it's so widely available. And so we don't get a royalty from that, but we obviously own the product throughout the rest of the world. So healthy height has the potential to be a, a household brand name across the world for children um, who want to achieve their optimal height. And that's something that uh, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for investors as well but also for some big companies in the space that are actually uh, like, you know, let's just say for example, like the, um, um, like the Nestle's of the world, um, we may well become an acquisition target for companies like that as we continue to grow our brand. Fabulous. Now you've mentioned China and the US markets there. What impact do you think Healthy Heights could have on those markets? Uh, well, we're already having an impact in the U.S. market, so we're having record sales quarter on quarter. But I'd like, really like to see us um, transitioning solely from being an online sales on Amazon into actual um, shelves in, in uh, retail supermarkets and pharmacies, which is what we're progressing towards. 
Uh, so the US market has tremendous growth to it and the Chinese market is, is obviously the biggest market globally for us. And uh, we've actually moved production of, or moving I should say, production of the Healthy Heights formula into in the New Zealand so that we can actually have a New Zealand packaged products so a native manufactured packaged in New Zealand specifically for the Chinese market. So that's all part of our marketing campaign. And uh, I think that the Chinese market will benefit tremendously from a unique product uh, because we are focused on the, you know, we're not focused on the babies, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, pediatric space. That's a pretty crowded space. We're talking about kids over the age of three right up to puberty. And uh, that's not a crowded space. And it's, it is, I would say, um, any competitors in that space, they're not clinically proven. We're the only clinically proven product available, and that's a big point of difference for us. Absolutely. And you have received positive results from a clinical trial for your Grow Daily Boys 10 Plus formula. What can you tell us about this range? Now, well, this is an interesting one because um, everything that we do is clinically trialled. And we did have an interesting outcome for this um, teenage space where the older participants <clears throat> in the study so we're talking about kids who are, are actually turned out to be 11.4 years and above who consumed a growth daily boys 10 plus formula, they maintained their height increase while the participants taking the placebo formula displayed a decrease in increase and a decrease in their height increase rate. So in other words, the kids who were received our product actually continued to grow at the same uh, increased rate, but the kids on the placebo actually grew at a slower rate. So clearly this product was having a significant effect in, uh, in their height development. And uh, that's a tremendous outcome for us. Uh, as again, proves the, the clinical um, basis for our products. And uh, I think that's a big point of difference, particularly for someone like me, who's been very much involved in the biomedical space for many years. And Brian, just finally, where do you see the company going in the future? Uh, well, I probably touched on earlier that I think that uh, we, you know, we've got to grow our sales and our uh, impact into various new markets. So we're chasing new markets, new marketing channels, and, uh, and ultimately we may well end up being a target for a takeover some point in the future by a bigger company. Um, look, we are a publicly listed company. We have investors. I'm an investor myself, and we want our investors to make money. And so we're going to continue to grow our presence and brand awareness and our product uh, platforms um, expand it so that uh, we can become more visible to the bigger players. Uh, I believe we already are somewhat visible to them already. Um, I certainly know that uh, large companies have been paying attention to this new product that's actually gaining significant awareness in these in these new markets or expanding markets. So uh, I think that's, um, that's where the future is heading for us and uh, we'll see if I'm right down the line. Excellent. Well, it does seem like a very bright future indeed. Thank you, Brian, for your time. It's been great to chat to you today. And thank you, Rachel, for having me again. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I will sign off for today. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, 
then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Hi, I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Today we're covering why is Binance shutting down the crypto derivatives for its Australian customers. Binance, the largest cryptocurrency trading platform by volume announced through their blog that they will halt offering certain cryptocurrency products to the Australian market. The cryptocurrency traders of Australia will no longer have access to the futures, options and leverage tokens by the end of this year. And the existing users have the option to close or minimize their positions in the cryptocurrency derivatives within 90 days. By December 23rd, the users will be able to reduce or cut their existing positions and after that, all existing positions will be closed by Binance. Why Binance halts crypto derivative products from the Australian market? The move can be seen as an attempt by Binance to comply with the global regulators. By withdrawing the crypto derivative products, Binance, the biggest crypto exchange in the world by volume, intends to eliminate itself from the regulatory compliance requirements and the announcement follows the restrictions that were introduced by Binance last month regarding the opening of new accounts for leveraged tokens, margin products, futures and options. In addition to this, in order to appease the regulators margin trading in Australian dollars, the euro and the sterling were also stopped in July. Binance under the regulators watch globally. Globally, many countries are critical of the products that Binance offers to its users. And for example, as per a media report, Cayman Islands claims that Binance is operating in the region without a license. The Netherlands also highlighted a similar situation in August of 2021 and the Dutch Central Bank mentioned that the platform is extending crypto services with no official registration. Other countries disagreeing with Binance's products are the UK, Japan and Holland. The bottom line, Binance can take all the necessary measures and steps to comply with the different regulations and maintain its position as the largest crypto platform in terms of volume and to gain the trust of the regulators, customers and financial institutions, the decentralized platform always attempts to comply with the regulations by constantly assessing their product offerings. If you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. But for more information, regular updates, head to the website calkinemedia.com and I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Good evening and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine TV, welcoming you all to the last trade live from Sydney. The Australian shares started the week on a positive note amid a firm global queues and a strong rally in telecom and utility stocks. Market sentiment was also lifted by a flurry of big mergers and acquisitions deals, which helped reverse previous week losses. 
The domestic market also saw a surge in buying ahead of the central bank meeting scheduled tomorrow. The benchmark ASX 200 index ended 47.10 points or 0.64 percent higher. The index gained as much as 1 percent during the session, crossing above its 125-day moving average. Then on the sectoral front, all indices barring financials closed in the positive terrain. The telecom sector hogged the limelight with a 2.5 percent gain, followed by utilities, which rose 1.8 percent. Consumer discretionary, tech, healthcare, industrials, energy, A-REIT and consumer staples all settled higher with decent gains. Bucking the bullish trend though, financial sector was the only loser on the sectoral front, ending 0.4 percent lower as a lower than expected earnings by index heavyweight Westpac weighed on the mood. Financial stocks also witnessed cautious trading ahead of the Reserve Bank's board meeting on Tuesday. The central bank is expected to keep interest rates unchanged, while it may shift policy towards the next rate hike given the substantial rise in bond yields last week. Meanwhile, the material sector was the smallest gain out dragged by gold stocks. Shares of the gold mining companies tumbled following a fall in prices of the yellow metal. Now for a look at the top gainers and losers, well, the top winner on the ASX pack was a minerals exploration company, Acobra, which ended 5.8% higher. Some of the top performers include software business, Wise Tech Global, Natural Health Business, Blackmores, Diversified Financial Group, Janice Henderson, and Crop Protection and Seed Tech Company, New Farm. On the losing side though, Westpac Banking, Australia's biggest four lender was the worst performer with a 6.7% loss. Other notable losers sorry, include healthcare firm ResMed, gold mining company St. Barbara, Oz Minerals and Silver Lake Resources as well. Now let's check out the stocks that grabbed investor attention today, starting with newly listed company Judo Capital. Aussie-based NeoLender made a stellar debut on the domestic exchange, rising as much as 5.7 percent to hit an intraday high of $2.21 against an issue price of $2.10. The shares commenced trading on the ASX after successfully raising $657 million in their IPO. The company issued 311 million shares, which comprised of both new and existing shares. Judo Bank is Australia's first challenger bank for small and medium-sized businesses and is the first fully licensed Australian bank to IPO in 25 years. The IPO comes less than three weeks after Judo Bank was granted its full banking license in April of 2019. And second on the list was online underwear retailer Step One Clothing, which surged on its IPO listing. The share price of the company rallied as much as 76% to $2.70 against an offer price of $1.53. This is touted to be one of the largest underwear and clothing companies to list on the ASX. The direct-to-consumer online clothing retailer raised $81.3 million via an IPO, which opened between October 18th and the 25th this year. The company intends to use its IPO proceeds to support their growth strategies, including growing Step One's existing customer base in Australia and the UK, and then investing in establishing a presence in the US. Meanwhile, shares of Fortescue rose over 2% on a multi billion dollar deal with construction equipment company JCB. JCB has inked a multi billion dollar deal with Australia's Fortescue Future Industries to import and supply green hydrogen from the country to the UK. Under this agreement, JCB will purchase 10 percent of FFI's green hydrogen production, with FFI dealing with logistics and production. Now it's time for a short break, but stay tuned because I'll be right back with more trending market updates. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news 
with Calpine TV. Hello and welcome back. Holly here with the Market Close Commentary. Let's have a look at some more stocks that grabbed investor attention today. Well, shares of lithium exploration firm Gallon Lithium surged a whopping 14% following an exchange update. The company has received permits to build a Stage 1 pilot plant and new camp accommodation at its flagship Hombra Moreto West Lithium Brine Project located in Hombre Muerto, West Argentina. And next up, real estate investment trust Charter Hall Social Infrastructure REIT. Shares of Charter Hall dropped over 1% after the property trust announced the acquisition of healthcare and childcare properties, $58.4 million. Next, the television and publishing business Seven West Media. Their shares rose nearly 17% after they inked a deal to acquire assets and business of Prime Media Group for $131.9 million. Cheering for the news, shares of Prime Media zoomed nearly 80%. Meanwhile, shares of Westpac Banking Corp, Banking Corp sorry, dropped over 6.5%. The uh, big four banks fell after the lender reported lower than expected growth in the annual cash profit. Meanwhile, shares of Remelius ended lower after the gold producer proposed a revised bid to acquire Apollo Consolidating. Among others, Osnet Services shares rose as well over 4% after the energy company accepted Brookfield's $10 to $2 billion offer. And moving on to the next segment, let's have a look east towards the Asian markets. Well, Asian stocks were trading mostly higher today, led by Japan, which surged post-election results. Although weaker than expected Chinese manufacturing data spoiled the party, as investors also awaited the outcomes of central bank meetings in Britain, Australia and the US for future directions. Japan's decay was the best performer in the region, rising 2.4%, to hit a one-month high after PM Fumio Kishida's Liberal Democratic Party did better than expected at Sunday's election. Investors cheered the exit poll results which showed that Liberal Democratic Party would easily be retaining a majority. And all this as South Korea's KOSPI also rose 0.5% while Singapore's Straits Times jumped 0.8%. Among these, Indonesia's Jakarta Composite and Weight Index in Taiwan also traded higher. And following firm cues from Asian peers, India's BSC Sensex gained 0.8%. In the opening deal, bucking the trend, China's Shanghai Composite saw muted trades as a weak macro data index weighed on the mood. Hong Kong's Hang Seng dropped as well over 1%, while Thailand's SET Composite fell 0.3%. And that's a wrap for today, folks, but I hope you found the market commentary informative. We'll be back tomorrow live from Sydney at 9.30 a.m. in the morning with our first report on the pre-market scene to prepare you for the trading day. Take care and stay safe. Holly Shield signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Thank <laughs> you.